from the book jacket. Forty years after the Battle of Yavin, a dangerous new era in the Star Wars epic begins. The revelations are shocking, the stakes desperate, the enemy everywhere. As civil war threatens the unity of the Galactic Alliance, Han and Leia Solo have enraged their families and the Jedi by joining the Corellian insurgents. But the Solos draw the line when they discover the rebels' plot to make the Hapen Consortium an ally, which rests upon Hapen nobles murdering their pro-alliance queen and her daughter. Yet the Solos' selfless determination to save the queen cannot dispel the inescapable consequences of their actions that will pit mother against son and brother against sister in the battles ahead. For as Jason Solo's dark powers grow stronger under the dark Jedi Lumia, and his influence over Ben Skywalker becomes more insidious, Luke's concern for his nephew forces him into a life-and-death struggle against his fiercest foe, and Han and Leia Solo find themselves at the mercy of their deadliest enemy, their son. Prologue The object of her desire was walking down the opposite side of the sky lane, moving along a pedwalk so choked with vines and yorick coral that even the zap gangs traveled single file. He was two levels below and ten meters ahead, and he kept stopping to study door membranes and peer into the windows of coral-crusted buildings. Then he would just stand there in the gloom, alone and empty-handed, as though no Jedi need fear the dangers of the Undercity, as though he ruled the twilight depths down where Coruscant changed to Yuzhantar. Jason Solo was as arrogant as ever, and this time it would be his undoing. The angle was perfect, almost too perfect. If she struck now, he would be dead almost as soon as he hit the pedwalk. Even if corpse robbers did not drop the body into the sky lane, the only hint of what had killed him would be a tiny barb in his neck and a trace of venom in his nervous system. Nobody would know that his death had been an execution. Not even Jason. But Alima Rar needed them to know. She needed to see the shock of recognition in Jason's eyes when he collapsed to feel his fear burning in the force as his heart cramped into an unbeating knot. She needed to hold him dying in her arms and suck the last breath from his lips, to hear his father roaring curses and watch his mother wailing in grief. That last part Alima needed more than anything. She had spent years pondering what she could take from Leia Solo that would be the equal of everything Leia had taken from her. An instep and five toes? That would be a fair trade for the half of a foot Leia had cut off on Tanoop, and the princess's eyes and ears would do for the leku she had severed aboard the Admiral Akbar. But what of the giant spider sloth? to which Leia had fed her in the Tanupian jungle. How was Alima to match that? Because this was not about revenge, not about cruelty. It was about balance. The spider sloth had nearly killed her, had bitten her almost in half, and left her slender dancer's body roped with white scars, an ugly lopsided thing, that only a Rodian would desire. Now Alima had to take something equal from Leia, something that would shatter her to the core, because that's what Jedi did. They served the balance. And the first thing Alima wanted to take was Jason, who was moving along the pedwalk toward the corner of an intersecting sky lane. She had wanted to take him for a long time, since the day he had returned so mysterious and powerful from his five-year sojourn to study the Force. And now she would have him, perhaps not in the way she had once desired, but she would have him. Eager to keep her prey in sight, Alima hurried back toward the nearest pedestrian bridge. It was fifty meters away, 
but she could not risk for sleeping across the sky lane after Jason rounded the corner. This region was teeming with ferals, the half-wild survivors of the Yuzhan Vong invasion who continued to live a primitive existence deep in the Undercity. If they saw Alima do something that remarkable, Jason would sense their shock. As Alima drew near the bridge, a faint nettling came to the stump of her amputated leku. She stopped and slipped as far into the shadows as the coral would allow, then stood motionless, listening to the ferals murmur behind their door membranes. When no danger appeared, she extended her force awareness a few meters and felt a pair of nervous presences behind her. Alima turned to find the sunken-eyed faces of two young humans smirking up from the floor. They were hiding along the back of the pedwalk in a shadowy stairwell so ringed with Yorick coral that she had not noticed it. When they realized she was looking at them, the boys snickered and started to slip back down the stairwell. Alima caught them in the force. They cried out in shock and grabbed at the wall, cutting their hands on the Yorick coral as they tried to keep from being pulled back into view. With thin brows and small, round-ended noses, they were clearly brothers. She raised her lip in a twisted half-smile, enjoying the sense of power that rushed through her veins as their shock changed to fear. And what did you two have planned for us? Alima always referred to herself in the plural. It was a habit she had acquired when she became a Killick joiner, and one that she had no interest in losing. Using the singular would mean admitting that her nest was gone that Jason and Luke and the rest of the Jedi had destroyed Gorig. And that was not true. Not while Alima still lived. Robbery? Murder? Ravagery? The brothers shook their heads and started to open their mouths, but were clearly too repulsed by her deformities to speak. You're staring. Alima force-pinned them against the wall. That's rude. Put us down, the larger ordered. With a lean face and a shadowy line of mustache fuzz on his upper lip, he was probably a year or two into human adolescence. We didn't mean nothing. It's just— His gaze slid from Alima's face toward the leku stump hanging behind her shoulder, then quickly began to drop. Alima had traded her provocative attire for more traditional Jedi garb. But even those shape-concealing robes were not enough to hide her disfigurements. The lopsided twist of her body, and the way one atrophied arm hung at her side. As the boy's gaze fell, she sensed in the Force his growing revulsion. Actually experienced the disgust he felt when he looked at her. It's just what? Alima demanded. In her anger, she was pressing both boys against the wall so hard they began to wheeze. Go ahead. Tell us. It was the younger brother who answered. It's just... He nodded at the lightsaber hanging from her belt. You're a Jedi! Alima smiled coldly. Aren't you clever? Pretending you've never seen a Jedi knight before. She glanced ten meters down the pedwalk to where a knobby-scaled rodank had backed a screeching faline into a tangle of slash vines, then looked back to the boy. But we have the Force. We know what you were looking at. Allowing the older brother to fall free, she pointed down the pedwalk and force-hurled his younger sibling into the slash vines next to the faline. The startled rodank reared back on its hind legs, front feet raised and claws unsheathed, then extended its thin proboscis and began to sniff the new prey. The boy whimpered and called for help. Alima looked back to the older one, who was already trying to inch his way toward his brother, and waved him on. Go. She gave a cruel little laugh. After the rod ink is finished with you, you'll know how we feel— the boy's eyes flashed with fear, but he pulled a shiv of sharpened durasteel from his sleeve and raced down the pedwalk to help his brother. Alima turned toward the bridge, 
and, as the snarl and shriek of combat erupted behind her, allowed herself a small smile of satisfaction. The boys had mocked her disfigurement, and now they would be disfigured themselves. The balance had been preserved. She continued up the pedwalk, then started across the bridge. Her stump began to nettle again, and she wondered if someone was watching her. Jason had seemed to be alone when he left his apartment, but, as commander of the Galactic Alliance Guard, he would know to expect assassins. Maybe his young apprentice, Ben Skywalker, had followed a few moments later to watch his back. Alima gently extended her force awareness into the shadows behind her, searching for that flicker of pure, bright power that always betrayed the force presence of earnest young Jedi Knights. She felt nothing, and decided that maybe the cause of her uneasiness was a raucous zap gang ahead. They had claimed the middle of the bridge for their own, and were taking turns trying to push a frightened Gamorian female over the safety rail. As Alima approached, they spread across the bridge and leered at her twisted form. They were all young human males, all wearing white tabards over various pieces of plastoid armor. "'What do you think you are?' the leader asked, eyeing Alima's black robes. He was a large youth, with a three-day growth of beard and a badly swollen cheek. "'Some kind of Jedi?' "'We have no time for your games,' Alima replied coolly. "'Go back and play with your Gamorrean.' She made a shooing motion with the backs of her fingers, at the same time touching his mind through the Force. "'You might have more fun if you let her do the pushing.' Swollen Cheek frowned, then turned to his companions. "'She doesn't have time for us!' He started after the Gamorrean, who was lumbering toward the far end of the bridge as fast as her thick legs could take her. "'Get her! We'll try something new this time!' The Zap Gang spun as one and raced away. Alima followed, catching up as they surrounded the Gamorrean and began to argue about who would be shoved into the safety rail first. Alima slipped past and smiled to herself. Balance. At the other end of the bridge, Jason was nowhere to be seen. He had either rounded the corner of the building or entered a doorway while Alima was dealing with the city's riffraff. She drew her lightsaber and advanced up the pedwalk, half expecting to feel the emitter nozzle of a lightsaber pressing into her ribs just before Jason activated the blade. The most dangerous thing Alima met was a foraging scrap pack which skittered away into a tangle of slash vines almost as soon as she saw it. The only other oddity was the sporadic stream of ferals disappearing through a door membrane near the corner of the building. They were of many species, Bith, Bothan, Hodin, and they were all bearing the carcasses of dead animals, including hawk bats, granite slugs, a few slimy yanskaks. Once there was even a Cheevan clutching what looked like a dead Ewok in its huge claw. They were probably just ferals returning home with the day's hunt, but as Alima passed in front of the doorway, she kept her lightsaber at the ready. No one leapt out to attack her, but she sensed a trio of force presences on the other side of the membrane. Alima did not bother to investigate. Had it been Jason lurking behind the door, she would have sensed nothing at all. Instead, she exchanged her lightsaber for a short blowgun and armed it with a small cone dart from a sealed container in her utility belt. She had eight more such darts, one for each of the Solos and the Skywalkers, plus two extras, all fashioned from the stinger and venom sack of a deadly Tanupian wasper. The poison was fairly quick, at least on human-sized creatures, but more important— it was certain. It co-opted the white blood cells sent to fight infection, turning them into tiny toxin-producing factories. Within moments of being struck, all of the victim's organs would fall under attack, and within moments of that, his vital systems would start to fail. Jason would live just long enough for Alima to reveal herself. 
he would probably die even before he realized that his Jedi poison-neutralizing techniques could not save him. Alima raised the blowgun to her lips and stepped around the corner, her body already purring with the sweet tingle of murder. But Jason seemed determined to disappoint her. The pedwalk was empty and dark, and there was not a sentient soul in sight. Thinking he had lured her into a trap, after all, Alima whirled back around the corner, her lungs filled with the air that would send the lethal dart shooting into her ambusher. There was no ambush. That pedwalk was empty as well, and the only danger Alima sensed was the same faint tingle she had been feeling since before crossing the bridge. Could Jason Solo be hiding from her? Alima's anger welled up inside. It was those boys. They had made her hurt them, and Jason had always been so sensitive to such things. She cursed the brothers for making her lose control. Her plan had just grown more complicated, and that meant the pair would have to pay. But later, right now she needed to go after Jason. The poison on her dart would lose its effectiveness in less than an hour. Alima returned to the door she had just passed, the one all the ferals had been entering with their carcasses. Dark and ringed by a thick crust of yorick coral, it looked more like a cavern mouth than a doorway. She pressed a nerve bundle on the door jamb, and the membrane pulled aside. Standing opposite her was a brawny Nikto with a scaly green face and a ring of small horns encircling his eyes. He kept one hand in the pocket of his soiled jerkin obviously holding a blaster, and Alima could sense two more guards beside him, hiding on either side of the door. He studied her for an instant, then rasped, Wrong door, lady. Nothing inside to interest you. Alima started to reach for the guard in the force, but stopped when her danger sense grew so strong that her remaining leku began to tingle as well. She pointed her blowgun at the Nikto's feet and, using a force suggestion to ensure he would obey, commanded, Wait! The expression in the Nikto's eyes changed from threatening to surprised to obedient, and Alima extended her force awareness in all directions. To her astonishment, she brushed a cold presence, something dark and bitter, back up the pedwalk near the bridge— but when she turned to look in that direction, all she saw was the Zap Gang cheering on the Gamorian as she belly-bounced their leader into the safety railing. And the presence did not belong to any of the Zappers. It was much too strong in the Force, too focused. Then the darkness vanished, and the danger tingle in her leku subsided as quickly as it had come. Alima continued to study the pedwalk for a few moments, trying to digest what she had felt. Someone was definitely stalking her, but it could hardly be Jason. Even if he had been careless enough to let her detect him, and he wouldn't have been, the Jason she remembered was anything but bitter, solemn and brooding, certainly, but also devoted and sincere. So who was stalking her? Not Ben. He was too young to be so bitter. And not Jaina. Her temperament was too fiery to feel so cold. Besides, the presence had felt dark. And it made no sense for a darksider to be watching Jason's back. It had to be something else. Another possibility dawned on her. Maybe Alima was not the one being followed. Maybe it was Jason. Could someone be trying to steal her kill? Alima turned back to the Nikto, gesturing past him with her blowgun. Did Jason Solo go in there? Jason Solo? The Nikto shook his head. Don't know any Solos. Come now. Alima used the force to draw the Nikto out onto the pedwalk. The news hollows reach even down here and every third report contains his image. The commander of the Galactic Alliance Guard, 
the savior of Coruscant? Why would someone like that come here? The Nikto tried to sound uncertain, but Alima could sense his lie in the subtle tremor of his force presence. There's nothing inside but housing. You dare lie to me? Alima used the force to raise her crippled arm, then grabbed him by the throat. To a Jedi? Still calling on the force, she lifted him off his feet and squeezed until she heard the happy crackle of crushed cartilage. The Nikto's mouth fell open, and a terrible gurgle came from his throat. Alima continued to hold him aloft until his eyes rolled back and his feet began kicking. Only when she sensed the other two guards stepping into the doorway did she drop the Nikto on the balcony and turn to find a pair of tentacle-faced Quarren bringing their old E-11 blaster rifles to bear. Alima waved her blowgun, using the force to turn their weapons aside, then touched their minds with hers to search out the doubt she knew would be foremost in their thoughts, the fear that they could not stop her from entering, that they would be the ones who died. You do not need to die. Alima spoke in a force whisper so soft and compelling that it sounded like a thought. You do not need to stop anyone. The guards relaxed. Alima stepped over the dying Nikto and went through the doorway. No one is coming through the door, she purred. As Alima passed between the quarren, she noticed that one of them had only three face tentacles. Their beady eyes began to focus on her, and their old E-11 blaster rifles started to swing back toward her. You do not need to die. Alima tapped the muzzles of their weapons aside. You do not need to see me. Their eyes grew unfocused again, and they turned their attention back to the door. Once Alima was safely inside, she faced the two Quarren. You know me well, she said, continuing to speak in her force whisper. We have been talking for several minutes. The Quarren shifted their stances, opening a place for Alima, and turned their heads slightly toward her. Now Alima spoke in her normal voice. Where do you suppose he was going? Three Tentacle turned to face her. Who? Solo? Alima nodded. Where do you think he was going? Three Tentacle retorted. To see it, of course. It? Alima had spent enough of her life wallowing in the underbelly of the galaxy to know that illicit enterprises were often referred to only in vague terms. Did Jason have a secret vice? An addiction he was hiding? Or a compulsion he had picked up in captivity and been unable to shake? She looked back to the Quarren. What are we talking about? Spice dens? Death games? Now the second Quarren turned toward her, his tentacles straightening in his species equivalent of a frown. Is that supposed to be a joke? He's here for the same reason everyone is. To see it. The friend. The friend. Of course. Alima knew the kind of friends males kept hidden in places like this. The kind they would dare visit only in the anonymous depths of an undercity. Jason's time with the Yuzhan Vong must have left him more bent than even she had realized. She pointed her blowgun out the door, gesturing at the fallen Nikto, then spoke in her force whisper again. Your companion was attacked by an intruder, she said. You saw the intruder kill him, and soon the intruder will want to come inside. To kill it? the second Quarren gasped. Yes, to kill it, Alima agreed. You must stop the intruder from entering. Three Tentacle pressed a nerve bundle, closing the door. 
Then both Quarren pointed their blaster rifles at the heart of the membrane. Good, Alima said. She turned away from the door, confident the two Quarren had already forgotten her. During her time with the Killix, the queen of her nest, a dark Jedi named Lomi Plo, had helped her develop a slippery presence in the Force. Now, as soon as Alima vanished from someone's sight, she also vanished from memory. Alima left the vestibule and entered a warren of winding, tunnel-like passages, lit by the bioluminescent lichen typical of Yuzhan Vong converted buildings. She selected the largest, most heavily trodden corridor and started forward at a brisk pace. She had to work fast if she wanted to be the one who killed Jason. Whoever was behind her would not be delayed for long by the quarren. The air quickly grew hot and dank, and puffs of what smelled like ammonia and sulfur started to roll up the passage. Alima wrinkled her nose and began to wonder just what kind of pleasure den this was. No spice she had ever used was so harsh. If the odor grew any stronger, it would be foul enough to quell a rancor in rut. She had just reached a short side passage when the distant shriek of blaster rifles sang down the corridor, the vestibule guards opening fire on her mysterious stalker. Alima peered down the side passage and saw that it opened into something vaguely reminiscent of a Kalaun joy cave, a central chamber surrounded by a number of privacy cells. Was that where she would find Jason and his friend? A strange chorus of snap hisses erupted from the entry vestibule, and the blaster fire ceased as suddenly as it had begun. By the sound of it, whoever was following Alima was using some sort of strange lightsaber technology, and using it well. The quarren had bought Alima even less time than she had expected. But which way had Jason gone? Into the joy cave, or deeper into the building? Searching for him in the force would do no good. Indeed, would probably prove disastrous. Even if he wasn't concealing his own presence, he would feel her looking for him. And Alima could not best Jason Solo in a straight duel. Not with one half-useless arm and one clumsy half-foot. Fortunately, Alima knew males. And males especially important males who pursued their secret passions in low places, did not like to wait for their pleasure. She went down the side passage and was surprised to find no panderer there to greet her, nor any spice dealers, nor any glitter girls waiting for new clients. There wasn't even a beverage center, only a fountain gurgling in the center of the room and a refresher tucked away into a rear alcove. The doors to most of the privacy cells were open, revealing small dens containing beds, nesting basins, or simple raised pallets. But a handful of the cells were closed, and Alima could sense beings in them all. She went to the first, and holding her blowgun ready to shoot, pressed the nerve bundle beside the door. The membrane retracted to reveal a pair of genet curled up on large floor cushions, their limbs pulled in tight, and their snouts tucked close to their legs. Neither opened an eye, even when Alima grunted in disbelief. There were no spice pipes in the cell, no aphrodisiacs, not even an empty ale mug. They were sleeping, just sleeping. Alima moved on, opening two more doors. She found a lone duros behind one, and a trio of Chadra Fan behind the other, all sleeping. Apparently she had stumbled into some sort of staff dormitory. She cursed under her breath. What kind of pleasure den had its staff quarters in front? Alima started back toward the main corridor, and glimpsed her pursuer's shadow on the far wall. She ducked out of sight and made sure that her force presence was damped down then peered around the corner and watched as a thin woman in a scarlet robe came down the corridor. The woman was middle-aged, with red hair and a thin nose, and she kept the lower half of her face concealed behind a black scarf. In one hand she held a coil of strands, 
leather and gem-studded metal, attached to what looked like the hilt of a lightsaber. Alima was so shocked that she almost let her feelings spill into the Force. At the Jedi Academy on Yavin 4, she had studied the story of an Imperial agent named Shira Bree. How Bree had attempted to discredit Luke in the eyes of his fellow pilots, only to be shot down and nearly killed. How Darth Vader had rehabilitated her, turning her into as much a machine as he was, then training her in the ways of the Sith. How she had constructed her light whip and returned to trouble Luke Skywalker time after time in her new identity as Lumia, Dark Lady of the Sith. Could it be that Lumia had returned once more? Alima saw no room to doubt. The woman was the right age and appearance. She concealed her lower face beneath the same dark scarf that Lumia wore to hide her scarred jawline, and she carried a light whip, a weapon unique in the era of modern Jedi. And she was hunting Jason Solo. Alima drew back around the corner, her thoughts whirling as she struggled to sort through the implications. She knew from the histories she had studied that Lumia hated the Skywalkers and Solos almost as much as Alima herself did, so it seemed likely their goals were the same, to destroy the Solo Skywalker clan. But Alima could not permit Lumia to steal her kills. If the balance was to be served, Alima had to destroy the prey herself. She filled her lungs with air, then raised the blowgun to her lips and spun around the corner to attack. The corridor was empty. She stepped back around the corner, expecting Lumia to attack from the cover of a force blur or drop off the ceiling at any instant. When nothing happened, Alima stood and stepped away from the door. Still, Lumia did not appear. Alima expanded her force awareness, searching for the Sith's dark presence. Nothing. She cautiously peered around the corner again. When no attack came, she studied the walls, ceiling, and floor carefully, searching for any odd shadows or blurred areas where Lumia might be hiding. When there was still no attack... She advanced up the short side passage to the main corridor and did the same thing. Lumia was gone, vanished as quickly as she had appeared. Alima grew cold and empty inside, and she began to wonder if she had really seen Lumia at all. Maybe it had been a force vision, or maybe her fever had returned. Once, near the end of her first year marooned in the Tanupian jungle, she had spent days exploring the Masasi temples on Yavin 4 with her dead sister Numa, only to find herself stranded high on a Tanupian mountain when the fever finally broke. But another explanation seemed just as likely. Lumia had continued after Jason. Alima started down the corridor at a run, growing more worried with each step that Lumia would beat her to the kill. No longer taking the time to move quietly, barely paying attention to which way she was going, just moving deeper into the building, deeper into the heat and the dankness and that horrid smell of ammonia and sulfur. Twice she ran headlong into surprised ferals, and twice she had to kill them for attempting to lie to her before finally pointing the true way to it. Another time... She heard a large group of armored ferals clattering up a ramp she was descending. She pressed herself against the wall between two patches of glow lichen, then drew a force shadow over herself and watched impatiently as they rushed past to search out the intruder. Finally, the ammonia and sulfur smell grew almost overpowering, and Alima began to hear strange gurglings and splashes. She emerged onto a narrow mezzanine balcony, and found herself gazing across a huge well of yellow fog. It looked nothing like the pleasure den she had been expecting, but she stepped out of the passage and crossed the balcony without hesitation. In typical Yuzhan Vong fashion, there was no railing to keep pedestrians safe. The Yorick coral floor simply ended twenty meters above a vast pool of steaming slime. 
A constant supply of bubbles was rising from the depths of the pool, speckling the surface with flashes of light as they burst into scarlet and yellow glimmers. The surrounding walls were mottled with patches of bioluminescent lichen, barely visible through the thick fog. Higher up, several tiers of balconies curved away on both sides and vanished into the steam. Scattered along the balcony edges were the shadowy silhouettes of ferals, usually in the process of tossing animal carcasses or even lifeless bipeds into the pool below. The splashes were always followed by a short gurgle, as though the bodies were too heavy to float on slime. Alima furrowed her brow, trying to decide exactly what she was looking at. In Coruscant's savage undercity, especially the part that was still Yuzhantar, dead animals were invariably devoured by ferals or other scavengers long before the meat spoiled. So it seemed unlikely the pool was some sort of garbage pit. Instead, the ferals had to be feeding something. Something that Jason was interested in as well. Alima was about to back away when a voice murmured up through the fog. It was impossible to make out what it was saying over the gurgling of the pool, but Alima didn't care. She recognized that voice, its dark timbre, its careful rhythms, and, unmistakably, its patronizing inflections. Jason Alima focused all her attention on that voice trying to pinpoint its source. The fog and the pool worked against her, muffling Jason's words and drowning them out with gurgles. But eventually she grew attuned enough that she shut out everything else and began to understand what he was saying. Let me worry about Remwa and the Bothans. Jason sounded irritated. Leaving the well was foolish. I can't protect you here. The only response Alima heard was a long, liquid pearl. But Jason responded as though he had been spoken to. That's ridiculous. I'd know if I had been followed. Not even Bothan assassins are that good. Ever so carefully, Alima used the force to clear the fog between herself and Jason. She was running the risk that Jason would feel her drawing on the force— but she would have only one shot, and she needed to see her target. Besides, Jason was likely too preoccupied with his conversation to notice such a subtle disturbance. After another long pearl, Jason's voice grew concerned. Inside the building? You're sure? There was a short gurgle. Of course I'd care. Jason replied testily. He snapped his lightsaber off his belt. You're the guard's most valuable asset. Without you, we couldn't track a tenth of the terrorist cells we do now. The fog cleared, and Alima was astonished to see Jason addressing a fleshy black monstrosity that had come up from the slime. The thing was so large, she could not even tell how much of it she was seeing. Its eye had a pupil the size of a Sullustan's head. Its tentacles were as big around as Alima herself, and, like everything in this part of the Undercity, its appearance was distinctly Yuzhan Vong. The creature blinked and thrashed its tentacles across the surface. I can't ban Bothans from the planet, Jason replied. That would push Bethawi straight into Corellia's camp. Alima began to suspect what this creature was. While Jason had been held captive by the Yuzhan Vong, he had supposedly struck up a friendship with the World Brain, a sort of genetic master controller whom the invaders had created to oversee the remaking of Coruscant. Before escaping, Jason had persuaded it to thwart its master's plans, to cooperate only partially in their efforts to reshape Coruscant. Later, during the final days of the war, he had convinced his friend to switch sides and help the Galactic Alliance retake the planet. Now he was using it to spy on Corellian terrorists. Clever boy. 
Alima raised the blowgun to her lips, and, using the force to hide the cone dart, expelled her breath. The dart had just left the blowgun, when somewhere above Alima and to her right, a throaty female voice cried out, Jason! Jason spun, igniting his lightsaber as he turned. But the dart was tiny, swift, and still hidden in the force, and Alima realized with a bolt of satisfaction that his blade was not rising to block. Then Jason cried out and flew backward, as though hurled by an invisible hand, and the dart flashed past, eliciting a liquid roar of pain as it disappeared into the enormous eye of the world brain. Alima was astonished, dismayed, angry, but she was not stunned. She had been in too many death fights to let herself be paralyzed by any surprise. She pivoted toward the voice that had alerted Jason. Five meters across the well's edge, and one balcony up, stood the fog-blurred silhouette of a thin woman in a scarlet robe. Her arm was still extended toward the slime pool, leaving no doubt that she had been the one who force-hurled Jason to safety. Lumia. As Alima backed away from the balcony's edge, Lumia pointed toward her. There, Jason! Alima turned to run, but the fog suddenly flashed blue, and a tremendous crack sounded from behind her. In the next moment, she found herself sliding across the floor, snakes of force lightning dancing across her anguished body until she finally passed from her attacker's sight. Alima did not understand what had just happened. Had Lumia really warned Jason? Had he been the one who hurled the force lightning at her? But there was no time to figure it out. She forced her cramped muscles to drag her into the nearest corridor, then rose to a knee and drew a force shadow over herself. She reached into her pocket for another dart, and that was when she realized the force lightning had made her drop her blowgun. Jason alit on the edge of the balcony, so obscured by yellow fog that he was barely more than a silhouette. But he was burning with a rage that Alima had not thought possible for him, an anger so fierce that it warmed the force like fire. He ignited his lightsaber, casting a green reflection that made his eyes shine with murderous intent. His gaze fell on the blowgun, and he started forward. An ear-piercing screech rang out from the well of the world brain. Then a dozen black tentacles rose out of the fog. They began to thrash about wildly, gashing themselves on the balcony and spraying the walls with blood. Jason's eyes darkened to the color of black holes, and he started forward, his gaze shifting to the corridor where Alima was hiding. Though Alima knew she lacked the power to kill Jason with one attack— and that she would not have time for two, she opened herself to the force, preparing to blast him with lightning. Then a second silhouette, this one a slender woman with a veiled face, dropped out of the fog, landing on the edge of the balcony and dancing past the thrashing tentacles as only someone trained in force acrobatics could. Alima extended her hand. Lumia was not going to steal her kill. But instead of attacking Jason, Lumia merely caught him by the arm and spun him toward the thrashing tentacles. Jason, those are convulsions, she said. We have to slow the poison now, or your spy is dead. Alima's jaw dropped. Lumia's tone was one of command, a master to a student. But the assassin, would you rather have vengeance or preserve an intelligence asset? This isn't about vengeance. Jason looked toward the corridor where Alima was hiding. It's about justice. We can't let the assassin— The assassin is only the tool, Lumia interrupted again. It's the hand wielding her we need to stop. It's Remwa and his lieutenants— Jason continued to stare at Alima's corridor, his fury and desire to kill pouring into the force. Lumia released Jason's arm, 
pulling her hand away in disgust. I can see it was a mistake to pick you. Go on. She waved him toward Alima's hiding place. You are a servant to your emotions, not a master to them. This has nothing to do with my emotions. It has everything to do with your emotions, Lumia countered. You're angry because your friend was hurt, and now you can think of nothing but bringing the attacker to justice. You're hopeless. Lumia's last comment seemed to sting Jason. He continued to glare into the corridor for a moment, then glanced away long enough to summon her blowgun. Tell Remwa we're coming, he said, pointing the blowgun in Alima's general direction. This won't go unanswered. Jason turned away. He and Lumia danced past the thrashing tentacles of the world brain and dropped into the fog. Even after they were gone, Alima remained in hiding, too shocked to move. Jason Solo, apprenticing with a Sith. Had the galaxy gone mad? Chapter One The air aboard the Thraken Sal Solo was filled with new vessel smells, the acrid bite of ventilation fans burning off packing grease, the sweetness of escaped actuating gas, the ozone tinge of fresh air exchangers. As Han and Leia Solo passed through hatchway after hatchway, Han still found himself touching the durasteel bulkheads to be sure he wasn't dreaming. The Sal Solo was the flagship of a secret assault fleet that the Corellian government had put into construction nearly ten standard years before, under the leadership of Han's recently deceased cousin, Thraken Sal Solo. Nobody would say what Sal Solo and his cohorts had been planning for the mysterious armada, and Han didn't care. The fleet was ready to deploy, and large enough to shatter the Alliance blockade. And that was all that mattered. The blockade had been extended to all five planets in the Corellian system, choking their economics and threatening their off-world facilities. When the Solos reached the command center, Han did not need to be a Jedi to feel the excitement in the air. The door guards inspected everyone's passes with more than the usual cursory nod, and they even ran a security scan on C-3PO. Inside, the support officers had forsaken the calf dispenser and were actually at their duty carrels, studying data displays and coding orders. The only individuals who did not seem busy were half a dozen civilian security agents waiting on steel benches outside the tactical planning salon, and even they sat in tense silence. Han leaned close to Leia and asked in a whisper, Will you be okay with this? Leia looked up and arched a brow. The lines at the corners of her dark eyes only made her gaze that much more penetrating. And, well, wise. Okay with what, Han? Being married to a Corellian admiral. Han smirked and ran his fingers over his chin, clean-shaven now that there was no longer a need to hide his identity from his cousin's assassins. Look around. Wedge is getting ready to bust the blockade, and he's going to need me to take one of the dreadnoughts. Leia surveyed the busy cabin, allowing her gaze to rest on the security agents outside the planning salon. I don't think we need to worry about that, Han. Han frowned. You think I'm too old for a line command? Hardly. You're not even seventy yet. Leia lowered her voice, then added, I just have a feeling. Oh, dear. C-3PO said. It's never good when Mistress Leia has a feeling. They reached the door to the planning salon and had to end the conversation. Instead of admitting them immediately, as he had the previous day, the door guard, a square-jawed petty officer in a blue duty uniform, blocked their way. The Admiral will be with you as soon as he can, Captain Solo. As soon as he can? 
Han was starting to think Leia's feeling might be right. He called us. Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. The door guards studied Han with the weary smirk that Corellians reserved for grandstanders and blowhards. Admiral Antilles is a very busy man. Yeah? Han was growing embarrassed by his earlier confidence, and nothing made him testier than embarrassing himself in front of Leia. Well, so am I. Before Han could turn to leave, Leia caught him by the arm. Tell Admiral Antilles to take his time, she said to the guard. We understand how busy he must be right now. Han did not resist as she pulled him to one side of the door. Wedge Antilles had been appointed Supreme Commander of the Corellian Forces some ten standard days earlier, the day after Thrak and Sal Solo's assassination, and Han knew as well as anyone how hectic his schedule had to be right now. That was why the Solos had been so surprised to receive a message asking them to rendezvous with Antilles in the Kyrus asteroid cluster. The Kyrises were so far out on the fringes of the system that they were almost free-floating, and so obscure that even Han had been forced to ask for coordinates. The Solos had spent the better part of the trip, made even longer by the necessity of evading the Galactic Alliance blockade, debating what the blazes Corellia's new supreme commander was doing so far from the war. All their questions had been answered when they rounded Kyrus VI and saw the Sal Solo floating in her hidden dock. The dreadnought was a typical Corellian design, innovative, austere, and configured for vicious, close-in combat, with turbolaser turrets and missile tubes arrayed heavily and uniformly over a blue, egg-shaped hull. Han had known the moment he saw her that the ship was exactly what Corellia needed, a vessel capable of plunging into the core of the Alliance blockade and tearing it apart from the inside. But Han's pulse had not quickened until a couple of hours later, when Antilles had informed them that the Sal Solo had two sister ships and an entire support fleet hidden in the Curus Cluster's other shipyards. Given the obvious element of surprise, Antilles felt sure the fleet would be powerful enough to smash the blockade and convince the Alliance to reconsider its war plans. What he had wanted to know from Han was whether he and Leia considered an early end to the war a strong enough possibility to serve in the Corellian military. Han and Leia had spent the night agonizing over Antilles's question, worrying about whether Han would eventually find himself in battle against his own children. Jaina was now serving with the Jedi instead of the military, and Jason was supposedly back on Coruscant torturing Corellians. But war had a way of bringing about the unforeseen. If Han ended up killing one of his own children, he would shatter into more pieces than there were stars in the galaxy. The question posed a dilemma for Leia as well. Four years ago, when her master Saba Sebatine had proclaimed her a Jedi Knight, she had sworn to obey the Jedi Council even when she disagreed with it, and the Council was supporting the Galactic Alliance. So far, Saba and the other masters had been tolerating her insubordination out of respect for who she was, but that would certainly change if Han openly took arms against the Alliance. The Council would have no choice except to demand that she choose between Han and the Jedi. Still, the only other alternative was to stand by and watch the war blossom without them, and the Solos had never been the type to do nothing. In the end, they had decided the best course of action was to put Coruscant in a more reasonable frame of mind by helping Antilles prove that a war would be as costly for the Galactic Alliance as it was for Corellia. After the blockade was smashed, the new administration would be in a position to negotiate from strength, and Leia would secure the peace by volunteering to act as an envoy. That was why Han had been so disappointed to be denied admittance to the planning salon. He and Leia had made up their minds to risk everything to help Antilles end this war quickly. Now it looked as though their help was no longer wanted. The wait was shorter than Han had expected. He had barely started to consider a trip to the calf dispenser 
when Wedge Antilles arrived in his white admiral's uniform. His tapered face was creased with wrinkles and worry lines, and his neatly trimmed hair was now more gray than brown. Han, Leia, I'm sorry for the delay, Antilles said, as the door slid shut behind him. Han glimpsed the back of a civilian head nodding vigorously as someone else spoke in sharp tones. Have you decided? Yeah. Han began to feel a little more optimistic. Perhaps Antilles was just having a difficult meeting with a couple of civilian bigwigs. I was kind of thinking of signing on. Glad to hear it. Antilles smiled and stuck out his hand. But there was more apprehension in his face than warmth. We have an important job for you. Han clasped the offered hand, but Leia continued to study Antilles with an expression of reserve. We're looking forward to hearing about it, she said, so we can make a final decision. Antilles did his best to look disappointed, but made the mistake of quietly letting his breath out through his nose. It was an old sabak tell, and one that Han knew always meant relief. Whatever was going on here, it was beginning to smell like a hut's belly. That's right, Han said. Why don't you tell us what you have in mind? Fair enough. And Tilly's drew them away from the door guard and lowered his voice. We need you to negotiate a coalition. Negotiate? Han scowled. I thought you wanted me in the military. Maybe later. Antilles did not sound too serious. Right now this is more important. I must say, trusting Captain Solo to negotiate anything other than an asteroid belt seems foolish, C-3PO said. His temperament is poorly suited to diplomacy. Han is a man of hidden talents. Antilles kept his gaze fixed on Han. There's no one else I would trust with this mission. Han pondered the compliment only a moment before deciding his friend was feeding him a load of bantha poodoo. This is about Jason, isn't it? Antilles frowned. Jason? He shook his head. Han, we both have kids fighting on the other side of this thing. Sea all isn't torturing Corellians on Coruscant, Han countered. As angry and ashamed as he was about what Jason had become, he wasn't going to hide from it. Look, I don't like what Jason is doing any more than you do, but he's still my kid, and I'm not going to disown him. I'll understand if you've got a problem with that. Han, I don't, until he's replied. Jason has lost his way, but it's only because he believes in what he's fighting for. Sooner or later he's going to remember that you and Leia taught him right from wrong, and he's going to find his way back. Leia reached out and squeezed Antilles' hand. Thank you, Wedge, she said. I know that's true, but it feels good to hear someone else say it. Yeah, it makes you think maybe you're not crazy after all. Han turned away so he could blink a tear out of his eye, then looked back to Antilles. So what do you really want me for? I told you, Antilles said, to negotiate a coalition. As he spoke, the Admiral's eyes shifted toward Leia, and Han realized the truth was he wanted Leia to negotiate the coalition. Han shook his head. For once, 3PO is right. You don't want to ask me to negotiate any kind of coalition. I might start a war or something. Antilles gave a theatrical sigh. Come on, Han. He briefly shifted his gaze to Leia again. You understand what I'm asking. Then ask, Han said. You know how I hate games. Very well. Antilles turned to Leia, and his eyes began to blink more rapidly. 
Another old sabak tell that usually meant your opponent was trying to pull a fast one. You understand this can't be an official request, why not? Han interrupted. Because I'm not Corellian, Leia said, and I'm a Jedi Knight. It would look suspicious for me to conduct negotiations. So you want me to be the front man? Han continued to look at Antilles. Antilles nodded. Exactly. Not interested, Han said, not even pretending to consider the request. He could not ask Leia to negotiate on behalf of a cause that even he knew she supported only partially, especially when Antilles himself so clearly had reservations about what he was asking. Besides, Han had a sneaking suspicion that his old friend was deliberately trying to discourage the Solos from accepting the assignment. Call me when you need someone to do some fighting. He turned to leave, but Leia caught him by the arm. Han, shouldn't we hear Admiral Antilles out? What for? For Corellia. Leia fixed him with a stern-eyed gaze that worked better on him than any Jedi Force suggestion. You're always talking about the importance of preserving Corellia's independent spirit. Is sitting at a negotiating table really so much to ask? Han's jaw dropped. Leia had renounced her role as a senior diplomat during the war with the Yuzhan Vong, when it had grown apparent that the political process was only undermining the New Republic's ability to win the war. That she would volunteer to resume the role now, on Corellia's behalf, seemed very suspicious. He scowled. You want to do this? I'm willing to consider it. Leia turned back to Antilles. But we're not making a decision before we hear the details. All the details. No one expects that. Antilles smiled, but the note of disappointment in his voice was unmistakable, at least to someone who had known him for forty years. My orders were simply to find out if you'd be willing to consider it. Prime Minister Gedjin will brief you on the rest. Han's brow rose. Dur Gedjin had risen to power by helping Han and Boba Fett assassinate Han's megalomaniac cousin, Thraken Sal Solo. Afterward, Gedjin had abolished the office of President of Five Worlds, which Sal Solo had created for the sole purpose of exerting his personal dominion over the entire Corellian system. Had Gedjin stopped there, Han would have admired his integrity and wisdom. But Gedjin had proved to be just as bad as Sal Solo, establishing his own hold by arranging to have himself named both Chief of State of the planet Corellia and Five Worlds Prime Minister. Gedjin is here? Han asked. You have got to be kidding. I'm afraid not. And Tilly's led the way into the planning salon, a spacious cabin lined with the latest battle coordination technology half-wall display screens, a ceiling-mounted tactical holoprojector, automatic calf dispensers in each corner. Dur Gedjin and two others sat talking at a large oval conference table with a combination datacom station at every seat. As soon as Han and Leia entered the room, Gedjin ended the conversation and extended his hand. Captain Solo, welcome. He was young and good-looking with dark skin and black hair worn in a short military-style cut. I'm so pleased you agreed to accept this assignment. Yeah, well, don't be too pleased, Han said. I haven't accepted anything yet. He gave Gedjin's hand a single pump, then looked past him to the others. They were older, the first a sandy-haired man with a blocky jaw and graying mustache, the second a middle-aged woman with a round face and cold gray eyes. Han wasn't familiar enough with the new government to recognize them by sight, but he was guessing by Antilles's displeasure and the number of security agents waiting outside that they were Gavel Lamora and Rorf Willems. Along with Gedjin, Lamora and Willems were the heart of the Five Worlds government, 
with Lamora serving as Minister of Intelligence and Willems as the Minister of Defense. Gedjin frowned in Antilles's direction. I thought you weren't to bring them in here unless Admiral Antilles's request was necessarily rather vague, Leia interrupted. Han will need to know a few more details before he can agree to serve as your emissary. Ah, of course. Gedjin glanced over his shoulder at the cold-eyed woman, Lamora, and looked relieved. We'll be happy to give him a basic briefing. After the droid leaves, Lamora added, staring at C-3PO. I can't leave, C-3PO objected. I won't be able to record the briefing. That's the point, chiphead, Willem said. He had a gravelly voice and a thuggish demeanor. We don't want it recorded. Are you certain? C-3PO inquired. Captain Solo's memory circuits have been showing signs of fatigue lately. Just the other day, he told Princess Leia that with her new short haircut, she didn't look a day over thirty-five. I meant it, Han growled. And stop eavesdropping. He doesn't have a choice, Han. It's in his programming, Leia said. She turned to C-3PO. But I'm sure Han can still keep a few basic facts straight. You can wait outside. C-3PO's chin dropped. Very well. I'll be available if you need me. After C-3PO left, Gedjin motioned Han and Leia to chairs. Antilles took a seat at the end of the table, a choice that suggested he really did not like being a part of this conversation. I assume you recognize Ministers Lamora and Willems? Han nodded. Yeah, I was just wondering what could bring the entire high cabinet all the way out here. We're on an inspection tour. Lamora did not even bother trying to sound plausible. What matters to you is that a unique opportunity has presented itself. Before Han could threaten to leave because he didn't like being lied to, Gedjin dropped the bombshell. Queen Mother Tenel Ka has agreed to meet a Corellian delegation. Yeah, sure. You can't be serious. Han and Leia spoke at the same time. For the only thing that might have surprised them more, or caused more doubt, was to hear Gedjin claiming that their son Anakin had not really died fighting the Yuzhan Vong. Tenel Ka was a vocal and very loyal supporter of the Galactic Alliance, and any suggestion that she might be willing to discuss changing sides was crazy. I assure you we are serious, Gedjin said. The High Cabinet did not come out here to play a practical joke on you. Then someone fed you a bad set of coordinates, Han replied. There's no way Tenel Ka is going to support Corellia. She's already assigned two battle fleets to Alliance Command. Gedjin was not deterred. And if that were to change, the Galactic Alliance would be forced to reconsider its position regarding Corellia. The invitation is real, Lamora assured them. The Queen Mother has half a day available on the 20th. Can you reach Hapes by then? Sure. Han glanced toward the end of the table and found Antilles gazing into the corner, apparently contemplating the wonders of automatic calf dispensers. If there's any sense in going... I think what Han means to say is the offer sounds suspicious. Leia looked to Han as though for confirmation, but she was really signaling him to play along. We both know Tenel Ka well enough to be certain that she'll never change sides. You see, that's why you're perfect for this job, Willem said. If anyone has a chance of talking some sense into her, it's you two. Han did not like the menacing note he heard in Willems's gravelly voice. You'd better not be sending us there to threaten her he said, because that would steam me about as much as it would Tenel Ka. Gedjin waved a calming hand. 
Nobody's making threats, Captain Solo. But we do have some intelligence that suggests her support of the Alliance is straining her relationship with her nobles. We assume that's why she's willing to talk, Lamora added. Perhaps she's merely putting on a show to placate them, or trying to buy some time, but we can't afford to ignore the opening. No, of course not, Leia said. But Admiral Antilles said you were asking Han to negotiate a coalition. You do understand there's no chance of that happening, don't you? If there is any hope, you're it, Gedjin replied. But we don't need a coalition, and neither does Queen Mother Tenel Ka. If Hapes were to make an open statement of neutrality and withdraw her fleet from Alliance command, Lamora said, Corellia's position would be strengthened both militarily and politically. Other governments might be emboldened enough to support us openly. And Tenel Ka's nobles would no longer have grounds to challenge her decision. Or her throne, Leia surmised. Is the threat to her that severe? We hear there are rumblings. Gedjin leaned forward and deliberately locked gazes with Leia. It might not be an exaggeration to say that persuading the Queen Mother to assume a favorable stance toward Corellia would be as much a service to her as to us. I see. Leia studied Gedjin for a moment, then turned to Han. The Prime Minister does have a point, dear. We might do Tenel Ka and Corellia a lot of good. Yeah, maybe. Han looked back to Antilles, who was continuing to study the calf dispenser as though it could help him divine the secret plans of the Galactic Alliance. But something about this smells like hut breath. Fine. You don't like it? We'll find someone else. Willems pointed toward the exit. Thanks for— Minister Willems, Gidgen interrupted. Why don't we hear Captain Solo's concerns first? He turned to Han with a lifted brow. All this would sound fine if we were talking about it back on Corellia, Han said. What I don't get is why Wedge had me come all the way out here, just so you three could come all the way out here to ask us to take the assignment. To Han's surprise, Gedjin turned to Antilles. Perhaps you should explain, Admiral. All right. Antilles finally looked away from the calf dispenser. You were already on the way here when the Prime Minister received Tenel Ka's message. I had originally intended to ask you to take command of the home fleet and prepare to counterattack the blockade. Counterattack? Han frowned. The Corellian home fleet was spread across the system's five habitable planets, either pinned in their berthings or playing Moog and Rancor with Alliance vessels carrying double their firepower. Are you space-sick? We'd lose half the fleet just trying to rendezvous. Antilles shook his head. Not likely. We're almost ready to launch the real attack from here. Han frowned, thinking, then demanded, I was never going to see action? He didn't know whether to be angry or hurt. I was going to be a decoy? Sorry, Han. Until he said, I had to do something. We've been getting intelligence intercepts indicating that Alliance High Command is worried about where Admiral Antilles is, Lamora explained. I suggested we needed a diversion. Leo rested a hand on Han's arm. Think of it as a compliment, Han, she said. There's no one else the Alliance would believe crazy enough to try something so risky. Thanks a lot. As Han said this, he was looking at Antilles. It's always good to feel needed. As you obviously are, Gedjin said quickly. Admiral Antilles is not happy about losing you to a diplomatic mission. And that's the reason three of you chased me all the way out here? Han asked. 
to bully Wedge into letting me go? Not entirely, Lamora admitted. The Queen Mother didn't give us long to select an envoy. If you won't go, I will, Willems finished. It hasn't come to that yet, Gedjin said. The look that passed between him and Lamora suggested they both hoped it wouldn't. But with strict calm silence being maintained here, we'd have to wait for a messenger to return to Corellia with your decision. It just seemed safer to come out here and talk in person. And we really did want to inspect the Kiris fleet before we gave the go-ahead to launch the surprise attack, Lamora added. Corellia's future is riding on it. That's understandable, Leia said. She turned to Han and shot him her best do-it-for-me pout. Satisfied? Sure. Han frowned and curled his lip at her. He hated it when Leia used her female powers on him. Count me in. Leia only smiled and patted his hand. Me too. Excellent. Gedjin looked relieved. He rose and stretched his arm across the table. The five worlds are grateful. As he and Han shook hands, Lamora removed a data card from her pocket and passed it to Leia. I took the liberty of preparing a vid briefing. You can look it over when you return to the Falcon. Our instructions are on it? Leia asked. Of course, Gedjin said. He extended a hand toward the exit. You'll need to get underway quickly if you're going to reach Hapes in time. I'll show you out. Until he stood and led the solos into the outer cabin. As soon as the door closed behind him, he clasped Han's shoulder. Sorry, old buddy. I was looking forward to ordering you around. Why? Han retorted. You don't think I'd have obeyed, do you? Until he's laughed. I suppose not. He turned to Leia and said, Thanks for helping. If we have any hope of getting the Alliance to back off before this war gets ugly, you're it. I'm glad to help. You know that. Leia studied Antilles for a moment. Then her voice grew sober. Wedge, what aren't they telling us? Antilles looked back toward the door and shook his head. I don't know, Princess, and I don't like it any more than you do. Well, whatever it is, it's got to be better for us to talk to Tenel Ka than Willems, Han said. That guy could drive me into the Alliance's arms. I think that's what Gedjin was counting on, Leia said. He knew you'd have to say yes if you saw the alternative in person. It worked. Han turned to Antilles. That, and finding out my alternative, was being your decoy. Glad I could help you make up your mind, then. Until he smiled wearily, then shook hands with Han and kissed Leia on the cheek. I should be getting back, or they're going to think I'm trying to talk you out of this. May the Force be with you. Thanks, Wedge, Leia said, turning toward the door. We'll need it. Chapter 2 Jaina Solo did not want to leave her dream bubble. She was with Jagged Fell deep in the heart warmth of their nest, their heads still throbbing to the rhythm of the little dawn rumble, their bodies filled with the sweet heat of killick mating pheromones. All the galaxy's troubles seemed far away, and their battle in the skies of Tanoop had never happened. For once they were together and at peace with nothing to do but listen to the sweet sound of... Alarm bells? The bell was chiming inside Jaina's skull, shaking the dream bubble until it popped, calling her back from her force hibernation into the icy freefall of reality. She opened her eyes and found herself staring at the frost-rhymed interior of a stealth X canopy, her teeth chattering so hard she thought they might shatter. She felt queasy and sore and muddle-headed, and even in the frigid conditions, the cockpit smelled stale and sour. Okay, Sneaker, I'm awake, Jaina said. 
you can turn up the heater and the air scrubbers. The Astromech, a replacement for Sneaky, whom she had lost when Jag and his squadron shot her down on Tanoop, beeped an acknowledgment, and warm air began to pour into the Stealth X's cockpit. Jaina expanded her force awareness. As her mind cleared, she felt her wingmate, Zack, also awakening. He had resigned his commission in Rogue Squadron a couple of weeks earlier, when Jason had attempted to court-martial Jaina for refusing to fire on a helpless blockade runner. Now he and Jaina were part of a Jedi reconnaissance team spying on the secret Corellian shipyards in the Kiris asteroid cluster. Though Jaina could feel Zek's force presence floating a dozen meters ahead and a little below her own position, it took several moments to locate the cross-shaped silhouette of his stealth X. Basically a configuration of the formidable XJ-3 X-Wing, the Stealth X Starfighter had a fiberplast body that was all irregular planes and angles, with a matte black finish camouflaged with an eye-deceiving pattern of tiny blue points that rendered it almost invisible against a starry background. It also had a gravitic modulator, photon absorbers, thermal dissipators, and an entire suite of specialized signal negators that made it almost invisible to sensor sweeps. Even its fusel engines burned a special Tybana isotope, whose efflux turned dark a millisecond after fusion. About a kilometer ahead of Zex Stealth X tumbled the inky darkness of Kiris-17, which marked the upper limit of the Kiris asteroid cluster. The Corellian sun was just visible beneath the asteroid's belly, a yellow pinprick barely brighter than the surrounding stars. Next to the star was the slow-growing dash of an efflux trail. "'What do we have, Sneaker?' Jaina asked. A message appeared on the now-defrosted display, informing Jaina that a light transport was departing the cluster. Jaina frowned. "'You pulled us out of hibernation for a single vessel?' Sneaker displayed another message. "'Contact profile is unique.' Vessel is overpowered CEC YT-1300, exhibiting sudden change to possible outbound trajectory. Efflux signature suggests military-grade exhaust nozzles. The Falcon? Jaina was not all that surprised. Of course, Han and Leia Solo would be in the thick of things. She just hoped they did not return to the Kiruses before Admiral Boatu sprang his trap. So far, the Corellians did not seem to realize that the Galactic Alliance knew of their secret fleet, and when the Kiris fleet finally left base, the Corellians were going to be in for a nasty shock. Are you sure? Affirmative. Trajectory is now confirmed outbound. I mean about the efflux signature, Jaina growled. Is that the Falcon or not? Uncertain. Current data yields an identity coefficient of only 94%. Jaina sighed. For the R9 unit to be sure, he would have to be plugged into one of the Falcon's data sockets, swapping data with the primary control brain. Keep watching, and plot a list of likely... Zex Stealth X suddenly started after the Falcon, and Jaina let the sentence trail off. A list of likely destinations... Sneaker inquired. Right. Jaina shoved her own throttles forward and shot after Zek, at the same time reaching out to him in the force. Though their telepathic joiner bond had finally dissolved a couple of years before, she and Zek remained so acutely attuned to each other that they could often communicate through the Jedi battle meld more clearly than most people conversed, and she quickly understood his intentions. Equal parts spy and assault craft, Stealth X starfighters were equipped with eavesdropping equipment so sensitive it could intercept stray signals from a vessel's internal computers. If Zek could close the distance before the Falcon jumped to hyperspace, he might be able to capture enough data from the Solo's nav computer to determine their destination. What Zek did not intend to do, he assured Jaina, was vape her parents. She answered with a cynical concern for him. If there was any shooting, he was the one who would need worrying about, not her parents. 
This elicited a warm feeling of satisfaction from Zek. A sincere feeling of satisfaction. The meld nearly shattered beneath the harshness of Jaina's frustration. She wished Zek would just give it up. He would never be more than her best friend. Why couldn't he just accept that and go find a nice Faleen girl to fall for? Even without mind-sharing, the message was clear enough. Zek withdrew into himself, maintaining barely enough contact to keep the meld open, and they closed the rest of the distance in cold isolation. Jaina hated hurting him like that. He was the best wingmate she'd ever had, but he just did not seem to get it. She didn't want to be in love. Not with him, not with Jagged Fell, not with anyone. She was the Sword of the Jedi, whatever that meant. She probably wasn't even supposed to be in love. Kiris Seventeen slid past above, drawing a momentary curtain of darkness over Jaina's canopy. Then there was nothing between the stealth exes and their target except a hundred kilometers of empty space. The Falcon was really moving. Jaina's throttles were pushed to the overload stops, and still the old transport yielded her lead only grudgingly. The inky mass of Curis III tumbled past beneath the chase, its dark surface and frigid heat signature betraying no sign of the shipyard concealed within. The Falcon's efflux trail slowly changed from a tail to a solid bar. Jaina activated her eavesdropping array, then instructed Sneaker to inform her when he began to pick up signals. But several more seconds passed, and Jaina began to think she and Zek would not catch up before the Falcon escaped the Kiris Cluster's weak gravity and entered hyperspace. Finally, the outline of the Falcon's sensor dish grew visible above the brilliant glow of her ion drives, and Sneaker reported that the eavesdropping array was picking up stray signals. Jaina and Zek strengthened their contact and swung out to opposite sides of the target, then felt a wave of astonishment roll through the meld as Leia discerned its presence. Jaina pulled out immediately, and, astonished by her mother's force sensitivity, tried to make her presence very small. Her eavesdropping array lit up as it began to capture and record electronic pulses from inside the Falcon. An instant later, she sensed Leia searching for her, and tried to draw in on herself even further. But there was no hiding from one's own mother. Not when that mother was Leia Solo, anyway. Jaina felt a brief moment of warmth, followed by an overwhelming sense of relief and, oddly, reassurance. Then the battered old transport shot away, her ion tail thinning into nothingness as she vanished into hyperspace. The meld filled with a sense of puzzlement as Zek reached out for an explanation. But Jaina understood no better than he did. Her mother had obviously sensed their presence, which meant she now knew the Jedi were keeping a watch on the Kiruses, and that they had probably captured the Falcon's destination. Zek wondered if Leia had been relieved because she thought he and Jaina would not report the contact. The Solos were, after all, high-value targets— and what kind of daughter would sick a hunter-killer squadron on her own parents? Sneaker beeped for Jaina's attention, then scrolled a message across the display, announcing that he had analyzed the intercepted data and used his superior computing power to develop a list of the Falcon's most likely destinations. So stop bragging and show me, Jaina ordered. Droids don't brag, Sneaker replied. They inform. A list of planet names began to scroll down the display. Erebanth, Cheruba, Drina, Galanor. Those are all in the Hapes Consortium, Jaina cried. Sneaker confirmed that they were, then apologized for not pinpointing the destination more exactly. The transitory mists that enveloped the consortium made hyperspace lanes such a tangle that once a vessel entered Hapen territory, Evaluating what course it would follow was statistically impossible. That's okay, Jaina replied. You're close enough. Zek's surprise flooded the melt, 
and Jaina knew that his R9 had just reported the same thing to him. His surprise changed to urgency. Whatever the Falcon's reasons for traveling to the Hapes Consortium, it could not mean anything good for the Alliance. Someone had to leave the observation post to report the intercept, and the possibility that the Corellians might soon know that the Galactic Alliance was watching their secret shipyards. And Jaina knew who that had to be. Expecting Zek to omit the Falcon's name from his report was out of the question. Sometimes he was just too much of a steady blade for his own good. Or in this case, for her parents' good. Chapter 3 It was the moment Mara had been dreaming of, and dreading, for years. The first time father and son entered the Jedi Temple sparring arena with live blades. But she had never imagined it would be like this with Luke so determined to teach rather than train, with Ben so resentful and frightened. It made her fear for them both, made her wish that she could be down on the arena floor instead of up here in a hot control booth packed with glide levers, toggle switches, and actuating buttons. The far door of the arena opened, and Luke entered. Walking to the center of the floor, he glanced up at the control booth and flashed Mara a reassuring smile then stood waiting for Ben. The sparring arena was basically a bull-shaped chamber, filled with balance beams, various kinds of swings, and repulsor-floated wobble balls. Interior conditions such as temperature and lighting could be changed from the control booth, and an automatic safety field caught anybody who started to fall out of control. The near door opened, and Ben entered, his blue eyes sweeping the vault, examining everything in the chamber but his opponent. In contrast to the simple gray robe in which Luke was dressed, Ben wore a sparring suit made of a lighter, more flexible version of the Von Doon crabshell armor that had proven so difficult to penetrate in the Jedi's first encounters with the Yuzhan Vong. Despite his obvious apprehension, Ben marched straight to the center of the vault, and Mara was struck by how mature her thirteen-year-old son had become. He was wearing his red hair in a helmet-friendly crew cut with a single braid of longer hair, and his face was losing its roundness. But the biggest change was in his raised chin and square shoulders, in his resolute stride and proud expression. He bowed formally, then said, Apprentice Skywalker reporting for sparring instruction as ordered, Master. Luke raised his eyebrows at Ben's use of the title Apprentice but did not correct him. Very good. He studied Ben's sparring armor for a moment, then motioned at the breastplate. Take it off. Ben's brow rose, but he undid the side closures. The breast and back plates fell away in his hands, and he placed them on the floor beside him. Next, Luke motioned at the arm and leg guards. All of it. Ben lost enough of his composure to let his feelings show, and Mara began to sense through the Force how nervous their son really was to be formally summoned to a private sparring match with his father, and how disturbing he found it to be ordered to remove his armor. But she could also feel his courage. Despite his confusion, Ben was determined to present himself well, to set aside his anxiety and prove himself worthy of the trust that was being placed in him. And that made Mara remember why her nephew was good for Ben. It had been Jason who had drawn her son out of his shell and helped him embrace the Force, who had taught him to face his fears and look beyond himself. Jason was teaching Ben responsibility, giving him a sense of himself as someone other than the son of Luke Skywalker, Grand Master of the Jedi Order. Ben removed his last shin guard and placed it on the floor beside him. Then, as he straightened up again, Mara experienced a profound sense of certainty. It was as powerful as a force vision, except that its source was standing ten meters below her, in the form of her own son. The force had drawn him to Jason for a reason, and if she and Luke dared interfere, it would be at Ben's peril. Luke snapped the lightsaber off his utility belt and looked up toward the control booth. Start with basic obstacles, 
Luke ordered. Then work up to a Class Five environment. Full hazard? Mara asked in astonishment. Even Masters found Class Five environments trying. Are you sure? I'm sure. Luke answered in his best, are you really questioning the Grand Master voice? He looked back to Ben. How else can I test what Jason has been teaching him? Don't worry, Mom. Ben met his father's gaze evenly, but the crack in his voice betrayed his apprehension. I can handle it. Not likely, Mara thought, but Luke would be in there too and he wasn't going to let anything terrible happen to their son. At least nothing physical. If you say so. Mara had to let Ben make his own mistakes and learn his own lessons. Luke, too. Wasn't that what the Force was telling her? We'll start with variable gravity, and I'll add something every ninety seconds. Ready? Ben's face paled, but he snapped the lightsaber off his belt. Ready. Mara reached for the gravity control glide switch. They had to trust Ben to find his own way, to learn from his own experiences. If they didn't, he would become resentful and angry and withdrawn, and all he would ever be in life was the son of the great Luke Skywalker. That's what the Force was telling her, wasn't it? Luke felt his knees tense as Mara pushed the gravity to two Gs. He could sense through the Force that she doubted he was doing the right thing, that she believed he should just talk with Ben and help him see how Jason was slipping toward darkness. But Luke had tried talking, had been patient, and their son was still going on raids with the Galactic Alliance Guard. Ben had even killed a man in self-defense, and the fact that he had been in so much danger only made it more disturbing. Luke did not want his son to grow up believing that such things were common necessities for Jedi. The time had come to show Ben that there was another way, a better way, for someone strong in the Force to use his power. All right, son, Luke said. Let's see how well Jason has been training you. Ben brought the hilt of his lightsaber into the salute position, but did not ignite the blade. You know I don't want to do this, right? It's hard to miss. Luke remained where he was, holding his own weapon at his side. With round eyes and pudgy cheeks, Ben still looked like a little boy to him, like a child playing Jedi Apprentice. Why not? Ben shrugged and refused to meet Luke's eyes. I just don't. Are you afraid I'll hurt you? Yeah, right. Ben's voice was sarcastic. The greatest sword handler in the galaxy accidentally cuts up his own son. Like that's going to happen. Luke had to force himself to keep a serious expression. Then you're afraid you'll hurt me. Is that it? Maybe. Ben nodded uncomfortably. By accident... Luke waited for Ben's gaze to return, then said, You won't. Have some faith, okay? Ben's cheeks reddened. I do, he said, but I'm still afraid. Something feels wrong about this. Something is wrong about this, Luke said. You shouldn't be going on hunts with Jason. You shouldn't be a member of G.A.G., and you sure shouldn't be busting down doors and killing people. You're too young. Ben's face hardened, not with the resentment Luke had expected, but with resolve. I save lives every time I go on a mission. Isn't that what Jedi are supposed to do? Ben, you're not a Jedi, Luke said. You're not even a true apprentice. You haven't completed any of the Academy tests. I've been kind of busy catching terrorists. Ben's tone was pointed without being angry. Besides, Jason says I'm stronger in the Force than any of the Academy's apprentices. That's not for Jason to judge. 
Luke was relieved to discover how hard Ben was to anger. It made him hope that maybe Mara was right, that maybe Jason wasn't leading their son down such a dark path after all. If you want to continue helping Jason and G.A.G., you'll have to prove to me that you're ready. I'm not quitting G.A.G., Ben insisted. Jason needs me. The Alliance needs me. Then show me you're ready. Luke brought his lightsaber to guard, but did not activate it. If I have to, Ben ignited his own blade, then frowned when Luke did not do the same. Aren't you going to turn on your lightsaber? When I need to, Luke said. When you make me. A gleam of understanding came to Ben's eye and he stepped forward with a high slash. The double gravity slowed the attack, and Luke had plenty of time to contemplate the hesitation he saw in his son's eyes. Ben was not comfortable sparring. He hadn't done it often enough to trust himself not to hurt his partner, or his partner not to hurt him. Luke evaded the attack by dropping into a squat, then thrust his foot out to sweep Ben's leading leg out from beneath him. Ben slammed to the floor, then cleared the area by whipping his blade in a circle around his body. The boy might not be much at sparring, but he did know how to fight. Had Luke not already launched himself into a backward spring, the attack would have taken his legs off at the knees. He landed just beyond reach and allowed Ben's blade to sweep past, then stepped forward again and deadened the brachial nerve bundle by kicking Ben under the arm. Hard! Ben's hand opened, and the blade of his lightsaber fizzled out as the hilt went spinning across the vault. Luke somersaulted three meters up to land atop a balance beam. "'You'll have to do better than that, son,' he said. Though his tone was light, inside he was cringing at how hard Ben had thumped the floor. The safety field would not allow anyone to hit hard enough to suffer any real harm— but no good father enjoyed bruising his own child, even if it would make that child wiser and stronger. You won't force me to ignite my blade by swinging short. Ben's face reddened more from embarrassment than irritation. Then he sprang to his feet and tried to reach toward his lightsaber. When his sword arm failed to rise, the nerves would still be numb from Luke's kick, he extended his other hand— and summoned the weapon back to it. He activated the blade and took a few test swings to make sure his one-handed grip was dry and firm, then looked up at the balance beam where Luke was standing. I don't understand why you're doing this. Yes, you do, Luke said. I need to know you can defend yourself. Then why am I doing all the attacking? Ben demanded. That's not going to tell you anything. It'll tell me plenty. Luke pointed at a wobble ball floating nearby, then used the force to send it hurling at Ben. There are many kinds of danger. Ben ducked the projectile and force sprang into the air. Luke hurled another wobble ball, and this time Ben had to block, bringing his lightsaber around to slice the ball in two. He landed on the far end of the balance beam, and that was when Mara turned on the wind. The sudden blast was nearly enough to knock Luke from the beam, but Ben merely leaned into the wind and started cautiously forward. Luke frowned up at the control booth, wondering whether Mara had used the force to give Ben a little warning. The thought had barely crossed his mind before he sensed her touch, assuring him she had not, but urging him not to be too hard on their son. Yet Luke had to be, he had to know what lessons Jason was teaching Ben. He rooted himself to the beam through the force, then glanced up at another wobble ball and brought it flying down at his son from behind. Ben's eyes widened as he sensed danger through the force, and he flattened himself atop the beam. In the next moment, he used a force shove to accelerate the heavy wobble ball into Luke's chest and send him tumbling toward the floor. On the way down, Luke caught the support cable of a nearby swing and hooked a leg over the seat, then saw Ben descending toward him in a series of somersaults, 
his lightsaber weaving a wild snarl of light. This time, Luke sensed no hesitation. Ben intended to make him activate his lightsaber, even at the risk of cutting something off. Luke released the swing and dropped toward the floor, barely bringing his legs around in time to land on his feet, sinking so deep into a crouch that his knees hit his chest. Ben used the force to adjust his own trajectory, descending head first with his lightsaber held out in front of him. Luke rolled into a backward somersault, an eerie tingle erupting over his entire body as the safety field reacted to Ben's uncontrolled plunge. But the safety field did not prevent Ben's lightsaber from puncturing the floor. A loud electrical pop echoed through the arena, and suddenly the air was filled with the acrid stench of melted circuitry. A terrible thump sounded, and when Luke completed his somersault, he found his son lying in a heap, facing the opposite direction and groaning. The roaring wind died, and Mara's voice came over the loudspeaker. Ben! Luke rushed up behind Ben. Ben, say something! When there was no answer, Luke started to kneel then heard the familiar snap-hiss of an igniting lightsaber. Ben whirled into a shoulder roll, and Luke sprang up, launching himself into a full force flip to buy some distance. When he came down five meters away, Ben was still kneeling where he had landed, staring at Luke in astonished frustration. Luke smiled. Nice move. Ben pursed his lips skeptically. Still didn't make you ignite your lightsaber. Almost, though, Luke said. Did Jason teach you that? Ben rolled his eyes. Come on, Dad. Playing dead is pretty basic stuff. Luke raised his brow. Nearly got me. Just using your fatherly love against you. Ben shut down his lightsaber and rose to his feet. I'm not sure that's fair. Me either. Luke chuckled, then pointed to the hole in the floor. And that's not good either. You probably put a gap in the safety field. Ben studied the hole for a moment, then looked back to Luke. You can't blame me for that, he said. You're the one who didn't block. I will next time, I promise. Luke assumed a fighting stance and motioned him forward. Come on. Ben's face sagged with discouragement. What for? We already know I can't touch you, and I'm not learning anything. You're sure of that? Luke started to slip slowly forward. Ben, I'm not doing this to be mean. If your sparring is any example, it's clear that you need to devote more time to your Jedi studies and less to helping G.A.G. Sparring isn't fighting, Ben said. When my life is on the line, I can take care of myself. Against most people, yes. Luke reached striking distance and stopped advancing. But do you remember the woman I told you about? Lumia? Ben's eyes widened. The crazy Sith woman? That one, Luke confirmed. I still don't know when she returned or why, but I have learned a little about her, and I've been meditating on it. I'm convinced that if she can, she'll strike at me through you. Me? For the first time, Ben began to look frightened, and Luke began to hope he might actually get through to his son. How? Luke could only shake his head. I wish I knew. But you need to be ready. And that means you need to be properly trained. I am being trained, not by a master and not well. Luke paused trying to choose his next words carefully, to make Ben do what thirteen-year-old boys never did. Think about the future. Finally, he said, You're right about one thing, Ben. Jason and the Alliance do need you. You're helping them save lives, and that's a good thing. Ben eyed him warily. Dad, it'd be really nice if you just stopped there. Sorry. I can't, Luke said. What you're not seeing is that the Jedi need you too. We need you to prepare yourself now, 
because Jason and the Alliance and the rest of the galaxy are going to need you tomorrow even more than they need you today. Then, you need to take a master. I have a master, Ben retorted. Jason is training me, and he'll protect me from Lumia, too. Luke shook his head. Jason can't protect you all the time, and he's not training you. I've sparred Rontos who are better. Despite the affront, Rontos were eight- to ten-year-old academy students, Ben remained surprisingly calm. I'm not sure I believe that. I'm pretty sure I'm better than any kid who's still working with a training prod. Then prove it, Luke said. You don't even have to make me ignite my lightsaber. Just make me move my feet. Ben scowled, obviously suspicious. Dad, come on. We both know. Do it, Luke ordered. If Jason is training you so well, prove it. Just make me move one foot. Ben furrowed his brow, but slipped into a fighting stance and began to circle behind Luke. Luke closed his eyes and concentrated on the drone of the lightsaber, all the time tracking Ben's presence through the Force, waiting for the telltale flicker of resolve that would mean his son was attacking. It did not come until Ben was directly behind him, where Luke would be forced to pivot to see the attack. But Luke didn't need to see. He merely listened until the drone of the lightsaber began to change pitch, then raised his free hand and made a grasping motion, grabbing the hilt of Ben's weapon through the force and holding it motionless two meters away. Ben grunted in surprise, but he was both resourceful and quick. Luke heard the lightsaber deactivate as the hilt was released, then felt his son flying toward the center of his back. He dropped his own lightsaber and turned his weapon hand toward the floor, rooting himself to the force. Ben struck an instant later, kicking out with both feet in an attempt to send Luke flying. Luke did not budge, and Ben hit the floor with another loud thump. Rotter! Luke remained motionless but he opened his eyes and summoned Ben's lightsaber into his grasp. Does that mean you give up? Not... yet. Luke sensed another flicker of excitement in the Force, then glanced over his shoulder to see Ben summoning the lightsaber Luke had dropped just a moment earlier. When it arrived, Ben hefted its weight a couple of times, then scowled and opened the base. Nothing came out. Ben turned to Luke in astonishment. You couldn't activate the blade, he complained. There's no power cell. No, there isn't. Luke turned to face his son full on. A Jedi's greatest weapon is his mind. Ben's face grew red. So I've heard. He rose and handed Luke's lightsaber to him. Thanks for rubbing my nose in it. Luke returned Ben's weapon to him. That's not what I was doing. I know what you were doing, Dad. You had to test me. Ben returned the lightsaber to his utility belt, then added, But I'm not going dark. Anger has no control over me, and neither does fear. Luke nodded. I can see that, Ben. I still want you to take a proper master. Then make Jason a master, Ben replied. He knows more about the Force than anybody. That's not going to happen, Ben, Luke said. Ben considered this a moment, then spoke in a resigned voice. I guess that's your decision, Dad. You're the Grand Master. He started to gather up his sparring armor. I've got to get going. We've got a raid at Twenty Hundred. Ben, I wish you— I have to, Dad. They're counting on me. Ben stood and started toward the door, then suddenly stopped and faced Luke. But I could use some more sparring, if you've got the time. Sure. Luke was as surprised by the peace offering as he was delighted. I'd like that. A lot. Me too. Ben turned away, 
then called over his shoulder, But you'd better bring a power cell. Next time I won't go so easy on you. Mara entered the sparring arena to find Luke kneeling in the center of the floor, staring at the hole Ben had made, but not really examining it. She could sense that he was more worried than ever, though whether it was about Ben's training or something else, she could not tell. Does it really bother you that much? she asked. Luke furrowed his brow. What? Ben passing your test, she said. Whatever he's learning from Jason, it's not turning him to the dark side. I didn't feel any anger in him. Neither did I. Luke's gaze grew distant and thoughtful. He was almost too calm. Mara let out her breath in exasperation. When could Jason have prepared him? she demanded. Luke had intentionally summoned Ben at a time when Jason would be tied up in a meeting with Cal Omas and Admiral Neofel. And you'd better not be telling me you wouldn't sense an act in your own son. No, he wasn't acting. Luke stood and led the way toward the exit. But I'd still like to see Ben apprenticed properly. His training is suffering. That's true, Mara said. While Ben's self-defense skills might be adequate, his sparring had shown a lack of confidence in his control. But has it occurred to you that Ben might be right? Maybe you should make Jason a master. Luke stopped at the door and scowled at her as though she were a fool or a traitor. Or both. Come on, Skywalker, Mara said. You can't dispute Jason's force knowledge— and being a master might pull him back into the Jedi Order. It might give you some control over him. At the least, you'd have a formal means to oversee how he's training Ben. The disapproval vanished from Luke's face. There's something to what you're saying. But I just can't do it. Jason isn't ready to be a master. And I don't think he ever will be. The sooner we get Ben away from him, the better. He started through the door toward the changing rooms, but Mara caught him by the arm. Actually, Luke, I'm not so sure of that. She told him about the profound sense of certainty she had experienced earlier, about how convinced she was that the Force had drawn Ben to Jason for a reason. Whatever is going on with Jason, we need to be careful about interfering. I think his destiny and Ben's are linked. Luke's face grew clouded, and Mara could sense that while he did not doubt what she was telling him, he was having a hard time accepting it. Jason was walking very close to the dark side. Even Mara had to admit that, and yet here she was, telling him that their thirteen-year-old son had to walk that line with him. I know it's a lot to ask, she said, but everything I feel is telling me that we have to let Ben learn from his own experiences, even if those experiences involve Jason. If we don't, Ben is going to grow resentful and withdraw again, from us and the Force. Finally, Luke nodded, but his expression remained clouded. Okay, as long as he keeps sparring with me. That shouldn't be a problem— it was his idea. Mara continued to hold Luke in the door. But I get the feeling there's something you're not telling me. Luke frowned. I'm not sure how it relates. But you think it might? He nodded. My dream has been getting worse. I see, Mara said. For some time now, Luke had been having dreams about a faceless, cloaked figure— that he believed to be Lumia. Define worse. She's sitting on a throne, Luke said, sitting on a throne and laughing in a man's voice. Mara swallowed. She couldn't dismiss what Luke saw in the Force any more than she could deny the certainty of what she had felt just a few moments earlier. Did you see? Her throat closed with dryness and she had to try again. Was Ben? No. 
Luke said. Nobody else was there. Just her. Him. It. Whoever. Looking down and laughing. But it has something to do with Ben? Mara pressed. That's why you wanted to test him today? It's why I wanted to test him. But I don't know how much the dream has to do with him. Luke said. I'm beginning to feel that it's bigger than Ben and Jason. Well, that's a relief. Sort of, Mara said. I don't like that throne, though. It smacks of empire. It certainly does, Luke said, nodding. So I think it's time to break out my Shoto. Mara raised her brow. The Shoto was a special half-length lightsaber that Luke had built after nearly losing his life the first time he encountered Lumia's light whip. The shorter blade allowed him to fight in the Jarkai style, with a weapon in each hand, which counteracted the advantage of the light whip's dual-natured strands of energy and matter. So you're going after her? Mara asked. Luke nodded. I think it's time to find Lumia and get to the bottom of this. Then I'd better build a Shoto, too, Mara said, because you're not going after her alone. Chapter 4 After a long mission force hibernating in the cold, cramped cockpit of a Stealth X, what Jaina wanted was a hot Sanistine and a Nerf steak as large as her plate. What she got, as she passed the fastidious officers on the command deck of the Admiral Akbar, were sudden glances and, sometimes, wrinkled noses. She was still wearing the same black flight suit in which she had spent the last week, and the climate-controlled warmth of the Star Destroyer was doing nothing to mask the fact. Jaina stopped at the edge of the tactical salon and waited for Admiral Boitou to free himself. After a decade of off-and-on service in Rogue and various other X-Wing squadrons, it was hard to avoid saluting or reporting her arrival in a clear, sharp voice. But she was no longer in the military. She had been discharged for refusing to obey Jason's order to fire on a fleeing blockade runner. And Jedi Knights seldom needed to announce themselves. The tactical hollow display in the center of the salon suggested that the Corellian situation had not changed during her week at the observation post. Fleets enforcing the Alliance Exclusionary Zone still surrounded Centerpoint Station and all five of Corell's habitable planets, and the Kiris asteroid cluster continued to glow in faint, cautionary yellow. The location of Boatu's ambush fleet, lying in wait three light-years from the edge of the system, was indicated by a simple blue arrow and a distance marker. Were the situation to remain static for another year, the two sides might actually have time to work out their differences. But the galaxy was not going to be that lucky. There were too many schemes underway, too many factors on a collision course, and Jaina was about to bring another big complication into play. When High Command learned that the Corellians were in contact with Hapes, one of the Alliance's most supportive member states, spies would be tasked to investigate and diplomats sent to make inquiries. Forces would be mobilized, and assets moved into position, and the war would grow that much harder to stop. Jaina did not even want to consider what might happen if High Command heard that her parents were involved. There would be a lot of unjustified concern, perhaps even panic. Scouts would be dispatched to locate them, and a task force assigned to capture, perhaps even destroy, the Millennium Falcon. That possibility had run through her mind over and over during the long journey back from the Curuses, reinforcing the notion that her report might not need to include certain things. Jaina looked from the holo display to a niche high on the salon's back wall, where a larmel stone bust of the great Admiral Akbar kept watch over his namesake. She knew enough about the political instincts of Bothans to realize Boatu was only displaying the statue to curry favor with the Alliance's new Mon Calamari Supreme Commander, Cha Niafel. But the effigy struck her as deeply ironic. Akbar had been a firm believer in the benevolent power of a united galaxy, 
and no one could be more disturbed to see the Galactic Alliance going to war against one of its own member states than he would have been. The trouble was, Jaina just did not see how Omas could have avoided it. Frack and Sal Solo and his cohorts had been trying to bring Centerpoint Station back online, and they had been building a secret invasion fleet in the Kiris asteroid cluster. Clearly, Corellia had been preparing to attack someone, and the inability to discover the intended target did not excuse the Alliance from its duty to intervene. Jaina sensed Boatu approaching and turned her attention in the Admiral's direction. With small, burning eyes and graying chin fur, the Bothan cut a feral and surprisingly dignified figure in his white uniform. A reminder, Boatu said in his gritty voice. Jaina frowned in bafflement. Sir? Boatu pointed a finger at the bust of Admiral Akbar. The statue, he said. It has nothing to do with Admiral Neothel, as you were thinking. It's there to keep me humble. Jaina was too surprised to ask Boatu exactly how he knew what she had been thinking. Perhaps that was what everyone thought when they saw the statue. Or perhaps he was just that good at reading faces. Humble? she asked. How is that, sir? The fur rose along the back of Boatu's neck. Jedi can't possibly be that poorly informed. I was the laughingstock of the entire Space Navy over the incident in the Murgo Choke. Not the entire Space Navy, sir, Jaina said. During the recent peacekeeping operations in the Unknown Regions, the Akbar had been captured by a swarm of Killick commandos, smuggled aboard in busts of Admiral Boatu himself. I'm pretty sure Admiral Pelion didn't find it at all funny. Boatu's ears came forward. Then he seemed to recognize the humor in Jaina's tone and snorted in approval. No, he didn't, Boatu said. As a matter of fact, I'm surprised the old battle can let me keep my command. The Killix certainly wished he hadn't, Jaina said. Boatu studied her with narrowed eyes, no doubt wondering whether there remained enough joiner in Jaina to wish that the Killix had prevailed in their war against the Chiss. What I'm trying to say is that your performance after the Akbar's capture was brilliant. Jaina clarified. Nobody else could have stopped those nest ships in the Murgo Choke. Boatu's expression grew pleased. Probably not. No one else would have moved so quickly to exploit the enemy's uncertainty, especially in the face of such overwhelming... The Admiral stopped and glanced up at Akbar's bust, then flattened his ears in embarrassment. Well, I was taking a substantial risk. But that can't be the reason you need to see me. What's this about a transport leaving the system? Jaina swallowed, then stepped close enough to speak in a hushed voice. It was bound for the Hapes Consortium, sir. The Consortium? The fur on Boatu's brow pulled forward. You're sure? She nodded. Very sure. The accuracy of the intercepts is beyond doubt. Well, how... alarming. Boatu avoided asking any specifics about the intercept method. Stealth X eavesdropping technology was highly classified, and there were too many years without the proper clearance to discuss the matter in the tax cell. The Hapes Consortium is a big gob of space. Were you able to determine which planet? Jaina shook her head. I'm afraid not. The transitory mists make Hape and hyperspace lanes too tangled to tell. But Hapes is definitely the direction that the vessel was headed. I see. Boatu fell silent for a moment, his gaze growing distant and thoughtful. So the Corellians are hoping to draw the Hapens into the war on their side. That's very hard to believe, Admiral, Jaina said. It was the obvious conclusion, but given who was involved, 
It just didn't make sense. We might want to consider alternative explanations. I already have, Jedi Solo. Boatu studied Jaina carefully, his eyes slowly growing beady and suspicious. This one is a near certainty. Naval intelligence reports that both Nal Hutta and Bathawi have refused to ally, at least openly, against the Galactic Alliance. And Corellia knows she can't defeat us alone. They may be desperate, Admiral, but they're not fools. Jaina had grown up in a household where heads of state and supreme commanders were everyday guests. But there was something penetrating in Boatu's gaze that made her feel exposed and uneasy. The Galactic Alliance has Tenel Ka's full support, and the Corellians know it. She's sent us two full battle fleets. Boatu's look of suspicion changed to one of disappointment. I didn't say they were going to meet the Queen Mother, Jedi Solo. Jaina frowned digesting his remark for a moment, then asked, You think Corellia intends to overthrow Tenelka? I think Corellia intends to help, Boatu corrected. The Queen Mother's support of the Alliance is unpopular among her nobles, so I'm sure they have their pick of potential usurpers. No, Jaina's stomach nodded with outrage with the refusal to believe her parents could betray such a good friend. That just doesn't make sense. Boatu studied her with a cocked head for a moment, then asked, Exactly what doesn't make sense, Jedi Solo? There's something you're not telling me. What makes you say that, sir? Jaina knew as soon as she had spoken it, that it was the wrong question to ask. Bothans were renowned throughout the galaxy as masters of treachery, and that meant seeing through lies as well as telling them. I mean, I have good reason to believe that's not what the Corellians are intending. Boatu looked at her expectantly. I'm only sorry that I'm not at liberty to reveal it, she said. It's, um... A secret of the Order. I see. Boatu tugged at his grain fur, then turned away and motioned for Jaina to follow. Come with me, young woman. Jaina gulped and did as she was ordered. Boatu led her into his private office at the rear of the tactical salon. Like everything else aboard his Star Destroyer, the cabin was austere and tidy with another bust of Admiral Akbar sitting on one corner of his desk. There were half a dozen sturdy plastoid chairs in front of the desk and a pair of gray couches in one corner, but Watu did not invite Jaina to sit on any of the furniture. Instead, he opaqued the transparent steel wall that separated the cabin from the salon, then turned to face her. The transport was the Millennium Falcon. The Admiral stated this as fact, not question. Jedi aren't technically under my command, so I won't bother ordering you to answer me. But you should know that this is what I assume. Jaina's heart fell. Her parents were about to have a pair of very big targets drawn on their backs. The exact identity of the vessel didn't seem relevant at the time. Boatu's voice grew sharp. Obviously it was. You don't believe Han and Leia Solo would betray your friend. I know they wouldn't, Jaina insisted. You would have a better idea of that than I, of course. Boatu's reaction was surprising in its mildness. But the fact remains that they're on their way to the Hapes Consortium. And this is a very crucial moment for Corellia. We must at least consider the possibility. He laid a furry hand on Jaina's shoulder, then continued in a voice as gentle as it was raspy. I want you to take a moment 
and think this over very carefully. I'll believe whatever you tell me. But please remember that the lives of your parents are only two of the many billions that may depend on your accuracy. I'm aware of that, Admiral, Jaina said. But thank you for the reminder. As much as Jaina wanted to leap to her parents' defense again, she forced herself to do as Boatu asked. The truth was, Jaina had no idea how her mother and father might be reacting to the change in Jason. At one time, her mother had vowed never to have children, because one of them might grow up to become another Darth Vader. With the Hala News reporting that Jason had imprisoned hundreds of thousands of Corellians, her parents might well have decided that Leia's old fears were justified. But Jaina had not felt any hint of guilt when her mother touched her through the Force earlier, and had the Solos been planning to betray Tenel Ka, she believed she would have. Besides, her parents had always been loyal to their friends, especially friends who were loyal to them, and she could not see that changing now. Finally, Jaina sighed and shook her head. I know it looks bad, but I just don't think they would do something like that. Boatu stared into her eyes. You are sure? It's what I believe, Admiral. That's the best I can do. Jaina looked away. Given what a monster my brother is becoming, I don't think I can be sure of what anyone is capable of. Boatu's lip curled at the mention of her brother. Yes, your brother is driving dissenters into the enemy camp even faster than he is killing them. Jaina raised her brow in surprise. The admiral winced visibly, then waved the comment off with a flip of his hand. Waste no time fretting over my loyalty, he said. I swore a vow of Crevy the day I became a fleet admiral. Even when Bathawi finally enters the war, I'll continue to serve the Galactic Alliance. When Bathawi enters the war? Jaina asked. Not if? When, Boatu confirmed. My people prefer treachery to war. But we do occasionally let outrage dictate our actions. Jaina frowned. What are you talking about? A gleam of understanding came to Boatu's eyes. I'm sorry. You wouldn't have heard. Your brother has started assassinating Bothans. Assassinating Bothans? Jaina gasped. Jason isn't that stupid. No, but he does protect his assets, Boatu said. The world brain is near death because of a recent attack, and it is Jason's best means of tracking Corellian terrorists through the Undercity. Jaina frowned. She was hardly surprised to learn that her brother was employing the world brain as a spy, but she was shocked to hear Boatu talking as though they had discussed the matter personally— I can't imagine Jason sharing that information with the military. He didn't, Boatu said. So your sources are... Accurate, Boatu replied. That's all you need to know. Okay, Jaina said slowly. And these sources think the Bothans are the ones who attack the World Brain? The true victory party? No. Boatu hesitated, then said, According to my sources, the true victory party can't even find it. But Jason believes that Remwa ordered the attack, and so my species is becoming an endangered one on Coruscant. Jaina's stomach grew hollow and queasy. This was one more force pushing the galaxy closer to war and, as usual, her brother was in the middle of it. I don't see how your informants can know what Jason believes, Jaina said, still probing for the source of his intelligence. 
I have the Force, and I'm his twin sister. And even I couldn't tell you what he believes. You aren't a Bothan, Jedi Solo. Jaina raised her brow. So your sources are inside the true victory party? Watu looked away for a moment, obviously debating how much to tell her. You asked me for an honest answer. Jaina sent him a little force nudge. And I gave it to you. Boatu nodded. Very well. We both have divided loyalties here, so we'll just have to trust each other. He waited for an affirming nod from Jaina, then continued, For some time now, the Bothan government has been asking me to resign my commission and return home. The intelligence regarding the assassinations is their latest attempt to persuade me. They have a source inside G.A.G.? Jaina gasped. I don't know the nature of their intelligence, Boatu replied carefully, only that it is proven accurate so far. That doesn't mean you should believe their denial, Jaina said. I mean, the Bothan government has a vested interest in convincing you that the attack on the world brain wasn't Bothan. True. But there is other evidence, Boatu replied. Had true victory been behind the attack, it would not have failed. Jaina chose to ignore his species conceit for the moment and treat the statement as fact. Okay. If Bothans weren't responsible, who was? My guess is Corellian terrorists. If the world brain has been helping Jason track them, then they're the ones who have the most to gain by killing it. Boatu retreated toward his desk, then clasped his hands behind his back and stared at the galactic vid map hanging on his wall. But that's hardly our concern at the moment. Whatever your parents are doing in Hapen space, their trip has something to do with a coup attempt. Perhaps they are only going to warn Tenelka about the consequences of supporting the Alliance. You mean to threaten her? A threat is a warning, Boatu replied. At the moment, that is what we must assume. It's really Corellia's only hope. Which means the Corellians aren't going to send the Kiris fleet against our blockade, Jaina said, guessing Boatu already realized this. They'll use it to support the Hapen coup. Exactly, Boatu replied. My fleet is badly out of position. So you'll reposition? I'll certainly suggest it to Admiral Neothel, Boatu said. But she's a very domineering fish. She's laid a trap for the Corellians, and she won't abandon it easily. So? Jaina asked. You're going to move anyway, right? And disregard my crevy? Boatu sneered at her, as though she had just suggested cheating it to Jarek. Who do you think I am, your father? Sorry, Jaina said, taken aback by his harsh tone. I didn't mean anything by it. But there's something else you should know. When the Falcon departed, my mother sensed my presence. She must know the Jedi are watching the Kiruses. I see. Boatu grew thoughtful. Do you think she would tell your father? We have to assume that, Jaina said. And we must also assume he'll tell the Corellians that we know about their secret fleet. Boatu's expression grew pensive. And yet we can't be certain. This does add an interesting twist to the problem. That's an understatement, Jaina said. But now you'll have to move the fleet. Boatu frowned at her. Haven't you been listening? Admiral Neothel's mind is made up. But when she hears... She isn't going to change her plans because of a few feelings between a mother and daughter, Boatu said. She'll dismiss it as soft intelligence. Then what are you going to do? 
I don't know yet. Boatu wrinkled his muzzle and returned his gaze to the galactic vid map on his wall. His voice assumed an absent-minded tone. How interesting. When he did not elaborate, Jaina went to his side and stared up at the vid map. It was a standard galactic projection, with the luminous white cloud of the deep core near the center of the upper frame and the unknown regions not shown at all. Corellia was a small dot on the opposite side of the deep core from Coruscant, forming a large triangle of space with Bethawi and Nalhada. It looks more frightening to me than interesting, Jaina said. If you're right about Bethawi joining Corellia, it won't be long before Nalhada follows. The rebels will control a quarter of the galaxy. Not that. Boatu pointed a finger at Duro which was located just beyond Corellia on the Corellian trade spine. It appears that Chief Omis's fears were rather well justified. Janus scowled, still not understanding. I'm happy to hear that, but— The mines! Boatu tapped a control key below the display, and the map zoomed in until it showed only the Corellian system. He pointed at a tiny yellow blip near the outer edge of the system. In a few weeks, the Kyrises will be in a direct line between Duro and the Corellian Star. With all that electromagnetic blast in the background, it would be impossible for the Duros to detect the launch of the Kyris fleet. Jaina's jaw dropped. Sal Solo was going to attack Duro? The timing is certainly right, Boatu said. And Duro still has large deposits of beradium and cortosis. Jaina did not know whether to be sickened or relieved, as the primary component of explosives ranging from thermal detonators to proton bombs, beradium had become the commodity of choice among the galaxy's ever-growing number of arms smugglers, and woven cortosis fibers could be used to short-circuit lightsaber blades. Well, at least Chief Omis and Uncle Luke can stop double-guessing themselves about the blockade, Jaina said. The last thing the galaxy needs is someone dumping a million tons of beradium into the black market. Or to start selling lightsaber-proof armor, Boatu added. But that's not our concern at that moment. Someone needs to warn the Queen Mother about the situation, and we can't trust this to a holocom. Even if the signal isn't intercepted, we can't be sure the message will reach Tenelka without passing through the wrong hands first. The consortium is a real fluger bed of intrigue. I can reach out to her through the Force, Jaina said. That will give her some warning. A specific warning? Jaina shook her head. She'll know there is danger, but not from where. Then someone needs to see her in person, Boatu said. So you're sending me? Jaina asked. I'm asking you, Boatu corrected. You're a Jedi, remember? Of course, Jaina said. I mean... I'll be happy to go. Good. Boatu checked his chrono, then said, And I think you should pick up Zek on the way. This isn't the sort of thing we should take chances with. I'll ask Lobaka and Tisar to go out early and take over the observation post. Very good. Jaina would need to carry some extra fuel for Zek's stealth X, but it was doable and it would give her a chance to figure out what the blazes her parents were doing. Thank you. No. Thank you, Boatu said. I'll send a message up the chain of command, too. But this will be faster. And maybe you can find a way to keep your family name out of this mess. I doubt anyone back on Coruscant would want Holonet News accusing Han and Leia Solo of running across the galaxy arranging coups. Chapter 5 
the Queen Mother's special salon was equipped with every modern convenience, from flavor-optimizing beverage dispensers to auto-massaging furniture to participatory holodrama booths. So Han did not understand why the only chronometer in the room was an ancient pendulum clock, the kind with a long, weighted arm that swung side to side and emitted a loud talk every second. By his estimate, he had heard that talk more than twenty-five thousand times already, and each one seemed louder than the last. One more talk and I'm going to smash that thing, Han growled. I don't think the Queen Mother would take that very well, Captain Solo, C-3PO said. Not for the first time, Han wondered why they hadn't left him behind on the Falcon with Cockmame and Miwal. It's pre Lorelian, probably looted from a Balmoran colony ship by the very pirates who abducted Tenel Ka's ancestor. So it's about time Tenel Ka got another. Han eyed the salon's rare burlwood paneling and gilded OG molding, searching for the spy cam that just had to be there. By the looks of this place, she ought to be able to afford something a little quieter. Han. Leia, who had been sitting on the floor meditating, opened her eyes. That clock is worth more than the Falcon. A lot more. Yeah, and it's noisier, too. Han stood, then grabbed a priceless larmel-topped end table and started across the room. Leia jumped up to block his way. Han, what are you doing? I can't take it any more. He gave Leia a quick half-wink, then started around her. That talking is driving me nuts. So I see. Leia caught him by the arm. But the crazy act won't get us an audience any sooner. We're not under surveillance. Of course we are. This is Hapes, remember? It's Tenel Ka's Hapes. Leia turned him around to face her. And she respects us too much to spy on us. Han rolled his eyes. Yeah, right. She knows we'd notice the surveillance. So why risk insulting us when she won't learn anything? This way... She can let us know that no matter what our differences, she still considers us friends. Let me see if I've got this straight. Han continued to hold the table up by his shoulder. She keeps us cooling our heels seven hours to make sure we know we're still friends? Exactly, Leia said. It's the same reason flight control had us land the Falcon in the Royal Hangar. She's trying to let us know politely that she won't be able to see us. Han's stomach sank. Tell me this isn't one of those diplomatic code things. Leia gave him an apologetic smile. Afraid so. You know how Coruscant would react if she gave us an audience. Omis and Neothel would think she was considering the possibility of recalling her fleets, possibly even helping Corellia. Then how come she told Gedjin to send us? To placate her nobles, I'm sure, Leia said. She needed to buy some time to maneuver. And now we've served our purpose. So she used us, Han said. I hate that. It wasn't personal, Han. Leia took the end table from his hands and used the force to float it back to its place. We'll just have to wait. Eventually, she'll find a way to see us without the spies knowing. Eventually? Han went to the intercom panel next to the door. She can do better than that. Han, you can't keep... Sure I can. Han pressed the call button, and a moment later, the peevish face of one of Tenel Ka's male social secretaries appeared on the vid screen. Captain Solo, he said, obviously exasperated. Is there something I can do for you? Yeah, Han said. You can tell Tenel Ka I'm tired of waiting. The man's expression grew weary. As I've already explained, the Queen Mother is unavailable. She asked me to assure you that as soon as she can break free... Break free? Han cried. We were supposed to have half a day with her. We've already been here twice that... Excuse me, Captain... 
the secretary said. Were you under the impression that the Queen Mother was expecting you? Of course I'm under that impression. We had an appointment. Han was ready to crawl through the intercom and choke the man. If you think we came all the way from Corellia just to drop in— Are you saying we're not expected? Leia interrupted, coming to stand next to Han. Indeed I am, the secretary replied. The Queen Mother cancelled the conference when Prime Minister Gedjin insisted it had to be held on the same day as the Queen's pageant. Han scowled. The Queen's pageant? To pick the most handsome man in the consortium, C-3PO explained. After the Queen Mother's birthday and the Marauder's Masquerade, it's the largest ball of the year. Precisely, the secretary nodded. Of course the Queen Mother is unavailable today. You don't say. Han was starting to have a bad feeling about their assignment. And it's always on the 20th? On the last day of the third week, C-3PO corrected. The tradition is more than 4,000 years old. It seems that the first Queen Mother threw the original pageant as a parody on the slave auctions once held— Enough, Threepio, Han said. We don't need the history of the whole cluster. Your droid is correct about the ancient history of the tradition, the secretary said from the intercom. I explained all this to Prime Minister Gedjin myself. To Gedjin personally? Leia asked. Not to his assistants? There's no use acting surprised, the secretary sniffed. He understood me very well. A cloud came over Leia's face. I'm sure he did. Please accept our apologies. The mistake is clearly ours. Obviously, the secretary replied. Please be patient. The Queen Mother will see you at her convenience. The vid display went blank. How rude, C-3PO said. He didn't even wish us a good evening. He wouldn't have meant it. Han deactivated their end of the intercom and turned to Leia. Do you get the feeling this is a setup? Absolutely, Leia said. But I don't understand what Gedjin expects to gain by embarrassing us. There's no logic to it that I can see, C-3PO said. Captain Solo can be quite embarrassing enough on his own. Han was too busy trying to figure Gedjin's angle to retort. Gedjin had to know that sending them to negotiate on a celebration day would only irritate Tenelka and make her even more unlikely to cooperate with Corellia. And that could only mean that Gedjin did not care whether he irritated Tenelka. Han began to feel worried. With the Bothans and Huts both refusing open alliance, Corellia was growing more desperate by the day, and desperate governments took dangerous gambles. Maybe Gedjin did not care about irritating Tenelka because he expected to be dealing with someone else in the near future. In the very near future. Han turned to Leia. What if it's not us Gedjin is setting up? Leia's eyes grew narrow. You think he's using us to draw Tenelka out? Or positioning us to take the blame, Han said. If Tenelka gets killed, whoever's getting ready to take her place will want to point the finger at someone pretty criffing quick. Otherwise, an investigation might uncover them. Leia thought for a moment, then shook her head. Possible, but Tenelka is bound to have a first-class security team— and, as a former Jedi Knight, she's formidable in her own right. Whoever's behind this, they're smart enough to realize they'll need a professional. And a good one. Sure, but I don't see where we fit in, Han said. I don't either. Yet. Leia thought for a moment, then asked, Why was it important for us to arrive on the day of the Queen's pageant? Oh! C-3PO raised his hand. I think I know. Han turned to the droid. So spit it out. C-3PO's photoreceptors flickered. Droids are unable to salivate, Captain Solo. But the palace will be filled with handsome young men today, most of them unknown to the staff. 
it would be the ideal time to slip an assassin onto the premises. Which means security will be even tighter than normal, Han pointed out. Which is why we're important, Leia said. Gedjin knows Tenelka will find time to see us, and that will interrupt the security routine. So we're bait, Han grumbled. That really burns my jets. Han turned to the intercom and started to reach for the call button, but Leia caught his arm with the force. Han, we can't, she said. Han frowned in confusion. Sure we can, he said. I love Corellia, but Tenel Ka is practically a daughter. If you think I'm going to let Gedjin assassinate... Han, that's not what I think, Leia said. But if their plan depends on a change in routine, they must have someone close to Tenelka to alert them to that change. Right. Han dropped his hand and tried to hide how foolish he felt for not realizing the same thing. I knew that. Of course you did. Leia smiled and gave his arm a reassuring pat. And you also know that their informant would just intercept your warning and let the assassins know that we're on to them. Oh, yeah, Han said. I knew that, too. Leia nodded. I thought so. She took a deep breath and closed her eyes, obviously preparing to reach out to Tenelka in the force. It was Han's turn to grab Leia's arm. Can't do that either, sweetheart. Leia opened her eyes again. We can't? What about their backup plan? Han said. You know they have one. And the minute their informant sees Tenelka acting weird, they'll activate it. Leia sighed. And we'd blow any chance Tenelka has of trapping them. Right, Han said. So what are we going to do? Han stepped closer and opened Leia's robe. Leia raised her brow. Han, I don't think we have time right now. Han gave her a roguish grin. Don't worry. This won't take long. He opened one of the pouches on her utility belt and removed an automated lock slicer. And then we can go find Tenel Ka. That should throw a Hydra spanner into their plans. Han went to the hand-carved double doors through which the social secretary had disappeared after dumping them in the salon, then knelt on the floor and slipped the unit's input-output card into the crack between the doors. C-3PO clunked over to stand behind him. Captain Solo, may I ask what you're doing? No. The lock slicer emitted a short beep, announcing that it had made contact with the security system. Before Han could activate it, Leia reached over his shoulder and covered the instrument panel. Han, we need to be— We can't afford to wait around, Han said. Tenelka's a good kid. She isn't going to keep us sitting— I was going to say quiet, Leia interrupted. There are two sentries on the other side of these doors. Oh, dear, C-3PO said. It looks as though Captain Solo is going to embarrass us again. It's okay, 3PO. Leia pulled Han away from the door and took the lock slicer from his hands. In fact, we need you to return to the Falcon. C-3PO cocked his head. Return to the Falcon? Whatever for? Just do it, Chiphead, Han said. An indignant harumph sounded from the droid's vocabulator, but he turned and left through the other door which opened into the royal hangar. Leia returned the slicer to her utility belt and began knocking loudly. It took several moments before an electronic buzz sounded and one of the doors opened part way. I'm sorry, Princess Leia, a heapen voice said, but the royal guard isn't allowed to converse with guests. If you require assistance... Actually, I don't. Leia used the force to jerk the sentry through the door at the same time sticking a leg out to catch him across the ankles. He landed at Han's feet in a huge purple-cloaked heap, reeking of musky hapen cologne. Han leapt onto the sentry's back and smashed the man's helmet into the stone floor to disorient him. 
The hapen was extremely large for a human, nearly the size of a barabel, and just about as tough. Despite repeated hammering, the fellow managed to rise to his hands and knees. Realizing he was in trouble, Han hooked his legs around the sentry's waist and planted his feet on the man's knees, then pushed. The fellow dropped to his belly again. Han got in a quick face slam that actually stunned the hapen long enough to pull off his helmet. The sentry started to rise again, one hand reaching back to grab Han's leg. Han delivered a powerful hammer fist to the base of the jaw. The big hapen went limp for a second. Then his fingers dug into Han's thigh so hard that Han had to cry out. He struck with the hammer fist again, and the sentry finally dropped to the floor in an unmoving heap. By this time, Leia was hauling the other guard, also unconscious, into the room. Though the fellow was just as large as the one Han had handled, his hands and feet were already bound, and Leia was using only one hand to drag him. Han would have liked to believe she was using the Force, but he knew better. After four years of Saba-style Jedi training, she was just that strong. Everything okay? Leia asked. Do you need help? I'm fine, Han panted. How about a little warning next time? Why? Leia pursed her lips in mock disapproval. You getting old or something? No. Han tore a strip off the sentry's cloak and began to tie the man's wrists. Just not used to following your lead, that's all. Leia smiled. How can you say that, dear? She dumped her sentry on the floor next to his, then bent down, took the man's security card, and kissed Han's cheek. Breaking into Tenel Ka's palace was your idea. Chapter 6 Located in the heart of the Senate District, between the Jedi Temple and the Galactic Justice Center, Fellowship Plaza was usually abandoned after dark. But tonight, Alima was hardly alone. Jason and Ben stood just a few meters away, talking in the shadows beside a neatly trimmed row of blur trees. And she was not the only one eavesdropping on them. First, she had spotted Lumia, standing in a tall privacy hedge on the opposite side of the walkway. So quiet and motionless, it was impossible to be certain she was still there. Then there was the dark blur that had come creeping through the fog after Ben arrived. It was about twenty meters away, crouching behind the hedge on Alima's side of the walkway, pointing what appeared to be a small parabolic dish through the blur trees toward where Ben and Jason stood talking. Whoever it was, the shadow had to be a Jedi, and a fairly adept one at that. Like Lumia and Alima herself, he, or she, had drawn in on himself until he no longer seemed to have a force presence at all. Have the sparring sessions been going? Jason asked. Is he still trying to make you lose your temper? Alima thought she saw Ben shaking his head. The two cousins were taking care to stand out of the light, and in such foggy conditions, even dark-sensitive Twi'lek eyes could see little more than silhouettes. No, Ben said. I think he's really trying to teach me something. You couldn't ask for a better instructor. Jason said, but be careful. Your father is just looking for an excuse to send you back to the academy. Ben remained silent for a moment, then asked, Is he going to find one? That's up to you, Jason replied evenly. Do you think the techniques I've been teaching you are dark? It depends on how I use them, Ben replied. Exactly. Jason's voice grew warm, and he clasped Ben's shoulder. But the older your father grows, the more conservative he becomes. He's afraid he hasn't done a good job preparing the modern generation of Jedi, that they aren't strong enough to employ all aspects of the Force. What do you think? Ben asked. I think he's done a better job than he realizes. Many Jedi Knights aren't strong enough to use the whole Force, but some are. Jason laid both hands on Ben's shoulders. 
You are. Ben poured pride into the force. You're sure? What do you think? Jason demanded. You're just asking because you want me to say it again. I guess so. Ben's tone was chagrined. You wouldn't be teaching me to use my emotions if you didn't think I was strong enough. Alima's heart swelled with an awe that was almost religious. Unless she misunderstood what she was hearing, and that did not seem possible, Luke Skywalker was losing his only son to the thing he feared most, the dark side, and his own nephew was going to be the instrument of that loss. That's right, Jason said to Ben. I'd never teach you something you're not ready to use. Now I need you to tell Captain Shevu that I won't be able to join him on tonight's raids. You'll have to handle the Jedi duties alone. Can do, Ben said. But Captain Gearden is starting to worry about not having enough Jedi to run two teams. Maybe you should consider asking the Council for some help. Jason tipped his head at a cynical angle. And how do you think that request would be received? Yeah, I know. Dad runs the council. Ben's tone was more conspiratorial than apologetic. But Captain Gearden wanted me to suggest it. I see. Jason considered this for a moment, then said, You'd better tell Gearden that I'm considering the idea. We don't want our subordinates worrying about our relationship with the Jedi Council, do we? Probably not, Ben agreed. Should we hold the interrogations for you? Jason shook his head. Gearden may have to start without me, he said. I'm meeting someone else. Then I have some business with Admiral Neothel. The G.A.G. Star Destroyer? Maybe. Jason pointed up the walkway toward the Galactic Justice Center. Go on to headquarters. I'll tell you about it at home. You better. Ben turned and started up the walkway, passing first Lumia's hiding place, then Alima's. Once he was passed, Alima turned her attention to the backside of the hedge and found the eavesdropper creeping toward her, still holding the parabolic antenna in one hand. As the shadow drew nearer, its silhouette sharpened into that of a Jedi in a standard hooded robe, then into the form of a tall woman with the pale face and heavy brow of a chief. A couple of steps more, and Alima realized that this was not just any Jedi following Ben. It was Tracina Lobi, one of the masters who had served on Cal Omis's special council during the war with the Yuzhan Vong. Alima dropped her hand to her lightsaber, at the same time willing Lobi not to make the mistake of letting that parabolic antenna swing past her hiding place. At this range, the antenna was sensitive enough to pick up sounds as faint as heartbeats, and the last thing Alima wanted was to have her presence detected. She needn't have worried. Lobi was still two meters away when Lumia's sharp voice sounded from the other side of the hedge. Jason, I'm impressed. Alima risked looking away from Lobi and saw Lumia stepping onto the foggy walkway, her long robes seeming to flow out of the hedge as though they were nothing but shadow. You have him very well under control. It's not a matter of control. There was just a hint of hostility in Jason's voice. Ben is my cousin. I care about him very much. Lumia studied Jason from behind her veil, then said, Caring is fine, as long as you don't let it stand in your way. There's a difference between letting something stand in your way and destroying it needlessly, Jason countered. I'm beginning to think maybe I should send him back to his father. Lumia's voice grew as alarmed as it did disapproving. Why would you do a foolish thing like that? To complete his training, Jason said. I'm having trouble finding the time to do it myself, and that leaves him vulnerable. You saw how he tried to manipulate me into feeding his ego. 
I did. And that kind of weakness will make him a servant to his emotions, Lumia said. It will also make him your servant, if you use it wisely. That's not what I want for my cousin, Jason said, sounding slightly disgusted. What you want doesn't matter, Lumia retorted. What you need does. And you need an apprentice. I need an assistant, Jason countered. And there are several Jedi Knights who would serve me better and require less time from me. Tahiri Vela, for example. Tahiri is not a descendant of Anakin Skywalker, Lumia replied. She does not have Ben's potential, and she will not serve you as well in the long run. Jason remained silent for a long time, then finally asked, Don't you mean serve you? It's the same thing, Lumia replied quickly. We serve one cause, though I am having doubts about you, Jason. You seem more committed to your friends and family than you do to our mission. If that means protecting them from needless harm, then yes, I am, Jason said. We're supposed to be doing this for the good of the galaxy, and the galaxy includes my friends and family. Of course it does, Jason. I don't mean to imply that it doesn't. Though Lumia's words were conciliatory, her voice remained stern and demanding. But the galaxy is bigger than your family. You must be willing to sacrifice what you care about to a greater purpose. I've already proved that I'm willing to do that, Jason said coldly. I'm proving it every day. Indeed you are. Lumia's voice softened, and she took Jason's elbow in her hand. All I'm saying is that we need to keep Ben near. I don't know how yet, but I have a sense that he will prove the key to our success. Jason considered this for a moment, then let out his breath and nodded. Okay, for now. But the minute I begin to suspect that you're only using him to get even with Uncle Luke— You won't, because I'm not, Lumia said. Everything I do, I do to bring peace and justice to the galaxy. Alima's admiration for the woman was growing by the moment. Jason Solo wasn't easy to deceive, and she was using Jason's own idealism— to destroy him and his family. Delightful. Lumia glanced up and down the walkway, no doubt reaching out in the force to make certain no one had wandered into the area while they were talking, then asked, Why did you want to see me here? Because I didn't have time to go to your apartment, Jason said. Alima glanced back to the other side of the hedge. Loby had dropped into a crouch, and was running a feed line from the antenna to a recording rod on her belt. Now Alima began to feel less awestruck by the balance than betrayed by it. Since her failed attack on Jason, she had spent her time spying on him and Lumia, and it had slowly dawned on her that just as Luke was losing Ben to what he feared most, Jason was becoming what Leia hated most, a Sith Lord. But if Lobi revealed that to Luke now, Jason's training would never be completed. Luke would hunt Lumia down and kill her. Leia would redeem her son through her love, and the Solos would live happily ever after. And where was the balance in that? Jason recaptured Alima's attention with an angry rebuttal to something she had missed. I don't have time to be that careful tonight. Neothel is about to give me my own Star Destroyer. His voice grew calmer, yet also more cold and demanding. I was supposed to meet her five minutes ago, but I need you to take care of something for me. Now. What is it? Lumia asked. Her tone made clear that she wasn't agreeing to anything. And you might try asking in a civil manner. 
Alima kept her gaze fixed on Lobi, who was continuing to record every word. After a moment, Jason spoke in a calmer tone. Sorry. I lost a friend today. I see. Lumia's voice held just a hint of disapproval at Jason's sadness. That must be why the ferals are rioting. Yes. The world brain died this afternoon. Jason's voice actually cracked. But the ferals aren't exactly rioting. They just don't have any impulse control without the world brain to guide them. And you want me to provide some? No. Coruscant Security can handle that, he said. I need you to finish that list I gave you. The Bothans? Lumia asked. Jason, you can't let your personal feelings— I'm not, Jason interrupted. The Corellians finally figured out how G.A.G. has been tracking them. They're planning to send their whole network after the world brain. But not if they realize it's dead already, Lumia surmised. Right, Jason said, and I need them to attack. It will bring the terrorists out in the open. And G.A.G. will be waiting, Lumia asked. G.A.G. will be watching, Jason corrected. Coruscant Security will handle the actual ambush. Our agents will concentrate on the terrorists who escape. Some are bound to panic, and with any luck we'll be able to follow them back to their ringleaders. So, many Bothans must die to bait your trap, Lumia said. No one would understand the necessity better than Bothans, Jason said. As Jason said this, Lobi was pulling her comlink from her utility belt. Alima watched with increasing despair as the chief carefully set the parabolic antenna on the ground and donned her headset and throat mic. This could not be in the interests of the balance, not when Alima still owed Leia so much. After a moment's pause, Lumia said, You know that finishing this list will force Bathawi to declare war. Their ambassador is on it. Do him first. Jason said. But Thawi is going to declare war anyway. Neothel says they're already outfitting three cruiser fleets for Corellian crews. Fine, Lumia said. The ambassador first, if you're sure. Don't I sound sure? Jason snapped. A pair of military boots began to clack down the walkway as he departed. Just do it. I can't keep the Admiral waiting any longer. Trisina Lobi reached for her throat mic and started to depress the send key in rhythmic sequence, using a click code to begin a silent broadcast to whoever was on the other end. Alima could see her finger movements just well enough to make out some of the message. Skywalker, he was... Lumia is following Ben. That was as far as Lobi made it, before Alima understood the reason the Force had brought the Chief so close to her hiding place. Is more... Alima jerked her lightsaber off her belt. She was a Jedi, and Jedi served the balance. Lumia is... Alima sprang from her hiding place, activating her blade as she flew through the air. Lobi was already rolling, her hand flying from her throat as she reached for her own weapon. Alima stretched her jump into a force leap and brought her mangled half-foot down between Lobi's shoulder blades, then felt a crushing pain as the chief continued to roll, smashing the back of an elbow into Alima's knee and knocking her legs out from beneath her. Alima landed flat atop a chrysanthus shrub, surprised and hurting. Lobi had never been a flashy fighter, but she was powerful and effective, and clearly deserving of her rank. Alima whipped her lightsaber around to protect herself, half expecting to feel the death slash before it reached middle guard. But the chief had been disoriented by the unexpected assault, and decided to buy some reaction time by leaping into a high force flip. 
Alima arched her back and sprang to her feet, then nearly fell when her aching knee buckled. Instead of leaping into another attack, she extended her hand and used the force to pluck the headset off Lobi's head. The chief landed an instant later, her eyes wide with rage and disbelief, but she wasted no time acknowledging Alima's identity. She merely ignited her own lightsaber and raced forward to attack. Alima barely had time to slash the headset apart before the chief was on her, driving her back toward the hedge with a combination of high slashes and powerful front thrust kicks. The first kick that landed drove the air from Alima's lungs. The second doubled her over, making her an easy target. Until she used the force to accelerate herself off Lobi's foot and deep into the hedge, where she had been hiding a moment earlier. As Alima crashed into the blart trees, she heard Lumia on the other side calling down the walkway to Jason. Go on, I'll handle this. No, Alima wanted to yell. Lobi is too dangerous. We need all the help we can get. But of course she did not dare. During the early stages of the Killix conflict with the Galactic Alliance, her nest, the Dark Nest, had attempted to assassinate Jason's daughter and she was quite sure that he'd be happy to let Lobi kill her. So she pushed out onto the walkway just far enough to reveal herself to Lumia. The Sith scowled and ignited her own weapon, an exotic one that seemed equal parts whip and lightsaber, with long, flexible strands of metal and bright, hissing energy. "'Who are you?' Lumia demanded. "'Why are you—' "'No time!' Alima launched herself back through the blur trees. If Lobi had not yet followed, that could only mean she was fleeing. Come, before the Jedi spy escapes. Alima emerged from the hedge to find Lobi twenty paces away and already fading into the night. Alima dropped her lightsaber and pointed in the chief's direction, opening herself completely to the Force, using her anger and fear to draw it deep down inside. A moment later, its power began to burn, and she released it in a long, crackling bolt that caught her target square between the shoulder blades and drove her to the ground. Lumia emerged from the hedge, her light whip burning a bright-colored hole in the fog. She glanced at the blue bolts coming from Alima's fingertips, then asked again, Who are you? We're a friend. Continuing to pour force lightning into Lobi's prostrate form, Alima limped forward on her throbbing knee. One who doesn't wish Master Skywalker to learn what you are doing with his nephew. Lumia followed. We? I don't see later, Alima snapped. They had closed to within five meters of Lobi. Right now, we are in too much trouble to— Lobi suddenly stopped writhing and extended a hand toward a nearby patio. A decorative urn came flying out of the fog. Alima let the force lightning sizzle out and tried to redirect the urn, but Lobi's force grasp was too secure. The urn caught her full in her crippled shoulder and sent her flying. She landed in the chrysanthus shrub several meters away, her body throbbing with pain and her mind numb with shock. The hum and sizzle of clashing weapons slowly brought her back to her senses and she sat up to find Tracina Lobi spinning and parrying, slowly forcing Lumia back, probing and fainting, trying to work her way past the crackling strands of Lumia's exotic light whip, and into the striking range of a lightsaber. Alima summoned her own weapon back into her grasp, then stood and limped forward to help. Lobi sprang into a backflip and sailed over a crackling whip strike. Then, as she was still descending— she extended a hand in Alima's direction and used the force to pull her into the path of the flashing strands. Lumia barely managed to shut down the weapon before it struck, and even then the hot filaments cut through Alima's robe, burning a rainbow of hot welts into her thigh and ribs. Alima was still screaming when Lobi landed at Lumia's side. The chief brought her lightsaber down, and Lumia's weapon arm, one of her many cybernetic parts, fell to the ground trailing sparks and hydraulic fluid. Lobi reversed her blade instantly, angling for Lumia's torso, 
but Alima was already leaping forward to catch the chief's attack on her own lightsaber. Lobi whipped her lightsaber around low, aiming at Alima's knees and forcing her to leap back. Alima pointed at Lumia's severed arm, then used the force to send it spinning toward Lobi's head. The chief woman ducked easily, but that gave Lumia time to call her light whip into her remaining hand and strike again. Lobi pivoted away from the attack. Alima sprang at her from behind, striking for the chief's thick neck, then cried out in surprise as a huge foot glanced off her ribs, and still sent her staggering back. Lumia seized the opportunity to launch a flurry of attacks, fanning the strands of her whip to make it more difficult to block, striking right and left to prevent the chief from pivoting away again, slowly driving Lobi back toward Alima's droning lightsaber. Then, finally, Lobi faltered, gathering herself for a force leap, but hesitating and retreating another step toward Alima instead. It was the moment Alima had been waiting for. You are good, Master Lobi, but not that good. Alima spoke in a force whisper so soft that it was little more than a thought. Even you cannot defeat two of us. Lobi's head snapped around, her eyes filled with confusion and doubt, and she spun into a whirling charge of crescent kicks and horizontal lightsaber strikes. Alima held her ground, ducking a lightsaber strike and letting a kick slip off her shoulder, then force slammed the hilt of her lightsaber into the pit of the chief's stomach and spoke again in her force whisper. No good. Amazingly, Lobi stumbled only one step back, but that step was one too far. Lumia's light whip caught her across the back of the legs and severed them both at the knees. The chief roared first in anger, then, as she dropped onto the stumps and pitched forward onto her hands, in agony. It was a terrible sound to hear. Alima stepped forward and spoke once more in her force whisper. There is no need to suffer. She swept her blade across the back of the chief's neck, and the head tumbled away. Your fight is done. Lumia stepped into view at the other end of the body, but her gaze remained on Alima, and she did not deactivate her light whip. Do I know you? she asked. Not yet. Alima knelt beside Lobi's headless body and rolled it over, then removed the recording rod from the chief's belt and tossed it to Lumia. But we hope you will let us serve you. What you are doing with Jason is so delicious, and so right for the balance. Chapter 7 the Hall of Masters was as long and fancy as all the others down which the Solos had sneaked, with red Kashmel carpeting and some of the finest artwork in the galaxy hanging on the walls. Between each masterpiece, an ornate trefoil arch led into another equally opulent corridor, while a white alabaster staircase at either end of the hallway ascended a vaulted turret into the higher reaches of Tenelka's immense palace. Oh, boy, Han said. Which way now? Good question. Han frowned. Can't you just follow the force or something? I could if I wanted Tenelka to feel me searching for her. Leia glanced at the security card she had stolen from the guard she had left lying in the Queen Mother's special salon, then started down the hall. But I have a better idea. Han followed her to the end of the hall where they found a small data terminal tucked away beneath one of the staircases. Leia inserted the security card and selected Queen's Pageant, Her Majesty's Public Schedule, from the menu that popped up. Tenel Ka had finished the preliminary judging of muscles half an hour earlier and was due to host a banquet in two hours, but there was nothing scheduled for the moment. Look for a private schedule, Han suggested. This doesn't tell us anything. Sure it does, Leia said. She called up a map of the palace, then pointed to a blacked-out area marked simply Royal Residence. That's where we'll find her. 
I don't mean to sound skeptical, but it'll take her an hour to dress for the banquet, Leia said, and she's been judging the pageant all day. Where do you think she'll spend her one unscheduled hour? With her kid, Han agreed. He should have known better than to doubt Leia. Having grown up in a palace herself, she would have an instinctive understanding of Tenelka's life. So where's the playroom? Good question. Leia plucked the data card from the terminal, then turned her face upward and closed her eyes for a moment. Stairway's clear. Han and Leia ascended side by side, passing portrait after portrait of Tenelka's royal ancestors. The staircase was wide enough to accommodate a landspeeder, with room left for pedestrians, and it seemed to go up forever. After a good minute of climbing, a muffled murmur began to spill out of an unseen doorway onto a landing above. Thinking they would need to find another way, Han took Leia's arm and started to pull her back down the stairs. No time, she whispered. If Tenelka's going to see us, it will be after she's visited Alana and before she starts dressing for the banquet. Leia pulled Han close to the wall and continued to ascend, slowly and silently. When they had drawn to within a few meters of the landing, she stopped and pointed out into the emptiness on the other side of the banister. An instant later, a loud clunk echoed up the turret, as though something had fallen onto the floor of the lowest level. A pair of royal guards rushed out onto the landing to investigate. As they peered over the balustrade, Han and Leia pressed their backs to the wall and crept up the last few steps in silence then slipped into an extravagant waiting room filled with cologne-heavy hapen males. They were attired in elegant shimmer-silk tunics and fine Tavella doublets. All were holding plastic-clear cases containing orchids from across the galaxy, sometimes more exotic than beautiful. Leia slipped her hand through Han's arm. They're probably suitors hoping to escort the Queen Mother to tonight's banquet, she whispered, leading him into the room. Tenel Ka certainly likes to play games with her nobles. As long as they don't play games with us, Han answered. I really wish you hadn't made me leave my blaster aboard the Falcon. This is supposed to be a friendly call. Then how come you're wearing your lightsaber? That's different, Leia replied. This is Hapes, and I'm female. As they moved deeper into the room, the young nobles turned to study them, sneering at Han's travel-worn flight jacket or frowning at Leia's Jedi robes. The Solos paid little attention, holding the gazes of the courtiers just long enough to suggest they belonged here as much as anyone, and for Leia to reinforce the idea with a force prod. The trick must have worked, because by the time the Solos reached the perimeter of the seating area, the courtiers were turning back to their sabbat games and private conversations. Han and Leia weaved through the crowd to a large, spitting rancor fountain that dominated the center of the room. Opposite them, a dozen royal guards blocked the mouth of a large ceremonial arch, beyond which lay a long white corridor. The hall was lined with displays of antiquated weapons and ancient blast armor, but its most spectacular feature was a glistening wind-crystal chandelier the size of an A-wing fighter. "'Guess we know where the royal residence is,' Han muttered, looking away from the guards. "'But to get past that bunch, it's going to take a pretty big—' Leia's fingers bit into Han's arm. "'Han, she's here.' "'Here?' Han glanced casually around the room and saw nothing out of the ordinary. Just a couple of young nobles arguing over the stakes of a degeric game and a middle-aged bachelor lecturing a pasty-skinned youth about the propriety of wearing a hat indoors. Who's here? The assassin. Leah's gaze went to the pasty-skinned youth and stayed there. With a slim, beardless face and a bald head crowned by a fashionable, if ridiculously tall, top hat, he had a dangerous yet feminine appearance. His eyes were dark and sunken, his nose as straight as a knife, his mouth a small ruby-lipped gash. 
He was wearing a ruffled dress jacket that had to be six sizes too large for him, and he was careful to keep his hands balled inside the outer pockets, as though afraid of what they might do on their own. You mean him? Han whispered in disbelief. He's just a kid. The kid's eyes slowly slid away from his lecturer and found Leia. When she did not look away, he gave her a short, almost imperceptible nod, then turned back to his conversation. Leia grabbed Han's arm. That's no kid. She pulled him toward the guards waiting beneath the ceremonial arch. In fact, she's older than you are. She? It's not important right now, Leia said. She's not working alone. We need to warn Tenel Ka. As they neared the arch, a rough-featured guard wearing the golden cuff hashes of a sergeant of the Royal Guard stepped out to meet them, blocking their way with a bulky Hapen power blaster. The Hall of the Wind Crystals is closed to visitors. Of course it is. Leia lifted her hand in one of those little waves that Jedi used when they were making a Force suggestion, then spoke so softly the sergeant had to lean down to hear her. But the Queen Mother is in danger. You need to seal the chamber. The sergeant's eyes widened, and he repeated, The Queen Mother is in danger. He was too well trained to react hastily, however, even under the influence of a Force suggestion. What's the nature of this danger? From people in this chamber. Leia's voice was impatient. She made another little wave. The Queen Mother is in danger. You need to seal the chamber and sound the alarm now. The sergeant nodded. The Queen Mother is in danger. His eyes flicked past Leia's shoulder, and then he turned to face his subordinates. Seal the chair! The command ended in a strangled gasp when something long and white hissed past Leia's head and planted itself in the side of the sergeant's neck. Han cried out and instinctively shielded Leia, throwing himself onto her, and nearly losing an arm as her lightsaber blade snapped to life. They had barely hit the floor when more of the strange projectiles hissed past overhead coming from all corners of the chamber and filling the air with a sound like ripping cloth. An instant later, the rest of the guards dropped to the floor, amid a cacophony of strangled outcries and clattering armor. Leia pressed her hand to Han's chest. Han, you've got to stop doing that. She rolled him off with surprising ease and came up kneeling, then plucked at her robe. Jedi, remember? Sorry, old habits. Han rose to his knees. Half the suitors in the room, a couple of dozen, were charging across the chamber, leaping and dodging furniture, either holding a white throwing knife or drawing another from their sleeves. He spun around, reaching for the fallen sergeant's weapon, and found the entire complement of guards lying in the archway, most dead already, but a few writhing in pain with a plastoid hilt protruding from their throats or faces. A cold knot formed in the pit of Han's stomach. The assassins were good, organized and well-trained. He crawled forward and grabbed the sergeant's bulky power blaster, then began to fumble with the unfamiliar hapen safety. Blast! I don't care what you say next time, I'm bringing— Leia's lightsaber droned behind him. Then the smell of burned flesh filled the air, and a body thudded to the floor. The rest of the attackers were already racing into the archway to either side of the Solos. Most paid no attention at all to Han, simply grabbing weapons from the fallen guards and continuing up the corridor at a sprint. But one, a heavy-jawed man with blonde hair, looked over and caught Han's eye. "'You okay?' he asked. "'Uh, yeah,' Han answered. He finally found the power blaster's safety catch, a small nub inside the trigger guard— and depressed it. Thanks for asking. He pulled the trigger, blasting a fist-sized hole into the center of the man's chest. The hapen tumbled over backward, his brow still rising in surprise. Han turned to find Leia behind him, standing over a dead hapen 
and frowning in the direction of the man he had just killed. You ever get the feeling we don't have the vaguest idea what's going on here? Han asked. We're not the only ones. Leia pulled Han to his feet, in the process turning him back toward the waiting chamber. A dozen young noblemen were standing over the middle-aged bachelor who had been lecturing the pale-skinned kid about the hat. Another fifteen suitors were watching in slack-jawed astonishment as the kid dived and rolled toward the same door through which the solos had entered, dodging a constant stream of blaster fire from the guards posted there. Now that the assassin had discarded her oversized coat, revealing a skin-tight bodysuit and a utility belt lined with throwing knives, it was very clear Leia had been right about her being female. And she did have hair, at least a little of it. The top hat was also gone, revealing a bushy topknot that made her look wild, unpredictable, and very dangerous. Han started to shoulder the power blaster. But Leia put a hand on the barrel. Not yet, she said. She's Force-sensitive. Force-sensitive? Han understood what Leia was saying. The woman would not be a quick kill, and they could not afford to get tied up here. Will someone please tell me what the blazes is going on? Maybe later. Leia turned up the corridor after the assassins. After I have time to figure it out myself— Han grabbed a couple of spare power packs off the dead sergeant and raced after Leia. By the time he caught up to her, they were two dozen meters down the white stone corridor and not gaining on their targets. Han stopped and knelt at the side of the corridor, taking cover behind the pedestal supporting a blue sheen suit of early Durasteel blast armor. We need to slow them down, he said. Good idea. Leia continued running. Try not to hit me. Hey, Han called, not what I meant. But Leia was well down the corridor, already passing beneath the great chandelier and picking up speed. Han cursed her foolhardiness, then took three deep breaths and shouldered the power blaster. Before he could open fire, the assassins suddenly stopped running and glanced uncertainly back toward Leia. Even without the force, Han could sense their confusion. Either they had come to an unexpected dead end, or they had not seen her attack their fellows and could not understand why she was charging them. Maybe both. What the blazes is going on? Han asked again. He set his sights on the hapen in front and blasted him between the shoulder blades, then swung the muzzle to the next man and fired again. That one bounced off a display pedestal, then staggered into the middle of the corridor and collapsed. The surviving assassins dived for cover, finally starting to return fire. Leia caught up to the rear of the group and launched herself into a whirling lightsaber attack, cloaking herself behind a basket of sapphire light and batting blaster bolts back toward their source. Han dropped another assassin, and she killed three. Han blasted a man's leg and sent him somersaulting across the corridor, Leia used the force to crush two more beneath a flying suit of heavy plexoid armor. Then the deafening bang of a concussion grenade echoed down the corridor. Han was momentarily blinded by a brilliant flash of yellow. Leia cried out in surprise, and the air resonated with the piercing shriek of blaster fire. Heapen voices began to scream and abruptly fall silent and blaster bolts flew down the corridor so furiously it took a moment for Han to realize his vision had cleared. Leia was forced tumbling back toward him, somersaulting and twisting through the air, arcing from one side of the corridor to the other, batting blaster bolts aside and taking momentary shelter behind the display pedestals. Behind her, the surviving assassins, if there were any, were nowhere to be seen and a wall of royal guards was charging into the far end of the corridor, power blasters blazing. Han rose just high enough to show his shoulders and head above the pedestal he was using for cover. Knock it off, you rotters! he yelled. We're on! A volley of blaster bolts brought his protest to an end, blowing the armor display off its stand and sending him to the floor beneath a crashing avalanche of durasteel. Han! Leia's voice was barely audible over the screech of blaster fire, 
and the burned meat stink of blaster combat had grown so thick in the hall that Han felt like retching. Keep down! Like I have a choice, Han grumbled, or would have grumbled had there been enough air in his chest to do so. He pushed a twenty-kilo breastplate off his shoulders and head, then rolled to his knees. His breath still would not come, but the ache in his chest was dull and general, suggesting he'd simply had the air knocked out of him. Leia was on the opposite side of the corridor, and a little ahead of him, trapped behind a display pedestal by a torrent of blaster fire so bright and constant it resembled an ion drive's efflux. Han looked back to the royal guards, who had already advanced halfway down the corridor. Okay, he growled. I've had it with you guys shooting at my wife. He dropped back behind the display pedestal, pointed his blaster at the ceiling, and fired into the heart of the great chandelier. It took only a handful of shots to bring the huge fixture down in a chiming crash of wind crystals and metal, and the torrent of blaster fire coming down the corridor immediately faded to a fraction of what it had been. He raised his head again and saw that the chandelier had landed squarely in the midst of the charging guards, leaving the largest part of the company sprawled on the floor, injured, trapped, or just too dazed to move. But nearly a dozen guards had been far enough down the corridor to escape the chandelier. They were concentrating their fire on Leia, driving her back behind the pedestal every time she tried to make a break for Han's side of the corridor. And Leia was not helping matters much, simply deflecting their bolts instead of batting them back into her attackers. Clearly she was trying to avoid hurting Hapens still loyal to Tenel Ka. Han cursed her scruples, then took aim at the guard's feet and began to bounce blaster bolts off the floor. More than half of them immediately turned their attention to Han, but one, an angry-browed man with the weathered face of a veteran, repaid the solo's courtesy by pulling a concussion grenade off his equipment belt. No! Han cried, more to himself than anyone else. Don't! The guard thumbed the activation switch, and Han had no choice but to take aim at the man's chest. Before he opened fire, a string of bolts flew up the corridor from behind him, catching the guard full on and knocking him off his feet. The grenade tumbled from the hapen's hand and rolled free. Han swung around in shock, or maybe it was fear, and had just enough time to glimpse the pale-skinned assassin standing in the archway, firing a cumbersome hapen power blaster with each hand. Then the concussion grenade detonated behind him, filling the corridor with light and thunder and fire. The assassin barely blinked. She simply continued firing with one of her weapons and used the other to wave the solos toward her. Come on! Too astonished to do anything else, Han looked across the corridor at Leia, who merely looked back and shrugged. A few of the guards trapped beneath the fallen chandelier began to recover and fired down the corridor again, at the assassin as well as the solos. She dropped into an evasive roll, then came up firing and suppressed their attacks to almost nothing. She gestured to the solos again, this time leaving the power blaster pointed in Han's direction when she finished. Come on, she repeated. Her voice was high but cold. If you want to live. Han glanced over at Leia. She nodded vigorously. Who doesn't? Leia rose and raced toward the archway, spinning and tumbling, batting the few blaster bolts that came her way back up the corridor. Han mirrored her progress, scrambling along sideways and laying suppression fire back toward the chandelier. He still had no idea what was happening here, but it was growing more and more apparent that nobody else did either. And when that happened, the only rule became survival by any means possible. As they passed through the archway, the pale woman pointed her chin toward the entrance by which they had arrived. Stairs! Fine by me, Leia said, leading the way. They met no resistance as they crossed the chamber, for the suitors who had not taken part in the attack were cowering behind furniture or cringing in corners, unwilling to risk their lives without weapons of their own. From what Han had seen of the assassin so far, it was probably a smart decision. On the landing outside the chamber, 
the two door guards lay sprawled and motionless, as did two more on another landing on the opposite side of the turret. So far there was no sign of any more guards, but Han knew that would be changing very shortly. He led the way down the stairs and into the corridor that led back toward the salon he and Leia had occupied earlier. The assassin called out behind him, Wait! Han stopped and glanced back to see her kneeling at the entrance to the turret. She was pointing both power blasters up the stairs, but looking toward Han and Leia. Where are you going? she demanded. Back to the hangar, Han answered. We've got to get out of here. No! The pale woman glanced back into the turret and began to fire up the stairs. We have a contract to finish. We? Leia asked. Maybe you're not getting paid, but you're part of this. The woman continued to fire with one weapon, but pointed the other at Han's chest. And don't look so surprised. This isn't exactly the way I expected it to happen either. The knuckles on Leia's weapon hand went white. But luckily Han was the only one who saw. The royal guards had reached the top of the stairs, and the assassin was busy exchanging fire with them. Look, Leia said, I don't know— You obviously know who we are, Han interrupted. He was beginning to see why the fight had seemed so crazy. The assassins had mistaken him and Leia— for people who were supposed to help them get to Tenelka. How about returning the favor? The assassin looked away from the stairs long enough to scowl at him. You don't know? We haven't exactly been in the loop, Leia pointed out, picking up on Han's strategy. We just got in from Corellia. A flurry of blaster bolts flashed into the corridor, nearly taking off the assassin's head. She merely rolled out of the doorway and pressed her back against the wall, then glanced over at Leia's lightsaber. Why don't you call me Nashta? She almost seemed to smile. I'd like that. For some reason Han did not understand, the name sent a chill down his back. Or maybe that was just the growing stream of blaster fire pouring through the doorway. All right, Nashta he said. In case you haven't noticed, someone set us up. Tenel Ka obviously knows about the assassination attempt, Leia added. And that means we have no chance of getting to her right now. All that can happen is we get trapped and killed. I don't think she knew we were involved until this started, Han said. But that's changed. We've only got about two minutes to get back to the Falcon, if we're lucky. After that, the hangar is going to be sealed up so tight even a lightsaber won't be able to cut our way back inside. Nashta's eyes seemed to grow darker and more sunken as she considered this possibility. Suddenly she dropped into a squat, then whirled back into the doorway and poured a volley of blaster fire up the stairs. There was a chorus of anguished screams. Lead! Nashta rose and waved them down the corridor then tapped Leia's arm with a blaster barrel so hot that it singed the fabric of her robe. And this had better not be a double-cross. There is nothing I love more than killing Jedi. Chapter 8 The consort's sitting room stank of smoke, scorched fabric, and seared flesh, and the floor was strewn with charred furniture and blaster-burned bodies. Emergency crews were evacuating the injured, while palace security agents holler recorded the dead. On the far side of the chamber, a group of dazed-looking nobles was being sequestered by a detail of the Hapen Royal Guard. Jaina began to have a bad feeling about the CEC light transport that had jumped to hyperspace just as she and Zack entered the system. It had been accelerating away from Hapes at a rate few freighters could achieve and the fact that there had been two squadrons of Hapen starfighters on the vessel's tail only tended to confirm that it had been the Millennium Falcon. Zek leaned close. Han and Leia Solo did not do this, he whispered. He was still in the same flight suit he had been wearing for more than a week, 
but the smell was nothing to the acrid stench that already filled the room. It's not their style. I don't need you to tell me that. Gina realized that Zek was only trying to comfort her. But comfort was not what she needed right now. What she needed were facts. Don't you think I know my own parents? Zek ran a hand through his sweat-matted hair then shook his head and let out a disgusted snort. He started across the room without another word, leaving Jaina to stand there wondering what was wrong. It was not like Zek to be short with her, and she did not understand why he should be upset. After all, it wasn't his parents they had seen fleeing the scene of an assassination attempt. When Jaina did not immediately start after Zek, the sergeant in charge of their escort nudged her in the back. Stay together. He motioned Jaina toward the vestibule. We've had enough Jedi tricks for one day. Jaina turned to face the Haven. He was tall and typically handsome, with chiseled features and dark blue eyes. My mother didn't have anything— Tell it to Prince Isolder. He rested a hand on the butt of his holstered blaster, then used the other hand to point after Zek. Go. Tempted as Jaina was to force-slam the sergeant into the nearest wall, she recognized that now would be a less-than-ideal time to adjust his attitude. She settled for a smirk of disdain, then followed Zek toward the corner, where Princess Holder was watching a female security officer interview a shaken-looking noble. As Jaina and Zek approached, two bodyguards stepped out to block their way. Isolder touched the arm of one. No, Brack. Though it had a few new and well-placed lines, Isolder's strong-featured hapen face was as handsome as it had ever been. They're fine. Brack did not retreat. They're Jedi, my lord. After what just happened, Isolder clamped down on Brack's arm and physically pulled him back. They're probably the reason my daughter survived what just happened. He turned his attention to Jaina. Unless I miss my guess, you were the source of the Queen Mother's recent uneasiness. I did reach out to her. Yes, Jaina said. I thought as much. Isolder opened his arms, inviting an embrace. It's good to see you again, Jaina. And you as well, Princess Holder. Jaina hugged him, then stood aside as he clasped arms with Zek. I'm only sorry we couldn't arrive earlier. Nonsense. We're thankful for your, uh, warning. It prompted the Queen Mother to increase her guard. And to seal the residence's inner blast doors, Tenelka said, arriving behind Jaina and Zek. You have nothing to be sorry for. Jaina turned and saw Tenel Ka standing two meters away, surrounded by a small company of attendants and royal guards. Her rust-colored hair hung loose down her back, and she was dressed in a frock of green shimmer silk that managed to appear as practical as it did elegant. The effect was so striking and regal that Jaina had to consciously remind herself she was looking at an old Jedi Academy classmate and comrade in arms. Your Majesty, Jaina bowed, and Zek along with her. Tenel Ka's eyes flashed with embarrassment at being exalted by her friends, but she was careful to hold herself tall and still to hide her discomfort from her subjects. Jaina, Zek, what an unexpected pleasure. She motioned them upright then glanced over her shoulder, toward the great hall where most of the devastation had taken place. I assume your visit has something to do with that? Right. We came to warn you. Jaina did not mention the Corellian assault fleet that Boatu suspected would soon be on its way to help with the coup. She would share that intelligence later, once they were alone. We didn't think it would happen so soon. I know you did everything in your power. Tenel Ka's face grew troubled. 
she continued, "'What I don't understand is why your parents were involved.' Gina felt like she had been kicked in the stomach. Involved? She glanced around at the devastation, unable to believe her parents would participate in an attack against Tenelka. You're sure? More than we'd like to be, the soldier said. He sounded more disappointed than angry. Your mother and Captain Solo arrived unannounced and asked for an audience with the Queen Mother. Before she could find time for them, they slipped out of the guest salon and disabled the entire palace security system. We're still trying to learn how, Tenelka said. As close as we can estimate, they did it in less than two minutes, and they had to travel nearly half a kilometer through unfamiliar corridors. Maybe you're having trouble because they didn't do it, Zek suggested. Of course they did it. The woman who said this was a stately-looking aide of perhaps forty or fifty. It was hard to tell, given how hard Hapens worked to stay young and attractive. Such a feat is nothing for a— Thank you, Lady Golney. Tenelka silenced the woman with a polite flip of two fingers, then turned to Zek. Do you have another theory? Zek furrowed his brow, then said— Maybe they were here for the same reason we are. To warn you. The suggestion was greeted only by doubtful, in many cases scornful, hapen expressions. And even Jaina had trouble seeing the basis for Zek's assertion. Finally, Tenelka asked, Then why were they seen leaving with the leader of the assassination squad? They were? Jaina gasped. I'm afraid so. Tenelka said, A pale woman with a shaved head and a topknot. When my guard managed to pin your parents down, she even risked her own life to rescue them. Jaina's heart sank. It certainly sounded like her parents were working with the assassins. There must be an explanation. Zek gave her arm a reassuring squeeze. Jaina, you need to trust your feelings. Jaina pulled away, irritated and confused and shaken. She found it hard to believe that her parents would participate in any kind of assassination attempt. But she just didn't know. There were all kinds of rumors suggesting her father had helped Boba Fett assassinate Thraken Sal Solo, and her mother had experienced firsthand the evil wrought by Darth Vader. Was it too much to think Leia might kill a friend— to keep Jason from following the same path? I don't know what my feelings are, Jaina said. She turned to Tenel Ka. Tenel, er, Queen Mother, I don't know what to say. I'm having a hard time believing it myself, Tenel Ka replied. First appearances are against them, but the investigation is far from complete— and there is some conflicting evidence. Such as? Zek demanded. Some eyewitness accounts suggest the Solos may have attacked a few assassins when the fighting began. Tenelka turned and extended her arm toward the great hall where most of the fighting had taken place. We can go have a look, if you'd like. I'd like. Zek's voice was hardly hostile, but it did not take a Jedi to sense that he was angry. Why are you ignoring these accounts? We are not ignoring them, Isolder said. He stepped to Zek's side, and they all started toward the ruined hall. But eyewitness accounts are notoriously unreliable, as I'm sure you were taught in your investigation courses at the Jedi Academy. And some eyewitnesses claim that the men the Solos attacked were actually trying to defend the Queen Mother, Lady Golney said. Some very credible witnesses. I'll judge that for myself, Zek said. He turned to Isolder. When can I speak to these witnesses? Isolder stopped and turned to Zek. You want to interrogate Hapen nobles? That's right, Zek said. There's something wrong here. 
and I— That's enough. Jaina grabbed the back of Zek's arm and squeezed. His tone was bordering on the rude, especially to the sensitive Hapen ego, and harsh accusations would only make the official investigators more likely to overlook evidence that might exonerate her parents. I'm sure the Queen Mother and her staff will discover the truth. Fact, Tenelka said. The investigation will give the Solos every benefit of the doubt, and I do intend to interview every eyewitness personally. That was enough to quiet Zek's protests, and to assure Jaina that her parents would not become convenient scapegoats. Though family duties on Hapes had forced Tenelka to leave the Jedi Order, she retained all the talents and force skills she had learned as a Jedi Knight. If anyone tried to lie about the Solo's involvement, the Queen Mother would know. Thanks, Your Majesty, Jaina said. I appreciate it. If there's anything we can do to help, there is, Isolder said instantly. We know the Falcon often travels under false transponder codes. A list would prove very helpful. Jaina's mouth grew dry. She was being asked to choose between her loyalty to her family and her duty to the Jedi Order, and she was well enough trained to realize that her decision really did not hinge on whether her parents were guilty of anything. A member state of the Galactic Alliance was asking for information regarding an attack on its government, and as a Jedi Knight she was obliged to provide it. When Jaina was slow to answer, Lady Golney reminded her, The Hapes Consortium is an important part of the Galactic Alliance, a very important part, and your parents are terrorists. Alleged terrorists, Tenelka corrected. She fixed her gray eyes on Jaina, then said, It would be better for everybody. My commanders will be more careful if they know when they're actually dealing with the Falcon. And the information will be useful only as long as they remain inside the consortium, Isolder pointed out. If they aren't a danger to the Queen Mother, I'm sure they'll be departing Hapen space as soon as possible. In which case we won't pursue them beyond our boundaries, Tenelka added. We'll leave them to the Alliance authorities, whom I'm sure already have the false codes. I'm not sure I know all the false codes, Jaina said, forcing herself to answer. Tenelka's deal was more than fair. The Hapen Royal Navy was going to be boarding, or destroying, every YT-1300 it found. This way, at least Tenelka could issue orders instructing her commanders to capture the Falcon and her crew in one piece— but I'll give you the ones I do. Thank you, Tenelka said. I know how hard that must be for you. Just tell your commanders to be patient, Jaina said. She glanced in Golni's direction and was a little sickened by the smug satisfaction she sensed in the woman. But that changed none of the basic facts of the situation. Mom and Dad won't give up easily. But they're not going to kill anyone they don't have to, either. I've already instructed my commanders that we need your parents alive, Tenelka said. Good, Jaina said. We should go someplace and finish our briefing. On our approach, Zek and I saw the Falcon jumping into hyperspace. If we hurry, we may be able to spare your commanders the trouble of capturing them. By going after them yourselves? Isolder asked. In Hapen space? Jaina frowned. Assuming they're still in Hapen space, yes. Oh, that won't do. Galni stepped in front of Jaina, then turned her back as she addressed Tenelka. We can't have the Jedi Solo pursuing her own parents. It will look as though you staged the attack— as a pretext for property seizures, you'll end up driving more nobles into the enemy camp. Tenelka sighed, then looked over Galni's shoulder at Jaina. 
Lady Golney is right, my friend. It would look very strange to Hapen eyes. No one has to know, Zek said. We're Jedi. Everyone would know, Isolde said. He waved a hand around the chamber, allowing it to linger a bit on Tenel Ka's retinue. Look about. A sheepish look came to Zek's face, and Jaina realized she had to yield to Tenel Ka's wishes. The Heaps Consortium was indeed a fluger bed of conspiracy and intrigue, and sending a daughter to bring her own parents to justice would have raised eyes even on Coruscant. Right. But this is a matter of alliance security, too, Jaina said. We could help by identifying that assassin and trying to trace her travels. That shouldn't offend— Actually, Tenelka interrupted, I've already asked your brother to help us with that investigation. Jaina's jaw dropped. Jason? I know you've had your differences of late— but this is what Jason does now. Tenel Ka's voice was apologetic but firm. Can you honestly say you would do better? That depends on what you mean by better, Jaina retorted. She could not believe Tenel Ka intended to turn her brother loose inside the consortium. Do you have any idea what he's been doing on Coruscant? protecting the populace from Corellian terrorists, by all accounts I have seen. Tenel Ka's tone was defensive and stubborn. I'm sorry to distract him, but there may be a connection between the terrorists and this assassination attempt, and Jason is the only one with the knowledge to investigate it. Jaina exhaled in frustration. Okay. I can tell when we're not wanted. What about Alana? Zek addressed himself to Tenel Ka. Anyone trying to remove you will also want her eliminated. Until things settle down, maybe she should have a couple of Jedi babysitters. That won't be necessary. Tenel Ka's expression remained calm, but her alarm poured into the Force. She had been keeping her daughter out of sight since the day of Alana's birth— to the point that rumors of a birth defect had begun to circulate through the Jedi Temple. Perhaps there was something to those rumors after all. Her security is better than my own. Like I said, I can tell when we're not wanted. Jaina could not help feeling a little angry and hurt. She had just agreed to provide one of her parents' most closely guarded secrets— and still Tenelka refused to trust Jaina with the nature of Alana's vulnerability. Maybe we should just finish the briefing and be on our way. But we really need to do this in private. She cast a pointed glance at Tenelka's retinue. Of course, Tenelka said. Come with me. The Queen Mother motioned the two Jedi to her side. When they had obeyed, she drew gasps from Galni and several other noble ladies by slipping her arm through Jaina's, then leaning close. And you are wanted, my friend. Tenelka's whisper was so soft that Jaina heard it inside her head more than in her ears. There is something else I must ask you to do for me, something I can trust only to my oldest friends. Of course, Jaina replied. Her heart had sunk clear to her knees. Whether or not her parents had been a part of the attempt on Tenelka's life, the fact remained that Jaina had to consider the possibility. And that struck her as a sadness nearly as great as her brother Anakin's death. The Jedi are always at your disposal. Chapter 9 Though dawn had come bright and golden several minutes earlier, a sense of darkness and danger still hung over Fellowship Plaza, and the closer Luke and Mara drew to the crime scene, the heavier and more sinister that sense became. A squad of dark-visored police spots blocked access to the walkway at both ends, 
while a team of spider-like forensics droids swarmed over the tall privacy hedges to either side. Two detectives, the first a huge-headed Biff in a rumpled tabard, the other a green-scaled Rodian in a sharply creased zing suit, stood inside the security cordon comparing notes. This doesn't look good, Mara said. I'm afraid we're about to find out why we can't find Prasina in the force. Me too, Luke answered. I didn't like the way that security dispatcher sounded this morning. Mara glanced over and scowled. How did she sound? Surprised, Luke said. Maybe even disbelieving. The security force dispatcher's first words when Luke answered the comm half an hour before had been to assure him that his son was not involved in the incident. Refusing to answer any questions herself, the dispatcher had asked whether Luke knew where Master Lobi was, then instructed him to meet a pair of detectives in Fellowship Plaza. Of course, Mara had immediately calmed Ben. To their relief, he was quite safe and on his way to an important rendezvous with Jason. They reached the security cordon and were stopped by a police bot who did a quick retinal scan on Luke and stepped aside. Detectives Ratu and Tozer are expecting you. The police spot pointed first at the Rodian, then the Bith. Please remember that the law requires you to answer all questions truthfully or not at all. Refusal to answer may be considered grounds for an interrogation warrant. Since when? Mara demanded. A scanning beam shot from the police spot's visor into Mara's eye, then it asked, Mara Jade Skywalker? Just answer the question, Chiphead, she said. Take that as an affirmative, Luke said quickly. When did silence become a suspicious act? The police bot kept its visor trained on Mara. The suspicious silence provision was added to the Galactic Loyalty Act at 0320 this morning. In the middle of the night? Mara asked. How'd they ever get a quorum? Under the Law Enforcement Tools provision of the Galactic Loyalty Act, quorums are no longer required to approve anti-terrorism legislation. And when did that pass? Mara asked sarcastically. Yesterday at 1827, the police bot answered, by five votes, under reduced quorum requirements due to the boycott of the Bothan delegation. Thanks for the information, Luke said. He took Mara's arm and started toward the detectives. It's always good to know the law, especially when they keep changing it, Mara added under her breath. The latest legal updates are available from any law enforcement droid, the police spot said behind them. All inquiries will be noted in your file. Wonderful, Mara grumbled. Luke found her attitude a little surprising. Mara usually supported a stern response to terrorism, but as a former emperor's hand, she also knew how easy it was to abuse the kind of information the government was now gathering under provisions of the Galactic Loyalty Act. Every year, she gave a special seminar at the Academy, teaching young Jedi how to use the galaxy's vast databanks to track their quarry. As the Skywalkers drew near, the two detectives stopped talking. The Bith extended a delicate-fingered hand in greeting to Luke, then to Mara. Master Skywalker and Master Skywalker, thanks for coming. I'm Chal Tozer. He waved at his green-scaled companion. This is my partner, Gwad Ratu. Instead of offering a hand, Ratu twitched his scaly snout in suspicion. Do you know a Tracina Lobi? Of course they know her, Tozer said. She's a Jedi Master. That's correct, Luke said. He could sense Ratu's excitement through the Force. The Rodian's hunting instinct had been triggered, and he was eager to find his prey. She sits on the Jedi Council, as a matter of fact. Not anymore. Continuing to study their faces rather obviously, Ratu waved a hand toward the hedge on the near side of the walkway. A gardener droid found her. Quad, show some respect. The edges of Tozer's cheek folds turned blue with embarrassment. 
Sorry about that. My partner thinks everyone is a suspect. Everyone is a suspect. Ratu's dark eyes remained fixed on Luke and Mara. Where were you early last night? Tozer let out his breath in whistled exasperation. Quad! He turned his huge head toward the Skywalkers. You don't have to answer. No, it's fine. A knot of anger was forming in Luke's stomach. But it was not Ratu he was upset with. The Jedi Com Center's night tech had left a message detailing Master Lobi's interrupted transmission, so he knew what had happened to Lobi, and who was responsible. I had an important meeting with Chief Omis that lasted until after midnight. Mara was with me. If you'd like to confirm that, you can calm his office. Mara's voice was particularly sharp and sarcastic a sign of the sorrow and anger that Luke could feel in her through the Force. Ask for the Chief of State. Ratu rotated his dish-shaped sensory antennae toward her. Would I be able to speak with Chief Omas personally? No, Tozer said. He turned to Luke. Look, someone assassinated the Boffin Ambassador last night, and the Chief of Detectives wants as many of us on it as he can get. So if you want to handle this matter yourself, just say— We're the law on Coruscant, Ratu objected. Not the Jedi. The Bith whirled on his partner. Someone killed a Jedi master, you laser brain! He was so irritated that his voice warbled. Even if we solve the case, are we going to make the arrest? Ratu's snout widened in excitement. You're afraid of a challenge? Maybe we should all work together for now, Luke suggested. He waved at the forensics droids swarming over the near hedge. You've already started collecting evidence, and the Jedi can bring some unique resources to bear. Ratu cast a resentful glance in Tozer's direction, then let out a disgusted snort. We call the shots, he said. Technically, you're just observers. I guess that's better than suspects, Mara retorted. She turned to Tozer. Why don't you show us the scene? You're standing on it. Tozer nodded at the walkway, then waved at the blartree hedges lining either side. It looks like they were waiting in ambush. They? Luke asked. You think that's wrong, Skywalker? Ratu kept his bulging eyes fixed on Luke. Something maybe you need to share? No. Go on, Luke said. The interruption had been a mistake, and not only because it had aroused Ratu's suspicions. He could feel Mara studying him, too, wondering what he knew that she didn't. I was leaping to conclusions. No one has anything to gain by that. Right, Tozer said. He pointed down the walkway to a blartree on the far side, where a forensics droid appeared to be making resin casts of a set of footprints. One ambusher was waiting there, and another over here. He pointed to a bush on their side of the walkway, a little closer, where another droid was casting footprints. What species? Mara asked. Human, or near human, Ratu answered. The shoes made it hard to tell but both ambushers were probably female and fairly light. The prints were small and shallow. And one had a deformed foot. She didn't put any weight on the front part of her shoe, Tozer added. Motioning the Skywalkers to follow, he stepped through the hedge. We think your Jedi realized something was wrong and tried to come up on them from behind. Too bad they saw her coming, Ratu said from the back of the group but it doesn't look like she suffered long. They emerged from the hedge into a bed of knee-high chrysanthus shrubs. A pair of medical droids were waiting on the far side with a stretcher and a hover sled, while yet more forensic droids were swarming over the area, making casts of footprints and holler recording every detail of the crime scene. In the center of the bed, still dressed in Jedi robes, lay the torso of a large chief woman. 
both lower legs and her head, lay a couple of meters away. The lifeless eyes in the head were still open wide in surprise. There was no sign of her lightsaber or other equipment. Luke's stomach grew hollow. This is a message. He started to move closer to the body, but a forensics droid quickly cut him off. She's toying with me. Toying with you? Ratu repeated. Who would that be? In a minute. Mara touched Luke through the Force, making sure that he felt her suspicion and growing irritation. How is this a message, Luke? From Lumia? I'm afraid so, Luke said. I think she's telling us she can take Ben any time she wants. What does this have to do with Ben? Mara demanded. You'd better not be telling me you were using our son as bait. Not bait, exactly, Luke said. He had not told Mara about asking Trusina Lobi to follow Ben, in large part because of their disagreement over whether Jason was good for him. But I did ask Trusina to keep an eye on him, because I thought Lumia might try to use him against me. It looks like I was right. And that's why you told me to bring my Shoto? Mara asked, referring to the half-length lightsaber she had built as a defense against Lumia's light whip. Because you knew Lumia had something to do with Trisina's death? Luke shrugged. It looks like I was right. Being right is no excuse, Mara said. You should have told me. Luke sighed. I said it would be a good idea to keep an eye on him. You accused me of looking for an excuse to spy on Jason. He paused to collect himself and sensed the keenness of Ratu's interest in their conversation. He gave Mara a force nudge, reminding her of their audience, then said, Besides, that's not what you're really angry about. Mara flashed him a look that said this conversation wasn't over, but took the hint. No, I suppose it's not. I take it this Lumia is our prime suspect? Tozer asked. Who is she? One of Luke's old girlfriends, Mara said sharply. Ratu's antennae snapped upright. Ah, that explains it. He lifted his hand and dictated a note into the data mic clipped to his cuff, then gestured at Lobi's body. And Master Lobi is the new girlfriend? Instead of answering, Mara merely lifted her brow and looked to Luke. Not at all, Luke answered. Mara is. Er, Mara is my wife. I don't have a girlfriend. Ratu shrugged. What do I know about you Jedi? he asked. With most humans, it's usually sex or love. Tozer nodded sagely. Eighty-seven percent of the time, he said. Spice is a distant second. Not this time, Luke insisted. This time, it's revenge. Revenge for what? Tozer asked. And how is your son involved? Lumia was a Sith apprentice, Luke explained. She wants revenge because I shot her down and helped overthrow the Emperor. Ben is just a means to an end. Sure, Master Skywalker, Ratu said. Whatever you say. But for now, we'll keep all motives on the table. Any idea who the accomplice might be? Tozer asked. Mara's voice suddenly rose behind Luke, sharp and angry. He turned to see that she had stepped away from the group and was not quite shouting into her comlink. I'm a lot more than Ben's mother, Corporal Lecauf, she was saying. I'm Master Mara Jade Skywalker of the Jedi Order. The Corporal's reply was not quite audible to Luke. If you know who I am, then you also know that you'd better tell me why my son's comlink is being jammed, or spend the next six weeks in a Bacta tank trying to regrow all the parts I'm going to cut off. Mara looked across the plaza toward the giant silver cylinder of the Galactic Justice Center. 
I can be there in three minutes. There was a short pause. Of course this comlink is scrambled, Mara said. The corporal spoke again. He's what? The corporal repeated whatever he had told her. Then Mara's anger began to fade from the force. I see. Well, have him get in touch with me the moment he returns. Mara paused, then added, The moment, Corporal Lecauf. Do I make myself clear? Mara closed her comlink, then seemed surprised to find Luke and the others watching her. She frowned. I just want to be sure that Lumia isn't delivering the rest of her message. And you're sure she isn't? Luke asked. Corporal Lecauf was very convincing, she said. Apparently Jason took Ben up to Crickspace. Crickspace? Ratu echoed. What for? Mara shot the Rodian a don't-be-stupid look. He wouldn't say. More properly known as the General Crixmadeen Military Reserve, Crixbase had been constructed during the first wave of fleet reorganizations undertaken in the wave of the war with the Yuzhan Vong. It was a huge complex of orbital hangars currently serving as home port to the 3rd, 8th, and the mysterious 9th fleets. It also housed the headquarters of two elite fighting units, the Space Rangers and Gamma Corps, and, as Chief Omas had revealed during their meeting last night, a brand new Imperial class Star Destroyer secretly assigned to GAG, the Anakin Solo. Maybe that's a good thing, Luke said, guessing that Jason had taken Ben to the base to go on the Anakin's shakedown cruise. At least we know Lumia won't get him there. Do we? Mara asked. Base security wouldn't stop me. No, but it would take time for you to defeat it, Luke pointed out. He didn't mention the possibility of a shakedown cruise, because Ratu and Tozer lacked the necessary security clearance to even hear of a vessel named the Anakin Solo. And it would entail risks you wouldn't need to run elsewhere. Mara thought about this a moment, then nodded. Okay. Your point? That now is our chance. Luke said. Until Ben gets back, it's just her and us. And us, Ratu reminded Luke. This Lumia woman is our suspect. Do you think you can identify your old girlfriend? Tozer produced a large data pad from a pocket of his wrinkled tabard and began to enter codes. There was a lot of fog last night, but the security cams have pretty good imaging filters— we're in a blind spot here, but we might be able to catch her on the way in. I'd recognize her if I saw her. Luke went to the Bith's side and saw that he was calling up last night's video feed from the anti-terrorist cams that had been installed to protect Fellowship Plaza. But she won't be visible. She won't? No, she's too skilled for that. Mara joined them and held her hand out for the data pad. May I? Tozer ruffled his cheek flaps, then reluctantly passed over the data pad. Mara began to punch keys, bringing up the feed from the entrance closest to the Jedi Temple. It didn't take long to spot Ben entering the park and Master Lobi trailing him, following a discreet distance behind and taking care to remain in the shadows. But they spotted no hint of Lumia, or of the second killer even when Mara brought up the feeds from the next two cams. Luke checked the timestamp at the bottom of the screen, then said, It's too early. Tresina's message didn't come in until 1922. What message? Ratu asked. She clicked in with a partial message, saying she had spotted Lumia. Luke replied. What else? Ratu demanded. That's it, Luke said. Just that I was right. Lumia was watching Ben. Then she cut it short. But it doesn't look like this Lumia was following your son when he left the temple, Tozer said. He reached over to tap the screen of the data pad. So she was waiting for him inside the plaza. It would seem so. 
The edge in Mara's voice was as cold as the knot in Luke's stomach. I don't like it. She knew where he was going to be. We said this was an ambush, Ratu reminded them. Both killers were waiting for Master Lobi in the hedges. That's the way it looks, all right, Luke said. He turned back to Mara. Lumia had to enter the plaza somewhere. Mara began to bring up feeds from the other entrances and run through them at high speed. Finally, a line of static flashed across the screen, and she froze the picture and checked the time code. 1914, she reported. Eight minutes before Trasina's message, Luke said. That fits. But that's just a power glitch, Tozer said, still looking at the data pad. It's a force flash, Luke corrected, and it can be used to prevent a security cam from recording your image as you pass through its field of view. Mara checked the cam code at the bottom of the screen, then asked Tozer, Is that the Galactic City entrance? Tozer nodded. That's right. Then we're in luck, Ratu said. Without asking, the Rodian took the data pad from Mara and called up a schematic of the cam net. Galactic City is Dignitary Central. There are security cams all over. He scrolled through the feeds from each of the adjacent cams until he came to a line of static similar to the last one. 1906. Ratu led the way back through the hedge, then started up the walkway toward the Galactic City entrance. Looks like we're on the scent. Chapter 10 Within a few hours of discovering Lumia's trail in Fellowship Plaza, Luke, Mara, and their two detective companions were following an Amoidian building manager down a Larmel Stone Hall on the 300th floor of the opulent Zorp House apartment tower. Luke had talked Ratu out of calling an entering capture team, but just barely, by pointing out that SWAT droids were hardly inconspicuous. Lumia would have sensed the agitation of any bystanders who happened to see them moving into position and fled before they could capture her. But Saba Sebatine and two other Jedi were stationed outside as backup, posing as maintenance workers on a hover sled just around the corner. The building manager stopped next to an expensive homogeny side table, then pointed down the hall to a double sliding door of polished brass. That's three hundred seven twelve, he whispered. You're sure it's theirs? Tozer asked. Like Ratu, the Bith was convinced that Lumia had an accomplice. Luke and Mara were not arguing the point, especially since there had been two sets of footprints in the hedges. The Nemoidian spread his leathery hands. There are twenty-five thousand apartments in Zorp House, he said. I can't know who lives in them all. But this is where the security cam keeps malfunctioning? Luke asked. The Nemoidian nodded his flat-faced head. And that is the only apartment whose door never opens when the cam is working. Mara calmed Saba, telling her they were about to go in. Ratu drew his blaster and started down the hall, pulling the Nemoidian along beside him. Buzz them, Ratu ordered. Say you've been getting a smoke alert for their apartment, and you want to be sure they're okay. Me? The Nemoidian glanced warily at Ratu's blaster, then at Luke and Mara. Isn't the tenant dangerous? Are you refusing to cooperate with a criminal investigation? Ratu demanded. You won't have to go inside, Tozer said speaking to the manager over his partner's shoulder. We're just trying to find out if they're home. The Nemoidian's pace remained unenthusiastic, but he did go to the door and do as he was asked. As they waited for a response, Luke extended his force awareness into the apartment, searching for any glimmer of a presence that would suggest someone hiding inside. He felt nothing, but that meant little. Lumia would certainly be capable of hiding her force presence. When no answer came after the second buzz, the Nemoidian said, It seems they're not home. He turned to leave. 
If you need me, I'll be down in my... Not yet. Ratu caught his arm and pointed at the security panel. The Universal Code. The Nemoidian's relief flooded the Force. Of course. He extended a finger and reached for the keypad. If you'd be kind enough to avert your eyes. A prickle of danger sense raced down Luke's spine, and he and Mara cried out in unison, Don't! Luke used the force to pull the Nemoidian's hand away from the panel, then stepped forward. I think it's been altered. Altered? the Nemoidian asked. That's impossible. No one but our maintenance personnel can— He let his explanation trail off when Luke ignited his Shoto's short blade and carefully began to cut the security panel out of the wall. Have you gone space sick? the Nemoidian cried. Who's going to pay for that? I hope you're not trying to deny us access to the apartment, Ratu said. Harboring terrorists results in a total property forfeiture. Who's harboring terrorists? The Nemoidian threw up his hands. Fine. I'll write it off as tenant damages. Luke finished cutting, then deactivated his weapon and carefully pulled the unit out of the wall. Attached to one side was a small thermal detonator with a thin signaling wire running from the security pad to its trigger. Well, at least we know we're at the right apartment, Mara said. She reached over and depressed the detonator's safety, then broke the signaling wires, detached the casing from the security panel, and slipped it into her pocket for safekeeping. Luke held the security panel out toward the Nemoidian. Now you can enter the code. The Nemoidian stared at the keypad for a moment, then began to shake and look toward Luke. Red seven, blue twelve, green zero zero. Luke entered the code, and the doors slid open. Without waiting to be dismissed, the Nemoidian spun around and tried to leave again. Luke caught his arm. Wait here, he ordered. You'll be safe in the hall and I'll know if you try to leave. The Nemoidian's face paled to ivory. Of course. I'm happy to assist the Alliance any way I can. Ratu patted the fellow's cheek. That's a good citizen. Coruscant needs more like you. Luke led the way into the apartment. It was smaller than he had expected, and surprisingly cozy with a sunken seating area in front of the entertainment wall. The rest of the walls were decorated with reproductions of famous artwork from across the galaxy, including a holographic copy of Leia's own Killick Twilight. But the thing that most surprised Luke were the mirrors. There was at least one on every wall, all carefully arranged so that it was possible to see any corner of the room by looking into the appropriate combination of mirrors. Luke motioned to Ratu and Tozer to remain where they were. Then he and Mara went into the bedroom and checked the closet and refresher to make certain Lumia was not hiding anywhere. By the time they returned to the main room, the two detectives were already emerging from the kitchen area. Didn't I ask you to stay by the door? You asked, Ratu replied. She's not in the kitchen. Not in there either, Mara said hooking a thumb toward the bedroom. Looks like we missed her. She'll be back. Tozer pointed to a bouquet of blue, long-stalked puffballs sitting in the middle of the dining table, then smiled and stepped over to smell them. Nobody puts out fresh flowers unless they're coming— No! This time it was Mara who force-jerked a potential victim out of danger. She floated him to the opposite side of the room, then said— I wouldn't do that. Tozer flared his cheek folds in irritation. Why not? Sith specialize in tricks and traps. Luke took Ratu's datapad, then snapped an image of the flowers and requested an identification. That's why we wanted you to stay in the main room, Mara explained. Everything in this place is a potential trap. 
the data pad beeped, and Luke looked down to find a name and description of the flower. Nerf scourge, he reported. An overdose of pollen causes nerve damage in most species. Oh. Ratu glanced around the room a couple of times, then followed Tozer out into the hallway to wait with the building manager. You can just dictate a record of what you find into the data pad. Good idea. Mara pointed Luke toward the kitchen. You take the galley. The last thing I want is you rooting around in an old girlfriend's bedroom. No worries. Luke flashed a roguish grin. Nothing in there I haven't seen before. Mara shot him a look that could have melted a comet, then waved him into the kitchen. Get busy. This woman is after our son, remember? Luke went into the kitchen and began to look through processing units and storage containers. He quickly learned that Lumia lived almost entirely on juice and protein drinks. Not too surprising, given the challenges of maintaining a body that was as much cybernetic as flesh. But he found nothing to suggest how she had known Ben would be in Fellowship Plaza last night. No eavesdropping equipment tucked away in a cabinet, no electro-binoculars hanging from a drawer knob, no holocam recharger sitting on the counter. Nothing. Luke turned back toward the living room and saw Mara's reflection staring at him out of a mirror. She seemed more beautiful than ever, her hair a deeper red, her face a little fuller and less lined. Notice anything? She was speaking from the bedroom, but thanks to the reflection, Luke felt as though he were looking directly into her eyes. About the mirrors, I mean. Of course, Luke said. They're everywhere, and you can see the entire apartment from anywhere. Mara appeared disappointed. Not that, she said. They distort your image, make you appear more attractive from every angle. Okay. Now I see it, Luke said. Like you said, Sith are all about illusions and deception, Mara said, even when they're alone. Know what else I found? Her data pad? Luke asked hopefully. Sorry. Mara emerged from the bedroom empty-handed, and he turned to face her. The real her, which he thought was even more beautiful than the enhanced reflections. Nothing. No luggage, no power cells, no toolkits. Luke frowned. No replacement parts? Mara shook her head. Not a one. Replacement parts? Ratu asked from the door. Cybernetic replacement parts, Luke answered. Lumia is as much machine as human, and that means she needs to maintain herself. Exactly, Mara said. All Luke has is one mechanical hand, and he has to keep half a kilo of parts handy or risk not being able to cut his own nerf stake. Lumia must carry a small workshop around. Tozer raised his brow. So if her tools aren't here, then neither is Lumia. Ratu let out a vile Rodian curse. Someone warned her we were coming. No. Mara went into the bedroom, then returned with an elegant taffeta skirt and tunic set. She intends to come back sometime. No woman would take her luggage and leave this behind. At least not one who has so many of these mirrors. So she's just taking a trip somewhere, Ratu said. That means she had to arrange transport. He entered the room, took the data pad from Luke, and went over to the entertainment wall. He started to jack it into the central comport, then suddenly stopped and looked over his shoulder for reassurance. Luke did not sense any danger. It's safe, he said. But I don't see what the law enforcement tools provision, Ratu explained. I can recall all data accessed from this origination point any time in the last month. He jacked in, then began to punch the keypad furiously. A moment later, a section of the entertainment wall activated, displaying a record of data accesses from that location. He selected travel, 
and a map showing the location of the Bothan Embassy appeared. What the blazes? Tozer cried. That doesn't make any sense. It does if Lumia killed the ambassador, Mara said. See what other locations she's looked up. Ratu tapped a few more keys, and a long list of addresses in the Bothan quarter appeared. Before Luke could request it, Ratu had already asked for a list of corresponding names. As soon as names started appearing, Tozer gasped, It's her. She's the one who's been killing Bothans. Luke and Mara shared a glance, silently asking each other if they needed to share something that Omas had told them the night before about the Bothan murders. As Ratu continued to scroll through the long file, Tozer pulled out his comlink and started to open a channel. Mara reached over and stopped him. You might want to wait until you're back at headquarters. Ratu craned his green neck around. The lips of his green snout pulled back into a threatening snarl. This is a law enforcement matter. It's also a political minefield. Luke pointed at the names on the screen. Those dead Bothans were all members of the True Victory Party. Ratu's snarl vanished, and Tozer immediately snapped his comlink shut. We'll wait, the Biff said. Good idea, Mara said. What I want to know is how Lumia got their membership list. Let's see if I can sniff that out, Ratu said. He typed a few more commands. Then a message came up asking for a password. He tapped the keys some more, and another message appeared. GAG access only. Ratu disconnected his datapad so fast that its speaker popped, and Tozer let his chin fall to his chest. Cry me, the Biff said. Now we're just borked. A second message appeared on the wall screen. Your attempt to breach security has been noted. How did Lumia slice into GAG files? Mara asked. Luke didn't bother guessing. He was beginning to fear the answer was a lot less complicated than they realized, and the thought was causing an icy lump to gather in his belly. He stepped over to the apartment door and motioned the building manager over. What's the name on this lease? De Fula, the Nemoidian informed him. Bant de Fula. De Fula? Mara asked, coming up behind Luke. Who's his employer? The Nemoidian removed a small data pad from his robe pocket and tapped in a command. My records indicate that he's a senior executive with Astro Tours Limited. Never heard of them, Mara said. What's their com code? The Nemoidian turned his data pad so she could see. Mara frowned. That's the same suffix as GAG's code. Luke looked at the number and frowned himself. Maybe it's just a coincidence, he said. Just because two com codes have the same suffix doesn't always mean they're related. No, but it usually does, Mara said. She turned to Ratu. See what you can find out about Astro Tours. Ratu kept his hands away from the datapad. Does it have anything to do with GAG? That's what we're trying to find out, Luke said. Go ahead. You've already tripped their security gate. The Rodian let out a reluctant nose whistle, but quickly brought up a poorly done information page advertising Outer Rim adventure cruises with stops at rugged worlds such as Hoth, Geonosis, and Dagobah. Who'd want to go to Geonosis? Tozer asked scornfully. It's nothing but a bug nest. I think that's the point. Nobody would, Mara said. And Hoth and Dagobah aren't exactly vacation paradises either. I don't know, Luke said. Dagobah's all right. Only if you enjoy feeding leech wings, Mara retorted. She shook her head in disgust, then entered the com code the building manager had provided for the renter. A moment later she arched her brow, then turned to Luke with a worried expression, but spoke into the comlink. Corporal Lecauf, why am I not surprised? Luke suddenly found himself very angry. 
if Astro Tours Limited was a GAG front company, then Lumia had not sliced into the GAG files. She had been given access to them. He pulled his own comlink and tried to open a channel to Ben. But Ben's comlink was still being blocked, probably because he was still in the security zone around Crickspace, or already aboard the Anakin Solo. Don't bother denying it, Mara was saying to Lakauf. I recognize your voice. Luke took the comlink from Mara, then said, Corporal, this is Grandmaster Skywalker of the Jedi Order. Do you know whether Colonel Solo and my son have already boarded the Anakin Solo? The Anakin Solo, sir? Lakauf did his best to sound confused. Don't play stupid. Luke held the comlink between him and Mara so she could hear, too. This is my son we're talking about. Lakauf hesitated, then said, I believe they have, yes. G.A.G. was scheduled to take her out on a short shakedown. Then contact Crickspace and tell them to delay the Anakin's departure, Luke said. If Lumia was working with G.A.G., then she was working with Jason, too. My son is not going anywhere with Colonel Solo. Do you understand? Lakauf's only reply was a nervous silence. He asked if you understood, Mara snapped. I understand, ma'am, Lakauf said. But I'm afraid what Grandmaster Skywalker asks is impossible. The Anakin left for Hapes an hour ago. Hapes? Luke asked. He felt Mara take his comlink from his belt since he was still speaking to Lakauf on hers, then saw her slip away to start making arrangements to follow. Did I hear you correctly? You did, Lakauf confirmed. Apparently the terrorists have attempted to assassinate Queen Mother Tenelka. She's requested Colonel Solo's aid in rooting them out. Luke fell silent for a moment, trying to decide whether Lakauf was telling the truth or trying to throw him off the track of some other operation. Your son will be safe, sir, Lakauf said. He's very well trained. I've worked with him myself. Seeing that he had little choice at the moment but to accept what Lakauf was telling him, Luke said, This had better be the truth, Corporal. It is, sir. Lakauf paused, then added in a reassuring tone, Colonel Solo took a quarter of G.A.G. along. I'd be with him myself, except I'm on desk duty, because I twisted my knee a couple of days ago. Very well. Luke glanced back at Ratu and Tozer, who were still staring at the last message on the wall screen and having a hissed debate about what they should do. There was an accidental attempt to access GAG files from your safe house on the 300th floor of Zorp House, Luke said. I'd like you to ignore it. Consider it done, Lakauf said. And don't worry about your son. He'll be fine. I hope so, Corporal. Luke closed the channel and turned to find Mara already talking on the comlink she had taken from him. Hang her in twenty minutes, she was saying. I want the shadow prepped and ready to go. Chapter 11 Jason stood at the viewport of the Anakin Solo's command salon, staring out at the cloud-modeled face of the planet Hapes. It was a world of splendor and abundance, covered in sparkling oceans and verdant islands. But Jason was too troubled to enjoy looking at it. Someone had tried to kill Tenel Ka and his daughter Alana. His hands were shaking and his stomach was knotted, and as he awaited the arrival of their shuttle, his thoughts kept careening back and forth between fantasies of mass vengeance and eruptions of self-reproach. Jason knew he could not be Alana's first line of defense. So far, his relationship to her remained secret. If he spent too much time at the Fountain Palace, Tenel Ka's nobles would begin to suspect that the heir to the Hapen throne had been fathered by a Jedi foreigner, and that would only endanger Alana further. Besides... Tenel Ka was more than capable of protecting their four-year-old daughter, and he could not give up his anti-terrorism work back on Coruscant without letting the whole galaxy suffer. 
but Jason could not help feeling guilty and frightened. Every instinct in him wanted to send Alana away to be raised somewhere safe, perhaps among the Falanasi or Gensari. Only the experiences of his own childhood, which had proven again and again how fallible such strategies could be, prevented him from considering it. That, and the fact that no place was truly safe. Jason had spent most of his life trying to bring peace to a brutal and chaotic galaxy, and matters only seemed to be growing worse. There was always some unseen war about to spill over from the next system, some hate-filled demagogue ready to slay billions to assure the greater good. Sometimes Jason wondered if he was having any effect at all, if the galaxy would not have been just as well served had he never returned to the Jedi and remained among the Aang Tai meditating on the Force. As Jason contemplated this, the Hapen Oceans began to sparkle more brightly. Some of the sparkles steadied into lights and began to shine in a hundred lustrous colors. Others turned red or gold and began to blink at regular intervals. They flowed together into narrow bands and began to circle the planet, like the rivers of flowing traffic that had once girdled Coruscant. Jason took three deep breaths, exhaling slowly after each and consciously stilling his mind. While he could not yet summon Force Visions on command, he had learned to welcome them when they came. They were a manifestation of his unity with the Force, a sign of his growing power, and the increasing frequency with which they came reassured him that he would succeed, that he was strong enough to hold the galaxy together. On the planet below, the island rainforests darkened to a deep night-colored purple. Two white dots began to glow up from the heart of one of the shadowy islands, and Jason found himself staring into the spots. They were larger and brighter than any of the lights on the oceans, and the longer he looked, the more they resembled eyes, white, blazing eyes staring up at him from a well of darkness. A few wisps of cloud drifted across the face of the shadowy island, creating the impression of a lopsided mouth and a spectral face. The mouth rose at the corners. My! The words were breathy and cold and rife with dark side power. And the voice was familiar. It sounded like Jason's. He leaned closer to the viewport, studying the wispy features below, trying to decide whether he was seeing his own face. But the clouds were not cooperating. The wisps drifted into a new arrangement, and a lumpy brow appeared above the eyes. The cheeks grew sunken and smashed, while the mouth became gaping and twisted. Then the entire face began to expand, drawing a veil of shadow over the rest of the planet and dimming its sea of scintillating lights. The mouth rose at one corner, and the smile became a sneer. Mine! This time the voice was too low and harsh to be Jason's. He felt relieved since the mangled face could not be a vision of his future if the voice did not belong to him. The shadowy head continued to expand, swelling beyond the edges of the planet and engulfing the Hapen moons. The face became long and gaunt, its features now defined by patterns of the half-obscured light shining through from the surface of the planet. Mine! This time the word was crisp and commanding and the head continued to grow, becoming round and coarse. It swelled beyond what Jason could see through his viewport, dimming the stars to all sides of Hapes, and engulfing, as far as he could tell, the entire known galaxy. Most of the face vanished into unrecognizable patterns of light and shadow. But the eyes remained, expanding into a pair of blazing white suns. Mine! The white eyes flashed out of existence with all the brilliance of a pair of exploding novas, and Jason felt as if an incendiary grenade had detonated in his head. He let out an involuntary groan and whirled away, hands clamped to his face. 
but his head did not explode. The pain vanished as quickly as it had arrived, and when he pulled his hands away, it was to find himself staring down at the reassuring pearliness of the command salon's luxurious resecrete deck covering. There weren't even any spots swimming before his eyes. I hope that expression doesn't mean you left something back on Coruscant, Lumia said. She was sitting across the spacious cabin at Jason's equipment-packed intelligence station, poring over the latest data on Tenelka's unpredictable nobles. We have an opportunity to position you as the savior of the Galactic Alliance, but only if we move fast. Positioning me isn't what matters here. Jason did not want Lumia to see how shaken he was, at least not until he understood what the Force was trying to tell him. Catching the terrorists who attacked the Queen Mother. That's important. Making certain it doesn't happen again. That matters. Lumia frowned. What do you see down there? She rose and started across the cabin, wearing a black flight suit that matched exactly the color of the scarf that covered the lower half of her face. The pilot disguise was appropriate to the berthing she had demanded down near the hangar decks, and when she was in public areas, it also allowed her to conceal her disfigured face behind a darkened visor. On any other Star Destroyer, a pilot walking around in an identity-concealing helmet would have raised a security flag. But the Anakin Solo was a GAG vessel, and most GAG visitors had valid reasons for concealing their identities. What's wrong? Lumia inquired again. She stopped at Jason's side and looked out on Hapes, which had returned to its normal placid appearance. I see nothing disturbing. It's gone. Jason could think of only one reason for the succession of dark faces he had seen, and he retained enough of his childhood indoctrination to shudder at the thought of a Sith dynasty. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about what? Lumia pressed. Nothing. Jason continued to look out the viewport watching distant smoke trails rise and fall as interplanetary traffic entered and departed the Hapen atmosphere. Was the Force telling him that he was making a terrible mistake? That the Sith way would lead the galaxy into a long era of darkness and tyranny? Come, Jason. There can be no secrets between us. Lumia slipped her hand under Jason's arm and gently turned him toward her. Tell me what you saw. I sense how it worries you. I'm not worried, Jason insisted. He started across the cabin toward the intelligence station. Have you found out who's behind the attack on the Queen Mother? Silly boy, you won't fool me by changing the subject. Lumia pulled him back around to face her this time more forcefully. I know how troubled you are. The veins in your neck are throbbing like drumworms. I doubt that very much, Jason said. Like all Jedi Knights, he had been trained from childhood to conceal such obvious signs of his feelings, and he was far better at it than most. I'm not troubled at all. Oh, I can see that. Lumia mocked. Then your pupils must be dilated because you were so excited. She looked out the viewport and allowed her gaze to linger on the face of the planet. Is there some reason visiting Hapes would make you happy? I'm always happy to come to the aid of an old friend, Jason said carefully. The last thing he wanted was for Lumia to keep probing and discover his feelings for Alana and Tenel Ka. Tenel Ka and I were classmates at the Jedi Academy. I see. Lumia's voice assumed a knowing tone. Now I understand why you are so concerned. Jason's heart leapt into his throat, 
and he began to worry that he had given away too much already. He had promised Tenelka that he would never reveal the secret of Alana's paternity to anyone. And when it came to Lumia, he considered that promise doubly binding. The Sith regarded love as a blessing that must be sacrificed in order to balance the attainment of power, and there were some things Jason would never be willing to sacrifice. Jason met Lumia's gaze. Actually, I don't think you do. He had to give her something else to think about, something that she would find even more engaging than whether or not he had a relationship with Tenel Ka. He exhaled slowly, then said, I saw faces. He went on to recount his vision, describing how the cowled heads had covered a little more of the galaxy each time he saw them. When he finished, Lumia arched her thin eyebrows. And this future frightens you? she demanded. I have a hard time thinking of a Sith dynasty as a good thing, Jason admitted. Call it family prejudice. Your family's opinion has been shaped by Darth Sidious. Lumia's tone was surprisingly patient. And he cared more about personal power than his responsibility to the galaxy. That is not the Sith way, as I had believed you to know by now. I know what you claim. Jason said. Despite his tone, he was relieved to have changed the subject. That the Sith way is the way of justice and order. The Sith way is the way of peace, Lumia corrected. To bring peace, first we must bring justice and order. To bring justice and order to the galaxy, first we must control it. Jason said, I know. Lumia ran her fingertips down the inside of Jason's arm. Then why do you worry about what you saw? You know why I worry. Jason pulled his arm away, not sharply, but firmly enough to let her know he would not be distracted by her games. You saw what Palpatine and my grandfather became. And that is how I know you won't fall to the temptations that undid them. Lumia paused to think, then added, Verger certainly didn't think so either, or you wouldn't have been the one she chose. Jason raised his brow. There were other candidates? Of course, Lumia said. Do you think we would select someone for such an important role without considering all our options? Kip Duran is too stubborn and unpredictable, Mara too committed to her attachments, your sister too ruled by emotion. You considered Mara? Jason gasped. And Jaina? We considered everyone. Your mother was too frightened by Darth Vader's legacy, your uncle was— Lumia's voice turned hard and cold. Well, he wouldn't have listened. He was too bound by Jedi dogma. And old grudges, Jason added. The long history of malice and betrayal between his uncle and Lumia was one of the reasons he still had doubts about his decision to become a Sith. He was well aware that all Lumia's talk of saving the galaxy might be a ploy, that turning him and Ben into Sith would be a vengeance on Luke that surpassed even murder. What about you or Verger? Why bother making me a Sith when you were Sith? Because we wouldn't have succeeded, Lumia said. I'm as much machine as human. And you know how that limits me. I know the theory, Jason said. The Force can be tapped only by living beings, so people with largely cybernetic bodies can't use it to its full potential. But frankly, 
Your force powers don't seem all that limited. Neither did your grandfathers, except to the Emperor, whose power had no limit, Lumia replied. You have the potential to succeed. I don't. And Verger? Jason asked. He needed to know that Lumia wasn't using him to get back at Luke that he really was the only person who could bring an era of peace and order to the galaxy. Her potential wasn't limited. Not in the way you mean. But could she ever win the confidence of any government? Lumia shook her head sadly. She would always be tainted, at best suspected of being a Yuzhan Vong agent, at worst of being a collaborator who helped them conquer so much. Jason sighed. I imagine that's true. He was still unsure whether Lumia was telling the truth, but he could find nothing in her explanations to prove she wasn't. So that left me. I wouldn't say left, Lumia replied. You were clearly the best choice. Your reluctance to use center point against the Yuzhan Vong demonstrated that you were capable of wielding great power responsibly. Your defeat of Savong La in personal combat proved you were not afraid to use great power when necessary. All that remained was for Verger to recruit you. Recruit me? Jason scoffed, thinking of his long imprisonment among the Yuzhan Vong. You mean capture, don't you? I mean both, Lumia said. Your uncle would have interfered with your training, so we had to isolate you. Verger returned to the Yuzhan Vong and helped them capture you, then maneuvered herself into a position to oversee your imprisonment. You mean my breaking, Jason corrected. He was beginning to realize just how intricately the two had planned his fate. What had seemed like accident and coincidence at the time had been part of a much larger strategy, a strategy that he still did not fully comprehend. Let's be honest. Verger had to destroy what I was before she could turn me into what you needed. Lumia inclined her head. Great strength demands great sacrifice, I have always been honest with you about that. She looked out the viewport and let her gaze linger on Hapes. The question is, have you been honest with me? Are you willing to sacrifice all you love for the greater good? Jason's stomach grew so hollow that he felt as if an airlock had opened inside him. Somehow, Lumia knew. He started to demand how she had learned of the relationship, then realized that doing so would only reveal the depths of his feelings for Tenel Ka and Alana, and increase the likelihood that Lumia would eventually demand their sacrifice in balance to his growing power. He stepped to Lumia's side. I'm growing weary of being asked how much I'll sacrifice he said. I've already proven— A soft chime sounded from a small screen in the corner of the ceiling. Then Ben's voice came out of the intercom speaker. Special Agent Skywalker, sir. The packages have arrived. They're not packages, Ben, Jason said. They're our guests. Show them to their cabins, and— We would prefer to join you now. Tenel Ka's voice was less distinct than Ben's, but still very recognizable. We'll freshen up later. That would be fine, Your Majesty. Jason glanced over to find Lumia studying him thoughtfully. Will Ben be a satisfactory escort? Quite, Tenel Ka replied. We will see you directly. The intercom crackled off, and a knowing twinkle came to Lumia's eyes. No need to worry, Jason. I know when my presence would be a problem. She went to the corner of the salon 
and touched her palm to a hidden pressure sensor. A meter-wide panel of wall popped forward and slid aside. She stepped through the opening into a narrow white corridor, then looked back over her shoulder. When you need me, I'll be in my cabin. Good. Jason went to the intelligence station and began to study the data Lumia had gathered on Tenelka's nobles. I'll let you know what else the Queen Mother can tell us about these suspects. I'm sure that will be very useful, Lumia said. As soon as the wall panel closed, Jason summoned his Tendrondo Arms security droid, SDXX, and asked him to do a security sweep of the entire cabin. He did not really suspect Lumia of planting an eavesdropping device, but he was not going to take any chances. Lumia clearly knew too much about his relationship with Tenel Ka already, and he was determined to keep her from learning any more. By the time Jason finished reviewing the files Lumia had pulled, SDXX had completed his sweep and was standing next to the intelligence station. With thin armor and blue photoreceptors set in a black skull-like face, he resembled a scaled-down version of his progenitor line, the mighty Tendrondo Arms YVH battle droid. Jason looked away from his display and nodded. Report no eavesdropping devices detected by preliminary and standard sweeps. The droid's voice was thin, raspy, and just a bit menacing. Consent to proceed with a comprehensive sweep? No, Jason said. We don't have time for that, Double X. A standard security sweep is only 93% effective, the droid said. If there is reason to suspect... There isn't, Jason said, rising. He had only a few moments before Ben arrived with Tenel Ka and Alana. SDXX was designed to look menacing and ominous, and he did not want the droid giving his daughter nightmares. Dismissed. SDXX remained next to the intelligence station. Can you be certain, Colonel? In my experience, there's always reason to be suspicious. I'm certain. Jason pointed toward the hidden exit Lumia had used. Leave the back way. I'm about to have visitors, and they don't have clearance to see you. SDXX leaned forward at the waist, then fixed his blue photoreceptors on Jason's face and said nothing. Go, Jason said. That's an order. SDXX's voice grew cold. Acknowledged. He pivoted and stalked to the corner in utter silence, then touched the pressure sensor and vanished down the corridor. A moment later, the feminine voice of Jason's reception droid sounded over the intercom speaker. Special Agent Skywalker is here with your guests, Colonel Solo. Send them in. Jason rose and stepped out from behind his intelligence station. The door hissed, and Tenel Ka strode into the command salon with Alana at her side. Mother and daughter alike were dressed in tailored flight suits of gray Electrotex, a nanoweave material better known for its opalescent luster and outrageous cost than its effectiveness as an all-purpose armor. Behind them followed Ben in his black GAG utilities— and an older woman with a long aquiline nose, whom Jason recognized as Tenelka's personal aide, Lady Golney. Bringing up the rear was DD-11A, a large defender droid with a cherubic face, synth-skin torso, and weapons-packed arms. The droid served Alana as both bodyguard and nanny. Jason started to bow to Tenelka, but as soon as Alana saw him, she pulled her hand free of Tenelka's grasp and raced across the deck with her arms thrown wide. Yet I, Jason! Jason laughed and leaned down to scoop her into his arms, and all trouble left his thoughts. She was a beautiful little girl, with her mother's red hair and a button nose, and suddenly he knew that his long struggle was worthwhile, that he could never... Stop trying to bring peace and order to the galaxy. 
that Alana and all the children like her deserve to grow up on worlds untroubled by war and injustice. Alana leaned back, studying Jason with a pair of big gray eyes. Jason, some bad men tried to kill us, but Mama's guards chased them off, so now we can't have no more parties. Any more parties, Tenelka corrected. She had stopped three paces from Jason. Despite the worry circles beneath her eyes, she was as radiant as ever, with high cheeks and a long braid of red hair hanging over one shoulder. Let Colonel Solo put you down. You're such a big girl now that you've grown too heavy to hold for long. That wasn't true at all, of course. Jason could have held Alana in his arms forever, because inside he was terrified of the sacrifice Lumia kept hinting at. He wanted to hold his daughter forever, to keep her pressed safely against him and stay in constant touch with her through the Force. But doing any of those fatherly things would only place her in even more danger. Even this small display of Alana's affection had put thoughtful expressions on the faces of both Ben and Lady Galney. The Queen Mother is right, Jason said, holding Alana out where he could look at her. Though he usually managed to sneak a visit three or four times a year, this was the first time he had noticed the same fiery sparkle in Alana's eyes that he had so often seen in his own mother's when he was growing up. May I return you to the deck now? Alana frowned. Yet I are supposed to be strong. I am strong, Jason laughed. But I need to save my strength for when I find the bad men. Alana's eyes grew wide. You're going to fight the bad men? Of course, Jason said. Hunting bad men is my job. Alana considered this a moment, then said, Very well, Jason. You can put me down. For now. Thank you. Jason lowered Alana to the deck and watched her return to Tenelka's side. Then he turned to Ben, who was still studying him carefully, and said, I'd like you to escort Lady Galney to the guest suite. Stand by during her inspection. Okay. Ben's voice betrayed his disappointment. I mean, as you'd like, Colonel. Jason would have preferred to let Ben stay for Tenelka's briefing. But Ben had been present when Jason learned that he was Alana's father, and Jason worried that seeing them together would overcome the memory rub he had used to alter Ben's recollection of the incident. Next, Jason turned to Lady Galney. Ben will see to anything you require to ensure the Queen Mother's comfort. Actually, I'll be staying. Golney flashed him a cold smile. As I'm sure you can appreciate, times have been rather trying for the Queen Mother. I'll be fine, Lady Golney. Tenel Ka kept her gaze fixed on Jason as she spoke. Colonel Solo's suggestion is an excellent one, and I'd like you to take Dee Dee and Alana along. Ben, I mean Special Agent Skywalker, can watch the Chumda while Dee Dee does a security sweep. Golney's green eyes flashed anger in Jason's direction, but she inclined her head to Tenelka. As you wish. She held out her hand to Alana. Come along, Chumda. Alana stepped past the offered hand to Ben, then took his hand and pulled him toward the exit. Are you a Jedi too, Ben? Yes. Ben cast a guilty glance over his shoulder, then amended, Sort of. I'm in training. Mama was a Jedi once, Alana said. She still has her lightsaber and practices with a remote. Alana's narrative grew inaudible as she led her small entourage deeper into the anteroom. Once the door had slid shut behind Didi and Galni, Jason and Tenel Ka stood facing each other in uncertain silence, their eyes meeting, but their bodies still three paces apart. Finally, Jason felt sure no one would be returning unexpectedly. It's okay, he said. 
I just had a security sweep. Tenel Kod did not smile, but a look of relief flashed across her face. She was in Jason's arms almost before he could open them. It is good to have you here, Jason. Thank you for coming. I'm glad you asked me. Jason held her to his chest, then said, You didn't need to come up here, though. I would have been happy to come to the palace. No, this is better. Tenel Ka pulled back far enough to look up into his eyes. I needed to bring Alana someplace safe. Jason cocked a brow. And your palace isn't? Not at the moment. Tenel Ka took his hand and led him over to the viewport, where the shadowy crescent of the planet's night side was just rotating into view. Someone poisoned the witnesses. Witnesses? Jason asked. To the coup attempt, Tenel Ka explained. I had everyone who saw the attack isolated in the well. The well is your detention center? Jason asked. Tenel Ka nodded. My secret detention center, she explained. Comfortable, hidden, and very secure. My ancestors have used it for more than twenty centuries to detain troublesome nobles, and no one has ever escaped from it. They still haven't, if I understand what you said correctly. Jason flashed a lopsided solo grin. Unless the hapen definition of escape is broader than it is in most parts of the galaxy. Tenel Ka frowned at him. Your joke is not funny, Jason. Most of the men who died were innocent bystanders. I was only holding them until I could determine who was and was not involved in the attack. Bystanders? Why would anyone poison— Jason let the question trail off, then said, Tenel Ka, whoever killed the prisoners— is trying to do more than silence co-conspirators. Tenel Ka nodded. If all they wished was to protect their own identity, they wouldn't have poisoned all the prisoners. She turned and stared out at the darkening planet below. The usurpers want it to appear that I am killing the innocent as well as the guilty. They are trying to turn my nobles against me. We won't let that happen. We'll find out who these usurpers are and stop them. Jason placed his hands on her shoulders. You said the well is secret. Who knows about it? Only one company of my personal guard and a few members of my inner circle. It could be someone in the guard, Jason said. But chances are— Yes. It always seems to be the ones closest to you. Jason looked toward the salon exit. Lady Galney? That's not what I mean, Tenel Ka said. Lady Galney's family members are among my strongest supporters. Her sister will rally to my cause the moment Jaina delivers my summons. Jason frowned. Jaina was here? Yes. Tenel Ka took Jason's hand and led him toward the salon's conversation area. Your sister arrived shortly after your parents. My parents? Jason was growing more perplexed every moment. What are they doing here? Nothing any longer. They've fled. Tenel Ka sat on the couch and pulled Jason down beside her. I'm afraid they may have been involved in the assassination attempt. Involved? Participated, Tenel Ka clarified. For a time, Jason was too stunned to reply. He knew his parents had taken Corelli aside in the conflict. That was one of the few things that made him question the Galactic Alliance's position. But assassination was just not their style. At least he had thought it wasn't until he started to read the intelligence reports describing his father's role in the murder of Thracken Salsolo. Finally, Jason turned to Tenel Ka. You're sure? 
I am sure they were here, Tenelkai explained. They arrived on the day of the Queen's pageant and insisted that they had an appointment to see me. At first I thought there had been a miscommunication, but my security staff is now convinced that their assignment was to cause a break in my security routine. Your security staff is convinced? Jason stood and looked into the corner, trying to make sense of what he was hearing, trying to picture the people who had raised him, the good-hearted scoundrel and the principal diplomat setting up Tenel Ka for an assassination attempt. What do you think? Jason, I don't know what to think, Tenel Ka said. Some preliminary reports suggested that they may have been trying to warn me about the assassins, but Jason continued to face the corner. He was beginning to feel almost relieved. Maybe Alana was not the sacrifice Lumia kept talking about. Maybe his parents were what he would be required to surrender, and maybe their deaths would not be a cold-hearted act of betrayal after all. Maybe he would be serving the balance, merely delivering a final and terrible justice to one more pair of murdering terrorists. But what? he asked not looking away from the corner. Go on. But they were seen leaving with the leader of the assassins, Tenelka finished. She even went to their aid when my guards pinned them down. I see. A terrible sense of sadness came over Jason, and a sense of inevitability. Had his parents really drifted across the thin line that separated heroes from murderers? Had they really slipped into the murky realm of terrorism? He turned to face Tenel Ka. Is there any reason to think we should place our faith in the reports suggesting they were trying to warn you? Tenel Ka lowered her eyes. Not really. I didn't think so. Jason crossed the cabin to his comm station. It appears my parents have become part of the problem in this war. Jason, what are you doing? Tenelka asked, following. Please remember that as bad as it looks, we don't know the whole story yet. But we need to. Jason slipped into the chair and activated the data display, then began to scroll through a long list of electronic forms. That's why we need to find them. Do we? Tenel Ka came around the desk and stopped behind him. After the Millennium Falcon left Hapes, she vanished into the transitory mists. As long as she stays vanished, I'm willing to give your parents the benefit of the doubt. In fact, I want to. Tenel Ka, we just can't do that. Jason found the form he was looking for, a GAG search and detain warrant, and began to enter the names of his parents. But thank you for offering. Jason, stop! Tenel Ka used the force to pull his hands away from the keyboard. If you're angry with them because Alana was threatened, that's not fair. Your parents don't even know that Alana is their granddaughter, and there would have been an assassination attempt anyway. Jason lowered his guard so that Tenel Ka could sense his emotions, then said, I'm not angry. I'm sad. He pulled his hands free of her force grasp and resumed entering his parents' data on the warrant. But this is bigger than me, and it may even be bigger than the Hapes Consortium. He entered a description of the Millennium Falcon then hit a key and sent the warrant to the dispatch center. Whatever the terrorists are planning, my parents are a part of it, and G.A.G. needs to know how. Chapter 12 The Falcon had reverted into the deepest, darkest space Leia had ever seen. The handful of stars she could see through the cockpit canopy were mere ghost twinkles, and the frequency with which they kept vanishing and reappearing made her think she might be imagining them. 
Who dimmed the blast tinting? Han asked, complaining more than inquiring. Check that flash detector. It must be on the blink. Leia pulled a glow rod from the emergency kit next to the co-pilot seat and shined a light into a thumb-sized dome that sat on top of the instrument console. The ghost stars vanished instantly as the canopy darkened. The flash detector is fine, she reported. We must have stumbled into a bank of transitory mists. Stumbled is not how I would describe it, said their passenger, Nashta. The assassin was slouched in the navigator's seat, rolling an unsheathed vibro-dagger between her long fingers. Her hair remained in its bushy topknot, and she was still dressed in her sleeveless bodysuit. The mists absorb light and block long-range sensor readings. I see, Leia said. So you were expecting this? Always a good idea to blind your pursuers. Nashta's black-rimmed eyes shifted to the back of Han's head. We can take our time plotting our next jump. They won't find us in this. I like your thinking, Han said, watching her reflection in the canopy. After the way things went back at the palace, we'll be leading a fleet of battle dragons around the galaxy if we're not careful. Nashta shrugged. No worries. They'd have to be right on top of us to plot our next vector. She continued to slouch in her seat, rolling the vibro-dagger between her fingers and waiting for the solos to start plotting jump coordinates they did not have. In the silence that followed, Leia began to think it might not be such a good idea to try tricking the assassin into revealing the identity of the coup leader. There was a cold hunger in Nashta's force presence that suggested she was just looking for an excuse to plant her vibro-dagger in the back of Han's neck. When the long silence began to stretch from uncomfortable to alarming, Leia unbuckled her crash webbing and rose. I don't know about you two, but I'm famished. She gave Han's shoulder an affectionate squeeze, then turned toward the rear of the cockpit. The last thing she wanted was to fight this assassin. But if it had to happen, she wanted room to maneuver. Why don't I fix us something to eat while you do the sweep? Sweep? Nashta asked. For homing beacons, Han said, smoothly following Leia's lead. We always do a sweep after a scrape like that. A habit we picked up fighting Imperials. Ah. Nashta's sunken eyes shifted from Leia to Han's reflection. Very clever. Han seemed to wilt a little beneath her scrutiny. Uh, yeah. He unbuckled his crash webbing and started after Leia. And count me in for the grub. I'm hungry enough to eat a rancor. Yes, eating would be nice. Nashta sheathed her vibro-dagger and followed, clearly determined not to let the solos out of her sight, especially together. A good fight always whets my appetite. They traveled down the cockpit access corridor to the main cabin. Han went to the engineering station to scan for unauthorized signals, and Leia went to the galley. The Nogri remained out of view, though Leia could feel them nearby one hiding just inside the forward hold, the other lurking a few paces down the main corridor. Thankfully, C-3PO was in the rear of the ship, supervising a routine check of the backup life support systems. Instead of offering to help either Leia or Han, Nashta took a seat at the table, where she would be in a good position to watch them both. None of them removed their weapons belts. Leia called up a list of stores, then turned half toward Nashta. What would you like? We have brogi stew, gorba melts. Do you have nerf steaks? Nashta interrupted. Sure, Leia said. Nerf steaks were more dinner than lunch, but who knew what timetable Nashta was on? How would you like it? Them, Nashta corrected. I need three. 
Just defrosted will be fine. Three? Leia gasped. She did not mean to be rude, but even Saba would have trouble eating that much meat, and Saba was a barabel. Perhaps you're accustomed to smaller steaks than we stock. These are half a kilo apiece. Nashta's eyes flashed as though insulted. Make it four, she ordered. My species has an unusual metabolism. I think the word you're looking for is ferocious, Leia said. Defrosted it is. She punched an order into the galley's multiprocessor, requesting two gorba melts for her and Han, and the four steaks for Nashta. Then she returned to the table and sat across from the assassin. What is your species? Leia asked, trying to sound casual and polite. You have a youthful appearance, but I sense that you've lived a long and interesting life already. You sense? Nashta's face remained as severe and unreadable as ever, but the force around her began to warm with resentment. Be careful what you sense, Jedi. The dark side can be catching. Leia frowned, suddenly feeling even more cautious and curious about the assassin than before. Are you saying you were a Jedi? Nashta laughed a dry, humorless croak, then promptly changed the subject. Why don't you and Captain Solo know where we are going? I'll take that as a no comment, Leia said, automatically buying time. An abrupt change of subject could be just as effective for eliciting a candid reply as for avoiding one, and even without the tingle racing down her spine, Leia knew that her next answer would be a dangerous one. Does that mean you don't want to talk about your species, either? My mother was human. My father was a ghost in the night. And I doubt even my mother knew his species. But it was obviously a long-lived one. Nashta drew her lips back in an indifferent smile. If I ever find out who he was... Perhaps I'll be able to hunt him down and kill him. Her hand drifted toward the swinging holster she wore on her hip. So how come you and Captain Solo don't know who our employer is? Leia's danger sense turned to a sinking feeling. Han and I don't work for your employer. She cautiously moved her hand to the hilt of her lightsaber. We're agents of the Corellian government. That's right, Han said from across the cabin. He had stopped work and was facing Nashta, his hand propped on the butt of his own blaster. Prime Minister Gedjin asked us to go to the palace and lure Tenel Ka into a public area. That's all we knew about your plan. And you agreed? Nashta asked. It did not seem to trouble her, that if a fight was to erupt, she would be caught in the middle of Han, Leia, and their Nogri, whom Leia felt sure the assassin could sense watching them. My information says Tenel Ka is a solo family friend. She is, and she's on the wrong side of this war. Leia put some durasteel in her voice. I've seen one empire rise in my lifetime— I don't want to see another. We'll do whatever it takes to stop it, Han said. My own son is torturing Corellians. He does seem to be following his grandfather's example, doesn't he? Nashta kept her eyes fixed on Leia, and for the first time her smile appeared genuine. That must make you very... Unhappy. Unhappy isn't the way I'd put it. Despite the obvious enjoyment Nashta took in her pain, Leia answered honestly. If they were to have any hope of tricking the assassin into revealing the identity of the coup leader, they had to win her trust. 
It terrifies me. Nashta actually licked her lips. Truly? Yes. Leia took a deep breath, then continued. When Han and I married, I didn't want children, because I didn't want to take the chance that one of them would grow up to become another Darth Vader. Han frowned across the cabin at Leia, clearly unhappy at having their family life revealed to an assassin. Then something happened to change your mind, Nashta surmised. You hardly strike me as the careless type. I'm not, Leia said. We were on a mission to Tatooine. I started to have force visions, and then someone gave me my grandmother's vid diary. When I began to see my father through her eyes... Leia let her sentence trail off, unable to help wondering if she had misinterpreted events all those years ago, if she should have seen Jason's dark future in the burning eyes of the force vision she had experienced if she should have heard the menace in its cruel-voiced message. Mine. Mine. She had concluded at the time that the Force was trying to tell her that she belonged to it, that she needed to entrust it with her future. But now, now she could not help wondering if the vision had been something darker, some unseen evil laying claim to her issue. You changed your mind, Nashta said, finishing Leia's sentence. You began to think the danger was not real? Leia nodded. And now, what do you think? Nashta's eyes were sparkling with delight. Was your fear justified? Just hold on a blasted second. Han started across the deck toward the assassin. If you think we wish we never had kids, Leia raised a hand and used the Force to stop Han from coming any closer. If Han and I had never raised children, there would have been no Anakin Solo to save the Jedi from the Voxen, no Jason Solo to show us the way to victory against the Yuzhan Vong, no Jaina Solo to lead the fight. So what I think is that it's unwise to oppose the will of the Force. I see, Nashta said. So if it's the will of the Force for your son Jason to follow in the path of his grandfather, you won't oppose it? It's too early to tell how far down that path Jason will go. But I won't let him become another Darth Vader, Leia saw the alarm her reply raised in Han's eyes, but to give any other answer would have been to step into Nashta's trap, to admit that the reasons she had given for turning against Tenelka were false. Whatever it takes to stop that from happening, I'll do. Nashta continued to study Leia. Whatever it takes. You heard her, Han said. He had stopped in the middle of the cabin, with his hand still resting on the butt of his blaster pistol. Not that it's any business of yours how we feel about the way our kids turned out. It might be, when you realize that you can't handle him yourself. Nashta slowly looked from Leia to Han. I specialize in Jedi, you know. That's why they recruited me for Tenel Ka. Yeah, Han replied. Well, leave us your contact data and we'll think about it. The multiprocessor chimed three times, announcing that lunch was ready. Han unsnapped the keeper strap on his holster. Are we going to eat or what? Nashta's gaze dropped to his hand and stayed there for a moment. Then she let out a snort of derision and slowly moved her hand away from her blaster. Eating sounds good, she said. Wonderful, Leia said. Trying to keep her sigh of relief relatively inaudible, she went to the multiprocessor and prepared a tray with two savory-smelling gorba melts 
and Nashta's four defrosted steaks. Would you like something to drink, Nashta? Not necessary, the assassin said, but I will need an empty glass. Resisting the temptation to ask why, Leia added the empty glass to the tray, then returned to the table and distributed its contents. To Leia's astonishment, Nashta took one of the raw nerf steaks and rolled it tight. Holding it over the empty glass, the assassin wrapped her long fingers around the meat and sank her sharp nails into it, then carefully squeezed the blood out. Suddenly Leia's gorba melt no longer smelled quite so savory. Nashta smiled at Leia's obvious look of revulsion, then said, I saw your father race once. Race? Han echoed. Though his eyes were fixed on Nashta's slowly filling glass, he was gobbling down his sandwich and had to speak around a full mouth. You mean pod race? Yes. It was the Bunta Eve classic. He was good. Very good. So I've heard. Leia found herself feeling resentful of Nashta. As much as she still hated the memory of Darth Vader, over the years she had come to think of her father as the little boy she had glimpsed in her grandmother's vid diary, and it seemed somehow unfair that this assassin had been there at the high point of his life when all Leia had known were the low ones. He won, I believe. That's right. It was when he earned his freedom. Nashta put the shriveled steak aside, then took a drink from the glass and smacked her lips in approval. Do you know what always amazed me about that race? Wait a minute. Han swallowed a mouthful of gorbamelt. You expect us to believe you were there? I believe her, Han. Leia pushed her uneaten gorbamelt aside, then asked, What amazed you, Nashta? That he didn't cheat, she replied. All that natural force ability, and he ran an honest race in a contest that has no rules. Your point? Leia asked. Nashta gulped down the contents of her glass, then picked up another steak and began to refill it. Do I need to have a point? Yeah, Han scowled. It helps move the conversation along. Nashta arched her brow, somehow making even that simple gesture seem menacing. Then I suppose my point is this. The stake made a soft bursting noise as she tightened her grasp, forcing all the juice from it at once. Nashta looked back to Leia. Your father was as full of surprises as you are. I suppose I do believe your story. Good. Leia started to reach for her Vita juice, then caught a glimpse of what was in Nashta's glass and thought better of it. Then I hope you'll allow us to take you wherever you need to go. Nashta nodded. Telker Station. Telker Station? Han asked doubtfully. You expect us to believe a bunch of pirates hired you? Nashta eyed Han coldly. Did I say we were going to meet my employers?